but I am. I must go, he says. Soon enough, she replies, returning to the window. At the perimeter of the city they are packing away the tents. The long camel trains are preparing to depart. Convoys of carts are already heading away across the desert. The carnival is over. She turns to him again. I am your equal, she repeats, and also your opposite. I don't want you to become weak. You shouldn't have done what you did. But you will profit, Mahund replies bitterly. There's no threat now to your temple revenues. You miss the point, she says softly, coming closer to him, bringing her face very close to his. If you are for Allah, I am for Allat, and she doesn't believe your God when he recognizes her. Her opposition to him is implacable, irrevocable, engulfing. The war between us cannot end in truce. And what a truce! Yours is a patronizing, condescending lord. Alat hasn't the slightest wish to be his daughter. She is his equal, as I am yours. Ask Baal, he knows her, as he knows me. So the grandee will betray his pledge, Mahun says. Who knows, scoffs Hind, he doesn't even know himself. He has to work out the odds. Weak, as I told you. But you know I'm telling the truth. Between Allah and the three, there can be no peace. I don't want it. I want the fight, to the death. That is the kind of idea I am. What kind are you? You are sand, and I am water, Mahun says. Water washes sand away. And the desert soaks up water, Hind answers him. Look around you. Soon after his departure, the wounded men arrive at the grandee's palace, having screwed up their courage to inform Hind that old Hamza has killed her brothers. But by then, the messenger is nowhere to be found, is heading once again slowly towards Mount Cohn. Jibril, when he's tired, wants to murder his mother for giving him such a damn fool nickname, Angel. What a word! He begs, What? Whom? to be spared the dream city of crumbling sandcastles and lions with three-tiered teeth, no more heart-washing of prophets or instructions to recite or promises of paradise. Let there be an end to revelations, finito, katamshud. What he longs for, black, dreamless sleep, motherfucking dreams, cause of all the trouble in the human race, movies too. If I was God, I'd cut the imagination right out of people, and then maybe poor bastards like me could get a good night's rest. Fighting against sleep, he forces his eyes to stay open, unblinking, until the visual purple fades off the retinas and sends him blind. But he's only human. In the end, he falls down the rabbit hole, and there he is again, in Wonderland, up the mountain, and the businessman is waking up, and once again his wanting, his need, goes to work, not on my jaws and voice this time, but on my whole body. He diminishes me to his own size and pulls me in towards him. His gravitational field is unbelievable, as powerful as a goddamn megastar. And then Jibril and the prophet are wrestling, both naked, rolling over and over in the cave of the fine white sand that rises around them like a veil. As if he's learning me, searching me, as if I'm the one undergoing the test. In a cave, five hundred feet below the summit of Mount Cone, Mahun wrestles the archangel, hurling him from side to side, and let me tell you he's getting in everywhere, his tongue in my ear, his fist around my balls. There was never a person with such a rage in him. He has to, has to know, he has to know, and I have nothing to tell him. He's twice as physically fit as I am, and four times as knowledgeable, minimum. We may both have taught ourselves by listening a lot, but as is plain to see, he's even a better listener than me. So we roll, kick, scratch. He's getting cut up quite a bit, but of course my skin stays smooth as a baby. You can't snag an angel on a bloody thorn bush. You can't bruise him on a rock. And they have an audience. There are jinns and afrits and all sorts of spooks sitting on the boulders to watch the fight. And in the sky are the three winged creatures, looking like herons or swans, or just women, depending on the tricks of the light. 
Mahund finishes it. He throws the fight. After they had wrestled for hours or even weeks, Mahund was pinned down beneath the angel. It's what he wanted. It was his will filling me up and giving me the strength to hold him down. Because archangels can't lose such fights, it wouldn't be right. It's only devils who get beaten in such cirques. So, the moment I got on top, he started weeping for joy, and then he did his old trick, forcing my mouth open and making the voice, the voice, pour out of me once again, made it pour all over him, like sick. At the end of his wrestling match with the archangel Jibril, the prophet Mahund falls into his customary, exhausted, post-revelatory sleep. But on this occasion, he revives more quickly than usual. When he comes to his senses in that high wilderness, there is nobody to be seen. No winged creatures crouch on rocks, and he jumps to his feet, filled with the urgency of his news. It was the devil, he says aloud to the empty air, making it true by giving it voice. The last time it was shaitan. This is what he has heard in his listening, that he has been tricked, that the devil came to him in the guise of the archangel, so that the verses he memorized, the ones he recited in the poetry tent, were not the real thing, but its diabolic opposite, not godly, but satanic. He returns to the city as quickly as he can to expunge the foul verses that reek of brimstone and sulphur, to strike them from the record for ever and ever, so that they will survive in just one or two unreliable collections of old traditions and orthodox interpreters will try and unwrite their story. But Jibril, hovering watching from his highest camera angle, knows one small detail, just one tiny thing that's a bit of a problem here. Namely, that it was me both times, Baba, me first and second also, me. From my mouth, both the statement and the repudiation, verses and converses, universes and reverses, the whole thing, and we all know how my mouth got worked. First it was the devil, Mahund mutters as he rushes to Jahilia, but this time the angel, no question, he wrestled me to the ground. The disciples stop him in the ravines near the foot of Mount Cone to warn him of the fury of Hind, who is wearing white mourning garments and has loosened her black hair, letting it fly about her like a storm, or trail in the dust, erasing her footsteps so that she seems like an incarnation of the spirit of vengeance itself. They have all fled the city, and Hamza too is lying low, but the word is that Abu Simbel has not, as yet, acceded to his wife's pleas for the blood that washes away blood. He is still calculating the odds in the matter of Mahund and the goddesses. Mahund, against his followers' advice, returns to Jahilia, going straight to the house of the black stone. The disciples follow him in spite of their fear. A crowd gathers in the hope of further scandal or dismemberment or some such entertainment. Mahund does not disappoint them. He stands in front of the statues of the three and announces the abrogation of the verses which Shaitan whispered in his ear. These verses are banished from the true recitation, Al-Quran. New verses are thundered in their place. Shall he have daughters and you sons, Mahun recites? That would be a fine division. These are but names you have dreamed of, you and your fathers. Allah vests no authority in them. He leaves the dumbfounded house before it occurs to anybody to pick up or throw the first stone. After the repudiation of the satanic verses, the prophet Mahun returns home to find a kind of punishment awaiting him, a kind of vengeance. Whose? Light or dark? Good guy, bad guy? Wrought as is not unusual upon the innocent? The prophet's wife, seventy years old, sits by the foot of a stone-latticed window, sits upright with her back to the wall, dead. Mahund, in the grip of his misery, keeps himself to himself, hardly says a word for weeks. The grandee of Jahilia institutes a policy of persecution that advances too slowly for Hind. The name of the new religion is Submission. 
Now Abu Simbel decrees that its adherents must submit to being sequestered in the most wretched, hovel-filled quarter of the city, to a curfew, to a ban on employment, and there are many physical assaults, women spat upon in shops, the manhandling of the faithful by the gangs of young Turks, whom the grandee secretly controls, fire thrown at night through a window to land amongst unwary sleepers, and, by one of the familiar paradoxes of history, the numbers of the faithful multiply, like a crop that miraculously flourishes as conditions of soil and climate grow worse and worse. An offer is received from the citizens of the oasis settlement of Yathrib to the north. Yathrib will shelter those who submit if they wish to leave Jahilia. Hamza is of the opinion that they must go. You'll never finish your message here, nephew, take my word. Hind won't be happy till she's ripped out your tongue, to say nothing of my balls, excuse me. Mahund, alone and full of echoes in the house of his bereavement, gives his consent, and the faithful depart to make their plans. Khalid, the water-carrier, hangs back, and the hollow-eyed prophet waits for him to speak. Awkwardly he says, Messenger, I doubted you, but you were wiser than we knew. First we said Mahund will never compromise, and you compromised. Then we said Mahund has betrayed us, but you were bringing us a deeper truth. You brought us the devil himself, so that we could witness the workings of the evil one, and his overthrow by the right. You have enriched our faith. I am sorry for what I thought. Mahund moves away from the sunlight, falling through the window. Yes, bitterness, cynicism. It was a wonderful thing I did, deeper truth, bringing you the devil. Yes, that sounds like me. From the peak of Mount Cone, Jibril watches the faithful escaping Jahilia, leaving the city of Aridity for the place of cool palms and water, water, water. In small groups, almost empty-handed, they move across the empire of the sun, on this first day of the first year, at the new beginning of time, which has itself been born again, as the old dies behind them, and the new waits ahead. And one day, Mahund himself slips away. When his escape is discovered, Baal composes a valedictory ode. What kind of idea does submission seem today? One full of fear, an idea that runs away. Mahund has reached his oasis. Jibril is not so lucky. Often now he finds himself alone on the summit of Mount Cone, washed by the cold falling stars, and then they fall upon him from the night sky, the three winged creatures, Lat, Uzza, Manat, flapping around his head, clawing at his eyes, biting, whipping him with their hair, their wings. He puts up his hands to protect himself, but their revenge is tireless, continuing whenever he rests, whenever he drops his guard. He struggles against them, but they are faster, nimbler, winged. He has no devil to repudiate. Dreaming, he cannot wish them away. 3. L-O-N-D-O-N Chapter 1 I know what a ghost is, the old woman affirmed silently. Her name was Rosa Diamond. She was eighty-eight years old and she was squinting beakily through her salt-caked bedroom windows, watching the full moon sea. And I know what it isn't, too, she nodded further. It isn't a scarification or a flapping sheet, so poo and pish to all that bunkum. What's a ghost? Unfinished business is what. At which the old lady, six feet tall, straight-backed, her hair hacked short as any man's, jerked the corners of her mouth downwards in a satisfied tragedy mask pout, pulled a knitted blue shawl tight around her bony shoulders, and closed for a moment her sleepless eyes to pray for the past return. "'Come on, you Norman ships,' she begged. "'Let's have you, Willie the Conk!' Nine hundred years ago all this was under water, this portioned shore, this private beach, 
its shingle rising steeply towards the little row of flaky paint villas with their peeling boathouses crammed full of deck chairs, empty picture frames, ancient tuck boxes stuffed with bundles of letters tied up in ribbons, mothballed silk and lace lingerie, the tear-stained reading matter of once young girls, lacrosse sticks, stamp albums, and all the buried treasure chests of memories and lost time. The coastline had changed, had moved a mile or more out to sea, leaving the first Norman castle stranded far from water, lapped now by marshy land that afflicted with all manner of dank and boggy agues the poor who lived there on their, what's the word, estates. She, the old lady, saw the castle as the ruin of a fish betrayed by an antique ebbing tide, as a sea monster petrified by time. Nine hundred years. Nine centuries past, the Norman fleet had sailed right through this Englishwoman's home. On clear nights when the moon was full, she waited for its shining, revenant ghost. Best place to see him come, she reassured herself. Grandstand view. Repetition had become a comfort in her antiquity. The well-worn phrases, unfinished business, grandstand view, made her feel solid, unchanging, sempiternal, instead of the creature of cracks and absences she knew herself to be. When the full moon sets, the dark before the dawn, that's their moment. Billow of sail, flash of oars, and the conqueror himself at the flagship's prow, sailing up the beach between the barnacled wooden breakwaters and a few inverted skulls. Oh, I've seen things in my time, always had the gift, the phantom sight. The conqueror, in his pointy, metal-nosed hat, passing through her front door, gliding betwixt the cake-stands and antimacassard sofas, like an echo resounding faintly through that house of remembrances and yearnings, then falling silent as the grave. Once, as a girl on Battle Hill, she was fond of recounting, always in the same time-polished words, once, as a solitary child, I found myself quite suddenly, and with no sense of strangeness, in the middle of a war. Longbows, maces, pikes— the flaxen Saxon boys cut down in their sweet youth, Harold Arrow-Eye and William with his mouth full of sand. Yes, always the gift, the phantom sight. The story of the day on which the child Rosa had seen a vision of the Battle of Hastings had become, for the old woman, one of the defining landmarks of her being, though it had been told so often that nobody, not even the teller, could confidently swear that it was true. I long for them sometimes, ran Rosa's practised thoughts. Les beaux jours, the dear dead days. She closed once more her reminiscent eyes. When she opened them, she saw, down by the water's edge, no denying it, something beginning to move. What she said aloud in her excitement, I don't believe it. It isn't true. He's never here. On unsteady feet with bumping chest, Rosa went for her hat, cloak, stick, while on the winter seashore, Jibril Farishta awoke with a mouth full of, no, not sand, snow. Pshaw! Jibril spat, leapt up as if propelled by expectorated slush, wished Chumcha, as has been reported, many happy returns of the day, and commenced to beat the snow from sodden purple sleeves. God, yeah, he shouted, hopping from foot to foot. No wonder these people grow hearts of bloody ice. Then, however, the pure delight of being surrounded by such a quantity of snow quite overcame his first cynicism, for he was a tropical man, and he started capering about, saturnine and soggy, making snowballs and hurling them at his prone companion, envisioning a snowman and singing a wild, swooping rendition of the carol Jingle Bells. The first hint of light was in the sky, and on this cosy sea coast danced Lucifer, the morning star. His breath, it should be mentioned, had somehow or other wholly ceased to smell. "'Come on, baby!' cried Invincible Jibril, in whose behaviour the reader may not unreasonably perceive the delirious, dislocating effects of his recent fall. "'Rise and shine! Let's take this place by storm!' 
turning his back on the sea, blotting out the bad memory in order to make room for the next things, passionate as always for newness, he would have planted, had he owned one, a flag to claim in the name of, who knows who, this white country, his new-found land. Spuno, he pleaded, shift, Baba, or are you bloody dead? Which, being uttered, brought the speaker to, or at least towards, his senses. He bent over the other's prostrate form, did not dare to touch. Not now, old chumch, he urged, not when we came so far. Saladin was not dead, but weeping, the tears of shock freezing on his face, and all his body cased in a fine skin of ice, smooth as glass, like a bad dream come true. In the miasmic semi-consciousness induced by his low body temperature, he was possessed by the nightmare fear of cracking, of seeing his blood bubbling up from the ice breaks, of his flesh coming away with the shards. He was full of questions. Did we truly, I mean, with your hands flapping and then the waters, you don't mean to tell me they actually, like in the movies, when Charlton Heston stretched out his staff so that we could, across the ocean floor? It never happened, couldn't have. But if not, then how? Or did we in some way underwater, escorted by the mermaids, the sea passing through us as if we were fish or ghosts? Was that the truth? Yes or no? I need to have to... But when his eyes opened, the questions acquired the indistinctness of dreams, so that he could no longer grasp them, their tails flicked before him and vanished like submarine fins. He was looking up at the sky, and noticed that it was the wrong colour entirely, blood orange flecked with green, and the snow was blue as ink. He blinked hard, but the colours refused to change, giving rise to the notion that he had fallen out of the sky into some wrongness, some other place, not England, or perhaps not England, some counterfeit zone, rotten borough, altered state. Maybe, he considered briefly, hell? No, no, he reassured himself as unconsciousness threatened. That can't be it, not yet. You aren't dead yet, but dying. Well then, a transit lounge. He began to shiver. The vibration grew so intense that it occurred to him that he might break up under the stress like a... like a... plane. Then nothing existed. He was in a void, and if he were to survive he would have to construct everything from scratch, would have to invent the ground beneath his feet before he could take a step. Only there was no need now to worry about such matters, because here in front of him was the inevitable, the tall, bony figure of death in a wide-brimmed straw hat with a dark cloak flapping in the breeze. Death leaning on a silver-headed cane, wearing olive-green Wellington boots. What do you imagine yourselves to be doing here? Death wanted to know. This is private property. There's a sign, said in a woman's voice that was somewhat tremulous and more than somewhat thrilled. A few moments later, Death bent over him. To kiss me? He panicked silently. To suck the breath from my body? He made small, futile movements of protest. He's alive all right, Death remarked to, who was it, Jibril. But my dear, his breath, what a pong! When did he last clean his teeth? One man's breath was sweetened, while another's by an equal and opposite mystery was soured. What did they expect, falling like that out of the sky? Did they imagine there would be no side effects? Higher powers had taken an interest. It should have been obvious to them both, and such powers, I am, of course, speaking of myself, have a mischievous, almost a wanton attitude to tumbling flies. And another thing, let's be clear, great falls change people. You think they fell a long way? In the matter of tumbles, I yield pride of place to no personage, whether mortal or im. From clouds to ashes, down the chimney, you might say, from heaven light to hellfire. Under the stress of a long plunge, I was saying, mutations are to be expected, not all of them random. Unnatural selections. Not much of a price to pay for survival, for being reborn, for becoming new, 
and at their age at that. What? I should enumerate the changes? Good breath, bad breath? And around the edges of Jibril Farishta's head, as he stood with his back to the dawn, it seemed to Rosa Diamond that she discerned a faint but distinctly golden glow. And were those bumps at Chumcha's temples, under his sodden and still-in-place bowler hat? And, and, and. When she laid eyes on the bizarre, satirical figure of Jibril Farishta, prancing and Dionysiac in the snow, Rosa Diamond did not think of, say it, angels. Sighting him from her window, through salt-cloudy glass and age-clouded eyes, she felt her heart kick out, twice, so painfully that she feared it might stop. Because in that indistinct form she seemed to discern the incarnation of her soul's most deeply buried desire. She forgot the Norman invaders as if they had never been, and struggled down a slope of treacherous pebbles too quickly for the safety of her not-quite-nonagenarian limbs, so that she could pretend to scold the impossible stranger for trespassing on her land. Usually she was implacable in her defence of her beloved fragment of the coast, and when summer weekenders strayed above the high tide line, she descended upon them like a wolf on the fold, her phrase for it, to explain and to demand, This is my garden, do you see? And if they grew brazen, Get out of it, silly old mo, it's a sudden beach. She would return home to bring out a long green garden hose and turn it remorselessly upon their tartan blankets and plastic cricket bats and bottles of suntan lotion. She would smash their children's sandcastles and soak their liver sausage sandwiches, smiling sweetly all the while. You won't mind if I just water my lawn? Oh, she was a one, known in the village. They couldn't lock her away in any old folks' home. Sent her whole family packing when they dared to suggest it. Never darken her doorstep, she told them. Cut the whole lot off without a penny or a by-your-leave. All on her own now, she was. Never a visitor from week to blessed week, not even Dora Shufflebottom, who went in and did for her all those years. Dora passed over September last, may she rest. Still, it's a wonder at her age how the old trout manages all those stairs. She may be a bit of a bee, but give the devil her due. There's many as go barmy being that alone. For Jibril there was neither a hosepipe nor the sharp end of her tongue. Rosa uttered token words of reproof, held her nostrils while examining the fallen and newly sulphurous Saladin, who had not at this point removed his bowler hat, and then, with an access of shyness which she greeted with nostalgic astonishment, stammered an invitation. You, you, be be better bring your f, f friend in out of the c cold and stamped back up the shingle to put the kettle on, grateful to the bite of the winter air for reddening her cheeks and saving, in the old comforting phrase, her blushes. As a young man, Saladin Chumcha had possessed a face of quite exceptional innocence, a face that did not seem ever to have encountered disillusion or evil, with skin as soft and smooth as a princess's palm. It had served him well in his dealings with women, and had in point of fact been one of the first reasons his future wife, Pamela Lovelace, had given for falling in love with him. So round and cherubic, she marvelled, cupping her hands under his chin. Like a rubber ball. He was offended. I've got bones, he protested. Bone structure. Uh, somewhere in there, she conceded. Everybody does. After that, he was haunted for a time by the notion that he looked like a featureless jellyfish, and it was in large part to assuage this feeling that he set about developing the narrow, haughty demeanour that was now second nature to him. It was, therefore, a matter of some consequence when, on arising from a long slumber racked by a series of intolerable dreams, prominent among which were images of Zini Vakil transformed into a mermaid, singing to him from an iceberg in tones of agonising sweetness, lamenting her inability to join him on dry land, calling him, calling. But when he went to her, she shut him up fast in the heart of her ice mountain, and her song changed to one of triumph and revenge. It was, I say, a serious matter when Saladin Chumcha woke up, 
looked into a mirror framed in blue and gold Japanesery lacquer, and found that old cherubic face staring out at him once again. While at his temples, he observed a brace of fearfully discoloured swellings, indications that he must have suffered at some point in his recent adventures a couple of mighty blows. Looking into the mirror at his altered face, Chumcha attempted to remind himself of himself. I am a real man, he told the mirror, with a real history and a planned out future. I am a man to whom certain things are of importance rigor, self discipline, reason, the pursuit of what is noble without recourse to that old crutch, God. The ideal of beauty, the possibility of exaltation, the mind. I am a married man. But in spite of his litany, perverse thoughts insisted on visiting him. As, for instance, that the world did not exist beyond that beach down there, and now this house. That if he weren't careful, if he rushed matters, he would fall off the edge into clouds. Things had to be made. Or again, that if he were to telephone his home right now, as he should, if he were to inform his loving wife that he was not dead, not blown to bits in mid air, but right here on solid ground, if he were to do this eminently sensible thing, the person who answered the phone would not recognize his name. Or, thirdly, that the sound of footsteps ringing in his ears, distant footsteps but coming closer, was not some temporary tinnitus caused by his fall, but the noise of some approaching doom, drawing closer, letter by letter. L-O-N-D-O-N, London. Here I am, in Grandmother's house, her big eyes, hands, teeth. There was a telephone extension on his bedside table. There, he admonished himself, pick it up, dial, and your equilibrium will be restored. Such maunderings, they aren't like you, not worthy of you. Think of her grief, call her now. It was night time, he didn't know the hour. There wasn't a clock in the room, and his wristwatch had disappeared somewhere along the line. Should he, shouldn't he? He dialed the nine numbers. A man's voice answered on the fourth ring. What the hell? Sleepy, unidentifiable, familiar. Uh, sorry, Saladin Chamcha said. Excuse, please. Wrong number. Staring at the telephone, he found himself remembering a drama production seen in Bombay, based on an English original, a story by... by... He couldn't put his finger on the name. Tennyson? Uh, no, no. Uh, Somerset Maughan? Uh, to hell with it. In the original and now authorless text, a man, long thought dead, returns after an absence of many years, like a living phantom, to his former haunts. He visits his former home at night, surreptitiously, and looks in through an open window. He finds that his wife, believing herself widowed, has remarried. On the windowsill he sees a child's toy. He spends a period of time standing in the darkness, wrestling with his feelings, then picks the toy off the ledge and departs forever without making his presence known. In the Indian version, the story had been rather different. The wife had married her husband's best friend. The returning husband arrived at the door and marched in, expecting nothing. Seeing his wife and his old friend sitting together, he failed to understand that they were married. He thanked his friend for comforting his wife, but he was home now, and so all was well. The married couple did not know how to tell him the truth. It was finally a servant who gave the game away. The husband, whose long absence was apparently due to a bout of amnesia, reacted to the news of the marriage by announcing that he too must surely have remarried at some point during his long absence from home. Unfortunately, however, now that the memory of his former life had returned, he had forgotten what had happened during the years of his disappearance. He went off to ask the police to trace his new wife, even though he could remember nothing about her, not her eyes, not the simple fact of her existence. The curtain fell. Saladin Chamcha, alone in an unknown bedroom in unfamiliar red and white striped pyjamas, lay face downwards on a narrow bed and wept. Damn all Indians, he cried into the muffling bedclothes, his fists punching at frilly-edged pillowcases from Harrods in Buenos Aires, so fiercely 
that the fifty-year-old fabric was ripped to shreds. "'What the hell! The vulgarity of it! The sodit, sodit, indelicacy! What the hell! That bastard! Those bastards! Their lack of bastard taste!' It was at this moment that the police arrived to arrest him. On the night after she had taken the two of them in from the beach, Rosa Diamond stood once again at the nocturnal window of her old woman's insomnia, contemplating the nine-hundred-year-old sea. The smelly one had been sleeping ever since they put him to bed, with hot water bottles packed in tightly around him. Best thing for him, let him get his strength. She had put them upstairs, Chumcha in the spare room, and Jibril in her late husband's old study, and as she watched the great shining plain of the sea, she could hear him moving up there amid the ornithological prints and bird-call whistles of the former Henry Diamond, the bolas and bullwhip and aerial photographs of the Los Alamos Estancia far away and long ago. A man's footsteps in that room, how reassuring they felt. Farishta was pacing up and down, avoiding sleep, for reasons of his own. And below his footfall, Rosa, looking up at the ceiling, called him in a whisper by a long, unspoken name. Martin, she said, his last name the same as that of his country's deadliest snake, the viper, the vibora de la cruz. At once she saw the shapes moving on the beach, as if the forbidden name had conjured up the dead. Not again, she thought, and went for her opera glasses. She returned to find the beach full of shadows, and this time she was afraid, because whereas the Norman fleet came sailing when it came, proudly and openly and without recourse to subterfuge, these shades were sneaky, emitting stifled imprecations and alarming muted yaps and barks. They seemed headless, crouching, arms and legs a-dangle like giant, unshelled crabs scuttling sidelong, heavy boots crunching on shingle. Lots of them. She saw them reach her boathouse, on which the fading image of an eye-patched pirate grinned and brandished a cutlass. And that was too much. I'm not having it, she decided, and stumbling downstairs for warm clothing, she fetched the chosen weapon of her retribution, a long coil of green garden hose. At her front door she called out in a clear voice, I can see you quite plainly. Come out, come out, whoever you are. They switched on seven suns and blinded her, and then she panicked, illuminated by the seven blue-white floodlights around which, like fireflies or satellites, there buzzed a host of smaller lights, lanterns, torches, cigarettes. Her head was spinning, and for a moment she lost her ability to distinguish between then and now. In her consternation, she began to say, Put out that light! Don't you know there's a blackout? You'll be having Jerry down on us if you carry on so. I'm raving, she realized disgustedly, and banged the tip of her stick into her doormat. Whereupon, as if by magic, policemen materialized in the dazzling circle of light. It turned out that somebody had reported a suspicious person on the beach, Remember when they used to come in fishing boats, the illegals, and thanks to that single anonymous telephone call, there were now fifty-seven uniformed constables combing the beach, their flashlights swinging crazily in the dark. Constables from as far away as Hastings, Eastbourne, Bexhill-upon-Sea, even a deputation from Brighton, because nobody wanted to miss the fun, the thrill of the chase. Fifty-seven beachcombers were accompanied by thirteen dogs, all sniffing the sea air and lifting excited legs. While up at the house, away from the great posse of men and dogs, Rosa Diamond found herself gazing at the five constables guarding the exits, front door, ground floor windows, scullery door, in case the putative miscreant attempted an alleged escape. And at the three men in plain clothes, plain coats and plain hats with faces to match, and in front of the lot of them, not daring to look her in the eye, young Inspector Lyme, shuffling his feet and rubbing his nose, and looking older and more bloodshot than his forty years. She tapped him on the chest with the end of her stick. At this time of night, Frank, what's the meaning of— But he wasn't going to allow her to boss him around, not tonight, not with the men from the immigration watching his every move. So he drew himself up and pulled in his chins. 
Uh, begging your pardon, Mrs. D., uh, certain allegations, information laid before us, uh, reason to believe, uh, merit investigation, necessary to search your... A warrant has been obtained. Uh, don't be absurd, Frank, dear, Rosa began to say, but just then the three men with the plain faces drew themselves up and seemed to stiffen, each of them with one leg slightly raised, like pointer dogs. The first began to emit an unusual hiss of what sounded like pleasure, while a soft moan escaped from the lips of the second, and the third commenced to roll his eyes in an oddly contented way. Then they all pointed past Rosa Diamond into her floodlit hallway, where Mr. Saladin Chumchar stood, his left hand holding up his pyjamas because a button had come off when he hurled himself onto his bed. With his right hand, he was rubbing at an eye. Bingo! said the hissing man, while the moaner clasped his hands beneath his chin to indicate that all his prayers had been answered, and the roller of eyes shouldered past Rosa Diamond without standing on ceremony, except that he did mutter, Madam, pardon me. Then there was a flood, and Rosa was jammed into a corner of her own sitting-room by that bobbing sea of police helmets, so that she could no longer make out Saladin Chumcha, or hear what he was saying. She never heard him explain about the detonation of the Bustan. "'There's been a mistake,' he cried. "'I'm not one of your fishing-boat sneakers in, not one of your Ugando Kenyatta's me.' The policeman began to grin. "'I see, sir. At thirty thousand feet, and then you swam ashore.' "'You have the right to remain silent,' they tittered, "'but quite soon they burst out into uproarious guffaws. "'We've got a right one here, no mistake.' "'But Rosa couldn't make out Saladin's protests. "'The laughing policeman got in the way. "'You've got to believe me. I'm a British,' he was saying, "'with right of abode, too. "'But when he couldn't produce a passport or any other identifying document, "'they began to weep with mirth.' the tears streaming down even the blank faces of the plain-clothes men from the immigration service. "'Of course, don't tell me,' they giggled. "'They fell out of your jacket during your tumble. "'Or did the mermaids pick your pocket in the sea?' Rosa couldn't see, in that laughter-heaving surge of men and dogs, what uniformed arms might be doing to Chumcha's arms, or fists to his stomach, or boots to his shins. Nor could she be sure if it was his voice crying out, or just the howling of the dogs.' but she did finally hear his voice rise in a last despairing shout. "'Don't any of you watch TV? Don't you see? I'm Maxim, Maxim Alien!' "'So you are,' said the pop-eyed officer, "'and I am Kermit the Frog.' What Saladin Chumcha never said, not even when it was clear that something had gone badly wrong. "'Here is a London number,' he neglected to inform the arresting policeman. At the other end of the line you will find, to vouch for me, for the truth of what I'm saying, my lovely, white, English wife. No, sir. What the hell? Rosa Diamond gathered her strength. Just one moment, Frank Lyme, she sang out. You look here. But the three plain men had begun their bizarre routine of hiss, moan, roll eye once again, and in the sudden silence of that room the eye-roller pointed a trembling finger at Chumcha and said, Lady! If it's proof you're after, you couldn't do better than those. Saladin Chumcha, following the line of Popeye's pointing finger, raised his hands to his forehead, and then he knew that he had woken into the most fearsome of nightmares, a nightmare that had only just begun, because there, at his temples, growing longer by the moment and sharp enough to draw blood, were two new, goaty, unarguable horns. Before the army of policemen took Saladin Chumcha away into his new life, there was one more unexpected occurrence. Jibril Farishta, seeing the blaze of lights and hearing the delirious laughter of the law enforcement officers, came downstairs in a maroon smoking jacket and jodhpurs, chosen from Henry Diamond's wardrobe. Smelling faintly of mothballs, he stood on the first floor landing and observed the proceedings without comment. He stood there unnoticed until Chumcha, handcuffed and on his way out to the Black Mariah, barefoot, still clutching his pyjamas, caught sight of him and cried out, "'Jibril! For the love of God, tell them what's what!' Hissa Mona Popeye turned eagerly towards Jibril. "'And who might this be?' inquired Inspector Lyme. "'Another skydiver?' 
but the words died on his lips, because at that moment the floodlights were switched off, the order to do so having been given when Chumcha was handcuffed and taken in charge. And in the aftermath of the Seven Suns, it became clear to everyone there that a pale, golden light was emanating from the direction of the man in the smoking jacket, was in fact streaming softly outwards from a point immediately behind his head. Inspector Lime never referred to that light again, and if he had been asked about it, would have denied ever having seen such a thing. A halo in the late twentieth century? Pull the other one. But at any rate, when Jibril asked, uh, What do these men want? Every man there was seized by the desire to answer his question in literal, detailed terms, to reveal their secrets as if he were, as if, but no, ridiculous, they would shake their heads for weeks until they had all persuaded themselves that they had done as they did for purely logical reasons. He was Mrs. Diamond's old friend. The two of them had found the rogue Chumcha half-drowned on the beach and taken him in for humanitarian reasons. No call to harass either Rosa or Mr. Farishta any further. A more reputable-looking gentleman you couldn't wish to see, in his smoking jacket and his... his... Well, eccentricity never was a crime, anyhow. Jibril, said Saladin Chamcha, help! But Jibril's eye had been caught by Rosa Diamond. He looked at her and could not look away. Then he nodded and went back upstairs. No attempt was made to stop him. When Chamcha reached the Black Mariah, he saw the traitor, Jibril Farishta, looking down at him from the little balcony outside Rosa's bedroom. And there wasn't any light shining around the bastard's head. Chapter 2 Kan makan fi kadim azaman It was so, it was not, in a time long forgot, that there lived in the silver land of Argentina a certain Don Enrique Diamond, who knew much about birds and little about women, and his wife Rosa, who knew nothing about men, but a good deal about love. One day it so happened that when the Signora was out riding, sitting side-saddle, and wearing a hat with a feather in it, she arrived at the Diamond Estancia's great stone gates, which stood insanely in the middle of the empty pampas, to find an ostrich running at her as hard as it could, running for its life with all the tricks and variations it could think of, for the ostrich is a crafty bird, difficult to catch. A little way behind the ostrich was a cloud of dust full of the noises of hunting men, and when the ostrich was within six feet of her, the cloud sent bolas to wrap around its legs and bring it crashing to the ground at her grey mare's feet. The man who dismounted to kill the bird never took his eyes off Rosa's face. He took a silver-hafted knife from a scabbard at his belt and plunged it into the bird's throat all the way up to the hilt, and he did it without once looking at the dying ostrich, staring into Rosa Diamond's eyes while he knelt on the wide yellow earth. His name was Martin de la Cruz. After Chumcha had been taken away, Gibriel Farishta often wondered about his own behaviour. In that dreamlike moment when he had been trapped by the eyes of the old Englishwoman, it had seemed to him that his will was no longer his own to command, that somebody else's needs were in charge. Owing to the bewildering nature of recent events, and also to his determination to stay awake as much as possible, it was a few days before he connected what was going on to the world behind his eyelids, and only then did he understand that he had to get away, because the universe of his nightmares had begun to leak into his waking life, and if he was not careful, he would never manage to begin again, to be reborn without her, through her, alleluia, who had seen the roof of the world. He was shocked to realize that he had made no attempt to contact Ali at all, or to help Chumcha in his time of need. Nor had he been at all perturbed by the appearance on Saladin's head of a pair of fine new horns, a thing that should surely have occasioned some concern. He had been in some sort of trance, and when he asked the old dame what she thought of it all, she smiled weirdly and told him that there was nothing new under the sun. She had seen things 
the apparitions of men with horned helmets in an ancient land like England, there was no room for new stories. Every blade of turf had already been walked over a hundred thousand times. For long periods of the day, her talk became rambling and confused, but at other times she insisted on cooking him huge, heavy meals, shepherd's pies, rhubarb crumble with thick custard, thick gravied hot pots, all manner of weighty soups. And at all times she wore an air of inexplicable contentment, as if his presence had satisfied her in some deep, unlooked-for way. He went shopping in the village with her. People stared. She ignored them, waving her imperious stick. The days passed. Jibril did not leave. Blasted English, Mim, he told himself. Some type of extinct species. What the hell am I doing here? But stayed, held by unseen chains, while she, at every opportunity, sang an old song in Spanish he couldn't understand a word. Some sorcery there? Some ancient Morgan Le Fay singing a young Merlin into her crystal cave? Gibriel headed for the door. Rosa piped up. He stopped in his tracks. Why not, after all, he shrugged. The old woman needs company. Faded grandeur, I swear. Look what she's come to here. Anyhow, I need the rest. Gather my forces. Just a couple of days. In the evenings they would sit in that drawing-room stuffed with silver ornaments, including on the wall a certain silver-hafted knife beneath the plaster bust of Henry Diamond that stared down from the top of the corner cabinet. And when the grandfather clock struck six, he would pour two glasses of sherry, and she would begin to talk, but not before she said, as predictably as clockwork, A grandfather is always four minutes late for good manners. He doesn't like to be too punctual. Then she began without bothering with, Once upon a time, and whether it was all true or all false, he could see the fierce energy that was going into the telling, the last desperate reserves of her will that she was putting into her story. The only bright time I can remember, she told him, so that he perceived that this memory-jumbled ragbag of material was in fact the very heart of her, her self-portrait, the way she looked in the mirror when nobody else was in the room, and that the silver land of the past was her preferred abode, not this dilapidated house in which she was constantly bumping into things, knocking over coffee tables, bruising herself on doorknobs, bursting into tears and crying out, Everything shrinks. When she sailed to Argentina in 1935 as the bride of the Anglo-Argentine Don Enrique of Los Alamos, he pointed to the ocean and said, That's the pampa. You can't tell how big it is by looking at it. You have to travel through it, the unchangingness, day after day. In some parts the wind is strong as a fist, but it's completely silent. It'll knock you flat, but you'll never hear a thing. No trees is why. Not an ombu, not a poplar, nada. And you have to watch out for ombu leaves, by the way. Deadly poison. The wind won't kill you, but the leaf juice can. She clapped her hands like a child. Honestly, Henry, silent winds, poisonous leaves. You make it sound like a fairy story. Henry, fair-haired, soft-bodied, wide-eyed and ponderous, looked appalled. Oh, no, he said. It's not so bad as that. She arrived in that immensity, beneath that infinite blue vault of sky, because Henry popped the question, and she gave the only answer that a forty-year-old spinster could. But when she arrived, she asked herself a bigger question. Of what was she capable in all that space? What did she have the courage for? How could she expand? To be good or bad, she told herself, but to be new. Our neighbour, Dr. Jorge Babington, she told Gibriel, never liked me, you know. He would tell me tales of the British in South America, always such gay blades, he said contemptuously, spies and brigands and looters. Are you such exotics in your cold England? he asked her, and answered his own question. Signora, I don't think so. Crammed into that coffin of an island, you must find wider horizons to express these secret selves. Rosa Diamond's secret was a capacity for love so great 
that it soon became plain that her poor, prosaic Henry would never fulfil it, because whatever romance there was in that jellied frame was reserved for birds. Marsh hawks, screamers, snipe. In a small rowing boat on the local lagunas, he spent his happiest days amid the bulrushes with his field glasses to his eyes. Once on the train to Buenos Aires, he embarrassed Rosa by demonstrating his favourite bird calls in the dining car, cupping his hands around his mouth, sleepy head bird, Banduria ibis, trupial. Why can't you love me this way? she wanted to ask, but never did, because for Henry she was a good sort, and passion was an eccentricity of other races. She became the generalissimo of the homestead, and tried to stifle her wicked longings. At night she took to walking out into the pamper and lying on her back to look at the galaxy above, and sometimes, under the influence of that bright flow of beauty, she would begin to tremble all over, to shudder with a deep delight, and to hum an unknown tune. And this star music was as close as she came to joy. Gibriel Farishta felt her stories winding round him like a web, holding him in that lost world where fifty sat down to dinner every day. What men they were, our gauchos! Nothing servile there, very fierce and proud, very. Pure carnivores, you can see it in the pictures. During the long nights of their insomnia, she told him about the heat haze that would come over the pampa so that the few trees stood out like islands, and a rider looked like a mythological being galloping across the surface of the ocean. It was like the ghost of the sea. She told him campfire stories, for example about the atheist gaucho who disproved paradise when his mother died by calling upon her spirit to return every night for seven nights. On the eighth night he announced that she had obviously not heard him, or she would certainly have come to console her beloved son. Therefore, death must be the end. She snared him in descriptions of the days when the Peron people came in their white suits and slicked-down hair, and the peons chased them off. She told him how the railroads were built by the Anglos to service their estancias, and the dams too, the story, for example, of her friend Claudette, a real heartbreaker, my dear, married an engineer chap name of Granger, disappointed half the Hurlingham. Off they went to some dam he was building, and next thing they heard, the rebels were coming to blow it up. Granger went with the men to guard the dam, leaving Claudette alone with the maid. And wouldn't you know, a few hours later, the maid came running. Signora, is the one hombre at the door, is as big as a house. What else? A rebel captain. And your spouse, madame? Waiting for you at the dam, as he should be. Then since he has not seen fit to protect you, the revolution will. And he left guards outside the house, my dear, quite a thing. But in the fighting both men were killed, husband and captain, and Claudette insisted on a joint funeral, watched the two coffins going side by side into the ground, mourned for them both. After that we knew she was a dangerous lot. Trop fatal, eh? What? Trop jolly fatal. In the tall story of the beautiful Claudette, Gibriel heard the music of Rosa's own longings. At such moments he would catch sight of her looking at him from the corners of her eyes, and he would feel a tugging in the region of his navel, as if something were trying to come out. Then she looked away, and the sensation faded. Perhaps it was only a side effect of stress. He asked her one night if she had seen the horns growing on Chumcha's head, but she went deaf, and instead of answering, told him how she would sit on a camp stool by the galpon or bullpen at Los Alamos, and the prize bulls would come up and lay their horned heads in her lap. One afternoon, a girl named Aurora del Sol, who was the fiancée of Martin de la Cruz, let fall a saucy remark. "'I thought they only did that in the laps of virgins,' she stage-whispered to her giggling friends. And Rosa turned to her sweetly and replied, "'Then perhaps, my dear, you would like to try.' From that time, Aurora del Sol, the best dancer at the Estancia and the most desirable of all the Pian women, 
became the deadly enemy of the too tall, too bony woman from over the sea. You look just like him, Rosa Diamond said, as they stood at her nighttime window, side by side, looking out to sea. His double, Martin de la Cruz. At the mention of the cowboy's name, Gibriel felt so violent a pain in his navel, a pulling pain, as if somebody had stuck a hook in his stomach, that a cry escaped his lips. Rosa Diamond appeared not to hear. Look, she cried happily, over there. Running along the midnight beach in the direction of the Martello Tower and the holiday camp, running along the water's edge so that the incoming tide washed away its footprints, swerving and fainting, running for its life, there came a full-grown, large-as-life ostrich. Down the beach it fled, and Gibriel's eyes followed it in wonder, until he could no longer make it out in the dark. The next thing that happened took place in the village. They had gone into town to collect a cake and a bottle of champagne, because Rosa had remembered that it was her eighty-ninth birthday. Her family had been expelled from her life, so there had been no cards or telephone calls. Jibril insisted that they should hold some sort of celebration, and showed her the secret inside his shirt, a fat money belt full of pounds sterling acquired on the black market before leaving Bombay. Also credit cards galore, he said. I am no indigent fellow. Come, let us go. My treat. He was now so deeply enthralled to Rosa's narrative sorcery that he hardly remembered from day to day that he had a life to go to, a woman to surprise by the simple fact of his being alive, or any such thing. Trailing behind her meekly, he carried Mrs. Diamond's shopping bags. He was loafing around on a street corner while Rosa chatted to the baker when he felt once again that dragging hook in his stomach, and he fell against a lamppost and gasped for air. He heard a clip-clopping noise, and then around the corner came an archaic pony trap full of young people in what seemed at first sight to be fancy dress. The men, in tight black trousers, studded the calf with silver buttons, their white shirts open almost to the waist. The women, in wide skirts of frills and layers and bright colours, scarlet, emerald, gold. They were singing in a foreign language, and their gaiety made the street look dim and tawdry. But Gibriel realised that something weird was afoot, because nobody else in the street took the slightest notice of the pony trap. Then Rosa emerged from the baker's with the cake box dangling by its ribbon from the index finger of her left hand, and exclaimed, Oh, there they are, arriving for the dance. We always had dances, you know. They like it. It's in their blood. And after a pause, that was the dance at which he killed the vulture. That was the dance at which a certain Juan Julia, nicknamed the Vulture on account of his cadaverous appearance, drank too much and insulted the honour of Aurora del Sol, and didn't stop until Martin had no option but to fight. Hey, Martin, why you enjoy fucking with this one? I thought she was pretty dull. Let us go away from the dancing, Martin said, and in the darkness... Silhouetted against the fairy lights hung from the trees around the dance floor, the two men wrapped ponchos around their forearms, drew their knives, circled, fought. Juan died. Martin de la Cruz picked up the dead man's hat and threw it at the feet of Aurora del Sol. She picked up the hat and watched him walk away. Rosa Diamond, at eighty-nine, in a long silver sheath dress with a cigarette holder in one gloved hand and a silver turban on her head, drank gin and sin from a green glass triangle and told stories of the good old days. I want to dance, she announced suddenly. It's my birthday, and I haven't danced once. The exertions of that night, on which Rosa and Gibriel danced until dawn, proved too much for the old lady, who collapsed into bed the next day with a low fever that induced ever more delirious apparitions. Gibriel saw Martin de la Cruz and Aurora del Sol dancing flamenco on the tiled and gabled roof of the diamond house, 
and peronistas in white suits stood on the boathouse to address a gathering of peons about the future. Under Peron, these lands will be expropriated and distributed among the people. The British railroads also will become the property of the state. Let's chuck them out, these brigands, these privateers. The plaster bust of Henry Diamond hung in mid-air, observing the scene and a white-suited agitator pointed a finger at him and cried, "'That's him, your oppressor. There is the enemy.' Gibriel's stomach ached so badly that he feared for his life, but at the very moment that his rational mind was considering the possibility of an ulcer or appendicitis, the rest of his brain whispered the truth, which was that he was being held prisoner and manipulated by the force of Rosa's will." just as the angel Jibril had been obliged to speak by the overwhelming need of the prophet Mahound. She's dying, he realized, not long to go either. Tossing in her bed in the fever's grip, Rosa Diamond muttered about ombu poison and the enmity of her neighbor, Dr. Babington, who asked Henry, Is your wife perhaps quiet enough for the pastoral life? And who gave her, as a present for recovering from typhus, a copy of Amerigo Vespucci's account of his voyages. The man was a notorious fantasist, of course, Babington smiled, but fantasy can be stronger than fact. After all, he had continents named after him. As she grew weaker, she poured more and more of her remaining strength into her own dream of Argentina, and Gibril's navel felt as if it had been set on fire. He lay slumped in an armchair at her bedside, and the apparitions multiplied by the hour. Woodwind music filled the air, and, most wonderful of all, a small white island appeared just off the shore, bobbing on the waves like a raft. It was white as snow, with white sand sloping up to a clump of albino trees, which were white, chalk-white, paper-white, to the very tips of their leaves. After the arrival of the White Island, Gibriel was overcome by a deep lethargy. Slumped in an armchair in the bedroom of the dying woman, his eyelids drooping, he felt the weight of his body increase until all movement became impossible. Then he was in another bedroom, in tight black trousers with silver buttons along the calves and a heavy silver buckle at the waist. "'You sent for me, Don Enrique?' he was saying to the soft, heavy man with a face like a white plaster bust, but he knew who had asked for him, and he never took his eyes from her face, even when he saw the colour rising from the white frill around her neck. Henry Diamond had refused to permit the authorities to become involved in the matter of Martin de la Cruz. These people are my responsibility, he told Rosa. It is a question of honour. Instead, he had gone to some lengths to demonstrate his continuing trust in the killer, de la Cruz, for example by making him the captain of the Estancia Polo team. But Don Enrique was never really the same once Martin had killed the vulture. He was more and more easily exhausted, and became listless, uninterested even in birds. Things began to come apart at Los Alamos, imperceptibly at first, then more obviously. The men in the white suits returned and were not chased away. When Rosa Diamond contracted typhus, there were many at the Estancia who took it for an allegory of the old estate's decline. "'What am I doing here?' Gibriel thought in great alarm, as he stood before Don Enrique in the rancher's study, while Doña Rosa blushed in the background. "'This is someone else's place!' "'Great confidence in you,' Henry was saying, not in English, but Gibriel could still understand." My wife is to undertake a motor tour for her convalescence, and you will accompany. Responsibilities at Los Alamos prevent me from going along. Now I must speak what to say. But when his mouth opened, the alien words emerged. It will be my honour, Don Enrique. Click of heels, swivel, exit. Rosa Diamond, in her eighty-nine-year-old weakness, had begun to dream her story of stories, which she had guarded for more than half a century and Gibril was on a horse behind her Hispano Suiza, driving from Estancia to Estancia through a wood of Arellana trees behind the high Cordillera, arriving at grotesque homesteads built in the style of Scottish castles or Indian palaces, 
visiting the land of Mr. Cadwallader Evans, he of the seven wives who were happy enough to have only one night of duty each per week, and the territory of the notorious McSween, who had become enamoured of the ideas arriving in Argentina from Germany, and had started flying from his Estancia's flagpole a red flag at whose heart a crooked black cross danced in a white circle. It was on the McSween Estancia that they came across the lagoon, and Rosa saw for the first time the white island of her fate, and insisted on rowing out for a picnic luncheon, accompanied neither by maid nor by chauffeur, taking only Martin de la Cruz to row the boat, and to spread a scarlet cloth upon the white sand, and to serve her with meat and wine. As white as snow, and as red as blood, and as black as ebony. As she reclined in black shirt and white blouse, lying upon scarlet which itself lay over white, while he, also wearing black and white, poured red wine into the glass in her white-gloved hand, and then, to his own astonishment, bloody goddamn, as he caught at her hand and began to kiss, something happened, the scene grew blurred. One minute they were lying on the scarlet cloth, rolling all over it, so that cheeses and cold cuts and salads and pâtés were crushed beneath the weight of their desire. And when they returned to the Hispano Suiza, it was impossible to conceal anything from chauffeur or maid on account of the food stains all over their clothes, while the next minute she was recoiling from him, not cruelly but in sadness, drawing her hand away and making a tiny gesture of the head. No, and he stood, bowed, retreated, leaving her with virtue and lunch intact. The two possibilities kept alternating, while dying Rosa tossed on her bed, did she, didn't she, making the last version of the story of her life, unable to decide what she wanted to be true. I'm going crazy, Gibriel thought. She's dying, but I'm losing my mind. The moon was out, and Rosa's breathing was the only sound in the room. Snoring as she breathed in, and exhaling heavily with small grunting noises. Gibriel tried to rise from his chair, and found he could not. Even in these intervals, between the visions, his body remained impossibly heavy, as if a boulder had been placed upon his chest, and the images, when they came, continued to be confused, so that at one moment he was in a hayloft at Los Alamos, making love to her, while she murmured his name over and over. Martin of the Cross, and the next moment she was ignoring him in broad daylight beneath the watching eyes of a certain Aurora del Sol, so that it was not possible to distinguish memory from wishes, or guilty reconstructions from confessional truths, because even on her deathbed Rosa Diamond did not know how to look her history in the eye. Moonlight streamed into the room. As it struck Rosa's face, it appeared to pass right through her, and indeed Gibriel was beginning to be able to make out the pattern of the lace embroidery on her pillowcase. Then he saw Don Enrique and his friend, the puritanical and disapproving Dr. Babington, standing on the balcony, as solid as you could wish. It occurred to him that as the apparitions increased in clarity, Rosa grew fainter and fainter, fading away, exchanging places, one might say, with the ghosts, and because he had also understood that the manifestations depended on him, his stomach-ache, his stone-like weightiness, he began to fear for his own life as well. "'You wanted me to falsify Juan Julia's death certificate,' Dr. Babington was saying. "'I did so out of our old friendship, but it was wrong to do so, and I see the result before me. You have sheltered a killer.' and it is perhaps your conscience that is eating you away. Go home, Enrique, go home, and take that wife of yours before something worse happens. I am home, Henry Diamond said, and I take exception to your mention of my wife. Wherever the English settle, they never leave England, Dr. Babington said as he faded into the moonlight, unless, like Doña Rosa, they fall in love. A cloud passed across the moonlight, and now that the balcony was empty, Gibriel Farishta finally managed to force himself out of the chair and onto his feet. 
Walking was like dragging a ball and chain across the floor, but he reached the window. In every direction and as far as he could see, there were giant thistles waving in the breeze. Where the sea had been, there was now an ocean of thistles extending as far as the horizon, thistles as high as a full-grown man. He heard the disembodied voice of Dr. Babington mutter in his ear, The first the plague of thistles for fifty years, the past, it seems, returns. He saw a woman running through the thick, rippling growth, barefoot, with loose, dark hair. She did it, Rose's voice said clearly behind him, after betraying him with the vulture and making him into a murderer. He wouldn't look at her after that. Oh, she did it all right. Very dangerous one, that one. Very. Jibril lost sight of Aurora del Sol in the thistles. One mirage obscured another. He felt something grab him from behind, spin him around, and fling him flat on his back. There was nobody to be seen, but Rosa Diamond was sitting bolt upright in bed, staring at him wide-eyed, making him understand that she had given up hope of clinging on to life and needed him to help her complete the last revelation. As with the businessman of his dreams, he felt helpless, ignorant. She seemed to know, however, how to draw the images from him. Linking the two of them, navel to navel, he saw a shining cord. Now he was by a pond in the infinity of the thistles, allowing his horse to drink, and she came riding up on her mare. Now he was embracing her, loosening her garments and her hair, and now they were making love. Now she was whispering, How can you like me? I am so much older than you. And he spoke comforting words. Now she rose, dressed, rode away, while he remained there, his body languid and warm, failing to notice the moment when a woman's hand stole out of the thistles and took hold of his silver-hafted knife. No, 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 this way! Now she rode up to him by the pond, and the moment she dismounted, looking nervously at him, he fell upon her. He told her he couldn't bear her rejections any longer. They fell to the ground together. She screamed. He tore at her clothes, and her hands, clawing at his body, came upon the handle of a knife. No, no, never no, this way, here. Now the two of them were making love, tenderly, with many slow caresses. And now a third rider entered the clearing by the pool, and the lovers rushed apart. Now Don Enrique drew his small pistol and aimed at his rival's heart and he felt Aurora stabbing him in the heart over and over. This is for Juan, and this is for abandoning me, and this is for your grand English whore. And he felt his victim's knife entering his heart as Rosa stabbed him once, twice, and again. And after Henry's bullet had killed him, the Englishman took the dead man's knife and stabbed him many times in the bleeding wound. Jibril, screaming loudly, lost consciousness at this point. When he regained his senses, the old woman in the bed was speaking to herself, so softly that he could barely make out the words. The pampero came, the southwest wind flattening the thistles. That's when they found him, or was it before? The last of the story how Aurora del Sol spat in Rosa Diamond's face at the funeral of Martin de la Cruz, how it was arranged that nobody was to be charged for the murder, on condition that Don Enrique took Doña Rosa and returned to England with all speed, how they boarded the train at the Los Alamos station and the men in white suits stood on the platform wearing Borsalino hats, making sure they really left how once the train had started moving, Rosa Diamond opened the hold-all on the seat beside her and said defiantly, I brought something, a little souvenir, and unwrapped a cloth bundle to reveal a gaucho's silver-hafted knife. Henry died the first winter home. Then nothing happened. The war, the end. 
she paused. To diminish into this, after being in that vastness, it isn't to be born. And after a further silence, everything shrinks. There was a change in the moonlight, and Gibriel felt a weight lifting from him, so rapidly that he thought he might float up towards the ceiling. Rosa Diamond lay still, eyes closed, her arms resting on the patchwork counterpane. She looked normal. Gibriel realized that there was nothing to prevent him from walking out of the door. He made his way downstairs carefully, his legs still a little unsteady, found the heavy gabardine overcoat that had once belonged to Henry Diamond, and the grey felt trilby inside which Don Enrique's name had been sewn by his wife's own hand, and left without looking back. The moment he got outside, a wind snatched his hat and sent it skipping down the beach. He chased it, caught it, jammed it back on. London Sharif, here I come. He had the city in his pocket, geographer's London, the whole dog-eared metropolis, A to Z. What to do, he was thinking, phone or not phone? No, just turn up, ring the bell and say, Baby, your wish came true, from sea bed to your bed. Takes more than a plane crash to keep me away from you. Okay, maybe not quite, but words to that effect. Yes, surprise is the best policy. Ali Bibi, boo to you. Then he heard the singing. It was coming from the old boathouse with the one-eyed pirate painted on the outside, and the song was foreign, but familiar, a song that Rosa Diamond had often hummed, and the voice too was familiar, although a little different, less quavery, younger. The boathouse door was unaccountably unlocked and banging in the wind. He went towards the song. Take your coat off, she said. She was dressed as she had been on the day of the White Island, black skirt and boots, white silk blouse, hatless. He spread the coat on the boathouse floor, its bright scarlet lining glowing in the confined moonlit space. She lay down amid the random clutter of an English life, cricket stumps, a yellowed lampshade, chipped vases, a folding table, trunks, and extended an arm towards him. He lay down by her side. How can you like me, she murmured. I am so much older than you. Chapter 3 when they pulled his pyjamas down in the windowless police van, and he saw the thick, tightly curled dark hair covering his thighs, Saladin Chumcha broke down for the second time that night. This time, however, he began to giggle hysterically, infected perhaps by the continuing hilarity of his captors. The three immigration officers were in particularly high spirits, and it was one of these, the pop-eyed fellow whose name it transpired was Stein, who had debagged Saladin with a merry cry of, "'Opening time, Packy! Let's see what you're made of!' Red and white stripes were dragged off the protesting chumcha, who was reclining on the floor of the van with two stout policemen holding each arm, and a fifth constable's boot placed firmly upon his chest, and whose protest went unheard in the general mirthful din. His horns kept banging against things, the wheel arch, the uncarpeted floor— or a policeman's shin. On these last occasions he was soundly buffeted about the face by the understandably irate law enforcement officer, and he was, in sum, in as miserably low spirits as he could recall. Nevertheless, when he saw what lay beneath his borrowed pyjamas, he could not prevent that disbelieving giggle from escaping past his teeth. His thighs had grown uncommonly wide and powerful, as well as hairy. Below the knee the hairiness came to a halt, and his legs narrowed into tough, bony, almost fleshless calves, terminating in a pair of shiny, cloven hooves, such as one might find on any billy-goat. Saladin was also taken aback by the sight of his phallus, greatly enlarged and embarrassingly erect, an organ that he had the greatest difficulty in acknowledging as his own. "'What's this, then?' joked Novak, the former hisser, giving it a playful tweak. Fancy one of us, maybe. 
whereupon the moaning immigration officer, Joe Bruno, slapped his thigh, dug Novak in the ribs and shouted, Nah, that ain't it. Seems like we really got his goat. I get it, Novak shouted back, as his fist accidentally punched Saladin in his newly enlarged testicles. Hey, hey, howled Stein, with tears in his eyes. Listen, here's an even better. No wonder he's so fucking horny. At which the three of them, repeating many times, got his goat, horny, fell into one another's arms and howled with delight. Chumcha wanted to speak, but was afraid that he would find his voice mutated into goat bleats, and besides, the policeman's boot had begun to press harder than ever on his chest, and it was hard to form any words. What puzzled Chumcha was that a circumstance which struck him as utterly bewildering and unprecedented, that is, his metamorphosis into this supernatural imp, was being treated by the others as if it were the most banal and familiar matter they could imagine. This isn't England, he thought, not for the first or last time. How could it be, after all? Where in all that moderate and commonsensical land was there room for such a police van in whose interior such events as these might plausibly transpire? He was being forced towards the conclusion that he had indeed died in the exploding aeroplane, and that everything that followed had been some sort of afterlife. If that were the case, his long-standing rejection of the Eternal was beginning to look pretty foolish. But where in all this was any sign of a supreme being, whether benevolent or malign? Why did purgatory, or hell, or whatever this place might be, look so much like that Sussex of rewards and fairies which every schoolboy knew? Perhaps it occurred to him he had not actually perished in the Bostan disaster, but was lying gravely ill in some hospital ward, plagued by delirious dreams. This explanation appealed to him, not least because it unmade the meaning of a certain late-night telephone call, and a man's voice that he was trying, unsuccessfully, to forget. He felt a sharp kick land on his ribs, painful and realistic enough to make him doubt the truth of all such hallucination theories. He returned his attention to the actual, to this present comprising a sealed police van containing three immigration officers and five policemen that was, for the moment at any rate, all the universe he possessed. It was a universe of fear. Novak and the rest had snapped out of their happy mood. Animal! Stein cursed him as he administered a series of kicks, and Bruno joined in. You're all the same. Can't expect animals to observe civilized standards, eh? And Novak took up the thread. We're talking about fucking personal hygiene here, you little fuck. Chumcha was mystified. Then he noticed that a large number of soft, pellety objects had appeared on the floor of the Black Mariah. He felt consumed by bitterness and shame. It seemed that even his natural processes were goatish now. The humiliation of it. He was, had gone to some lengths to become a sophisticated man. Such degradations might be all very well for riffraff from villages in Silet or the bicycle repair shops of Gujranbala, but he was cut from different cloth. My good fellows, he began, attempting a tone of authority that was pretty difficult to bring off from that undignified position on his back with his hoofy legs wide apart and a soft tumble of his own excrement all about him. My good fellows, you had best understand your mistake before it's too late. Novak cupped a hand behind an ear. "'What's that? What was that noise?' he inquired, looking about him. And Stein said, "'Search me!' "'Tell you what it sounded like,' Joe Bruno volunteered, and with his hands around his mouth he bellowed, "'Mah!' Then the three of them all laughed once more, so that Saladin had no way of telling if they were simply insulting him, or if his vocal cords had truly been infected, as he feared, by this macabre demoniasis that had overcome him without the slightest warning. He had begun to shiver again. The night was extremely cold. The officer, Stein, who appeared to be the leader of the Trinity, or at least the primus inter pares, returned abruptly to the subject of the pellety refuse rolling around the floor of the moving van. "'In this country,' he informed Saladin, "'we clean up our messes.' The policeman stopped holding him down and pulled him into a kneeling position. "'That's right,' said Novak. "'Clean it up!' 
Joe Bruno placed a large hand behind Chumcha's neck and pushed his head down towards the pellet-littered floor. Off you go, he said in a conversational voice. Sooner you start, sooner you'll polish it off. Even as he was performing, having no option, the latest and basest ritual of his unwarranted humiliation, or, to put it another way, as the circumstances of his miraculously spared life grew ever more infernal and outre, Saladin Chumcha began to notice that the three immigration officers no longer looked or acted nearly as strangely as at first. For one thing, they no longer resembled one another in the slightest. Officer Stein, whom his colleagues called Mac, or Jockey, turned out to be a large, burly man with a thick roller coaster of a nose. His accent, it now transpired, was exaggeratedly Scottish. That's the ticket, he remarked approvingly as Chumcha munched miserably on. An actor, was it? I'm partial to watching a good man perform. This observation prompted Officer Novak, that is, Kim, who had acquired an alarmingly pallid colouring, an ascetically bony face that reminded one of medieval icons, and a frown suggesting some deep inner torment, to burst into a short peroration about his favourite television soap opera stars and game show hosts, while Officer Bruno, who struck Chumcha as having grown exceedingly handsome all of a sudden, his hair shiny with styling gel and centrally divided, his blond beard contrasting dramatically with the darker hair on his head. Bruno, the youngest of the three, asked lasciviously, What about watching girls, then? That's my game. This new notion set the three of them off into all manner of half-completed anecdotes, pregnant with suggestions of a certain type. But when the five policemen attempted to join in, they joined ranks, grew stern, and put the constables in their places. Little children, Mr. Stein admonished them, should be seen and no hurt. By this time, Chumcha was gagging violently on his meal, forcing himself not to vomit, knowing that such an error would only prolong his misery. He was crawling about on the floor of the van, seeking out the pellets of his torture as they rolled from side to side, and the policeman, needing an outlet for the frustration engendered by the immigration officer's rebuke, began to abuse Saladin roundly and pull the hair on his rump to increase both his discomfort and his discomfiture. Then the five policemen defiantly started up their own version of the immigration officer's conversation and set to analysing the merits of divers movie stars, darts players, professional wrestlers and the like. But because they had been put into a bad humour by the loftiness of Jockey Stein, they were unable to maintain the abstract and intellectual tone of their superiors, and fell to quarrelling over the relative merits of the Tottenham Hotspur double team of the early 1960s and the mighty Liverpool side of the present day, in which the Liverpool supporters incensed the Spurs fans by alleging that the great Danny Blanchflower was a luxury player, a cream puff, flower by name, pansy by nature, whereupon the offended clack responded by shouting that in the case of Liverpool it was the supporters who were the bum boys, the Spurs mob could take them apart with their arms tied behind their backs. Of course, all the constables were familiar with the techniques of football hooligans, having spent many Saturdays with their backs to the game, watching the spectators in the various stadiums up and down the country. And as their argument grew heated, they reached the point of wishing to demonstrate to their opposing colleagues exactly what they meant by tearing apart, bollocking, bottling, and the like. The angry factions glared at one another, and then, all together, they turned to gaze upon the person of Saladin Chumcha. Well, the ruckus in that police van grew noisier and noisier, and it's true to say that Chumcha was partly to blame, because he had started squealing like a pig, and the young bobbies were thumping and gouging various parts of his anatomy, using him both as a guinea pig and a safety valve, remaining careful, in spite of their excitation, to confine their blows to his softer, more fleshy parts to minimise the risk of breakages and bruises. And when Jockey, Kim and Joey saw what their juniors were getting up to, they chose to be tolerant, because boys would have their fun. Besides, all this talk of watching had brought Stein, Bruno and Novak round to an examination of weightier matters, and now, with solemn faces and judicious voices, they were speaking of the need in this day and age for an increase in observation 
not merely in the sense of spectating, but in that of watchfulness and surveillance. The young constable's experience was extremely relevant, Stein intoned. Watch the crowd, not the game. Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty, he proclaimed. Eek! cried Chumcha, unable to avoid interrupting. Ah! Uh, oh! After a time, a curious mood of detachment fell upon Saladin. He no longer had any idea how long they had been travelling in the Black Mariah of his hard fall from grace, nor could he have hazarded a guess as to the proximity of their ultimate destination, even though the tinnitus in his ears was growing gradually louder, those phantasmal grandmother's footsteps, L-O-N-D-O-N, London. The blows raining down on him now felt as soft as a lover's caresses. The grotesque sight of his own metamorphosed body no longer appalled him. Even the last pellets of goat excrement failed to stir his much-abused stomach. Numbly, he crouched down in his little world, trying to make himself smaller and smaller, in the hope that he might eventually disappear altogether, and so regain his freedom. The talk of surveillance techniques had reunited immigration officers and policemen, healing the breach caused by Jockey Stein's words of puritanical reproof. Chumcha, the insect on the floor of the van, heard, as if through a telephone scrambler, the faraway voices of his captors speaking eagerly of the need for more video equipment at public events, and of the benefits of computerized information, and, in what appeared to be a complete contradiction, of the efficacy of placing too rich a mixture in the nosebags of police horses on the night before a big match, because when equine stomach upsets led to the marchers being showered with shit, it always provoked them into violence. And then we can really get amongst them, can't we, just? Unable to find a way of making this universe of soap operas, match of the day, cloaks and daggers, cohere into any recognisable whole, Chumcha closed his ears to the chatter and listened to the footsteps in his ears. Then the penny dropped. Ask the computer! Three immigration officers and five policemen fell silent as the foul-smelling creature sat up and hollered at them. "'What's he on about?' asked the youngest policeman, one of the Tottenham supporters, as it happened, doubtfully. "'Shall I fetch him another whack? "'My name is Salaudin Chamchavala, professional name Saladin Chamcha,' the demigod gibbered. "'I am a member of Actors' Equity, the Automobile Association, and the Garrick Club. "'My car registration number is such and such. "'Ask the computer, please.' "'Who are you trying to kid?' inquired one of the Liverpool fans, but he too sounded uncertain. "'Look at yourself. You're a fucking packy billy. Sally who? What kind of name is that for an Englishman?' Chumcha found a scrap of anger from somewhere. "'And what about them?' he demanded, jerking his head at the immigration officers. "'They don't sound so Anglo-Saxon to me.' For a moment it seemed that they might all fall upon him and tear him limb from limb for such temerity— but at length the skull-faced officer Novak merely slapped his face a few times while replying, "'I'm from Weybridge, you cunt. Get it straight. Weybridge, where the fucking Beatles used to live.' Stein said, "'Better check him out.' Three and a half minutes later the Black Maria came to a halt, and three immigration officers, five constables, and one police driver held a crisis conference." Here's a pretty effin' pickle. And Chumcha noted that in their new mood, all nine had begun to look alike, rendered equal and identical by their tension and fear. Nor was it long before he understood that the call to the police national computer, which had promptly identified him as a British citizen first class, had not improved his situation, but had placed him, if anything, in greater danger than before. We could say, one of the nine suggested, that he was lying unconscious on the beach. "'Won't work,' came the reply, "'on account of the old lady and the other geezer. "'Then he resisted arrest and turned nasty, "'and in the ensuing altercation he kind of fainted. "'Or the old bag was gaga, made no sense to any of us, "'and the other guy, what's name, never spoke up, "'and as for this bugger, you only have to clock the bleeder. "'Looks like the very devil. "'What were we supposed to think? "'And then he went and passed out on us, "'so what could we do?' 
In all fairness, I ask here, Your Honour, but bring him in to the medical facility at the detention centre for proper care followed by observation and questioning, using our reason-to-believe guidelines. What do you reckon on something of that nature? It's nine against one, but the old biddy and the second bloke make it a bit of a bastard. Look, we can fix the tail later. First thing, like, I keep saying, is to get him unconscious, right? Chumcha woke up in a hospital bed with green slime coming up from his lungs. His bones felt as if somebody had put them in the icebox for a long while. He began to cough, and when the fit ended nineteen and a half minutes later, he fell back into a shallow, sickly sleep without having taken in any aspect of his present whereabouts. When he surfaced again, a friendly woman's face was looking down at him, smiling reassuringly. You're going to be fine, she said, patting him on the shoulder. A little pneumonia is all you got. She introduced herself as his physiotherapist, Hyacinth Phillips, and added, I never judge a person by appearances. No, sir, don't you go thinking I do. With that, she rolled him over onto his side, placed a small cardboard box by his lips, hitched up her white housecoat, kicked off her shoes, and leapt athletically onto the bed to sit astride him, for all the world as if he were a horse that she meant to ride right through the screen surrounding his bed and out into goodness knew what manner of transmogrified landscape. Doctor's orders, she explained, thirty minute sessions twice a day. Without further preamble, she began pummeling him briskly about the middle body with lightly clenched but evidently expert fists. For poor Saladin, fresh from his beating in the police van, this new assault was the last straw. He began to struggle beneath her pounding fists, crying loudly, Let me out of here! Has anybody informed my wife? The effort of shouting out induced a second coughing spasm that lasted seventeen and three-quarter minutes, and earned him a telling off from the physiotherapist Hyacinth. You wasting my time, she said. I should be done with your right lung by now, and instead I hardly get started. You go behave or not. She had remained on the bed straddling him, bouncing up and down as his body convulsed, like a rodeo rider hanging on for the nine-second bell. He subsided in defeat, and allowed her to beat the green fluid out of his inflamed lungs. When she finished, he was obliged to admit that he felt a good deal better. She removed the little box which was now half full of slime, and said cheerily, You be standing up firm in no time, and then, colouring in confusion, apologised, Excuse me, and fled without remembering to pull back the encircling screens. A time to take stock of the situation, he told himself. A quick physical examination informed him that his new, mutant condition had remained unchanged. This cast his spirits down, and he realised that he had been half hoping that the nightmare would have ended while he slept. He was dressed in a new pair of alien pyjamas, this time of an undifferentiated pale green colour, which matched both the fabric of the screens and what he could see of the walls and ceiling of that cryptic and anonymous ward. His legs still ended in those distressing hooves, and the horns on his head were as sharp as before. He was distracted from this morose inventory by a man's voice from nearby, crying out in heart-rending distress, Oh, if ever a body suffered! What on earth? Chumcha thought, and determined to investigate. But now he was becoming aware of many other sounds, as unsettling as the first. It seemed to him that he could hear all sorts of animal noises, the snorting of bulls, the chattering of monkeys, even the pretty Polly mimic squawks of parrots or talking budgerigars. Then, from another direction, he heard a woman grunting and shrieking at what sounded like the end of a painful labour, followed by the yowling of a newborn baby. However, the woman's cries did not subside when the babies began. If anything, they redoubled in their intensity, and perhaps fifteen minutes later, Chumcha distinctly heard a second infant's voice joining the first. Still the woman's birth agony refused to end, and at intervals ranging from fifteen to thirty minutes, for what seemed like an endless time, 
she continued to add new babies to the already improbable numbers marching like conquering armies from her womb. His nose informed him that the sanatorium, or whatever the place called itself, was also beginning to stink to the heavens. Jungle and farmyard odours mingled with a rich aroma similar to that of exotic spices sizzling in clarified butter. Coriander, turmeric, cinnamon, cardamoms, cloves. This is too much, he thought firmly. A time to get a few things sorted out. He swung his legs out of bed, tried to stand up, and promptly fell to the floor, being utterly unaccustomed to his new legs. It took him around an hour to overcome this problem, learning to walk by holding on to the bed and stumbling around it until his confidence grew. At length, and not a little unsteadily, he made his way to the nearest screen, whereupon the face of the immigration officer, Stein, appeared, Cheshire cat-like, between two of the screens to his left, followed rapidly by the rest of the fellow, who drew the screens together behind him with suspicious rapidity. "'Doing all right?' Stein asked, his smile remaining wide. "'When can I see the doctor? When can I go to the toilet? When can I leave?' Chumcha asked in a rush. Stein answered equably, "'The doctor would be round presently. Nurse Phillips would bring him a bedpan. He could leave as soon as he was well.' "'Damn decent of you to come down with a lung thing,' Stein added, with the gratitude of an author whose character had unexpectedly solved a ticklish technical problem. "'Makes the story much more convincing. Seems you were that sick you did pass out on us after all. Nine of us remember it well. Thanks.' Chumcha could not find any words. "'And another thing,' Stein went on. "'The old bird, Mrs. Diamond, turns out to be dead in her bed, cold as mutton.' and the other gentleman vanished clear away. The possibility of foul play has no as yet been eliminated. In conclusion, he said before disappearing forever from Saladin's new life, I suggest, Mr. Citizen Saladin, that you dinna trouble with a complaint. You'll forgive me for speaking plain, but with your wee horns and your great hooves, you wouldn't look the most reliable of witnesses. Good day to you now. Saladin Chumcha closed his eyes, and when he opened them, his tormentor had turned into the nurse and physiotherapist Hyacinth Phillips. "'Why you want to go walking?' she asked. "'Whatever your heart desires, you just ask me, Hyacinth, and we'll see what we can fix.' Sst. That night, in the greeny light of the mysterious institution, Saladin was awakened by a hiss out of an Indian bazaar. Sst! You! Beelzebub, wake up! Standing in front of him was a figure so impossible that Chumcha wanted to bury his head under the sheets, yet could not, for was not he himself? That's right, the creature said. You see, you're not alone. It had an entirely human body, but its head was that of a ferocious tiger with three rows of teeth. The night guards often doze off, it explained. That's how we manage to get to talk. Just then a voice from one of the other beds. Each bed, as Chumcha now knew, was protected by its own ring of screens, wailed loudly. Oh, if ever a body suffered! And the man-tiger, or manticore, as it called itself, gave an exasperated growl. That Mona Lisa, it exclaimed, all they did to him was make him blind. Uh, who did what? Chumcha was confused. The point is, the manticore continued, are you going to put up with it? Saladin was still puzzled. The other seemed to be suggesting that these mutations were the responsibility of... Of whom? How could they be? I don't see, he ventured. Who can be blamed? The manticore ground its three rows of teeth in evident frustration. There's a woman over that way, it said, who is now mostly water buffalo. There are businessmen from Nigeria who have grown sturdy tails. There is a group of holiday makers from Senegal who were doing no more than changing planes when they were turned into slippery snakes. I myself am in the rag trade. For some years now, I have been a highly paid male model based in Bombay, wearing a wide range of suitings and shirtings also. But who will employ me now? He burst into sudden and unexpected tears. 
There, there, said Saladin Chumcha automatically. Everything will be all right. I'm sure of it. Have courage. The creature composed itself. The point is, it said fiercely, some of us aren't going to stand for it. We're going to bust out of here before they turn us into anything worse. Every night I feel a different piece of me beginning to change. I've started, for example, to break wind continually. I beg your pardon. You see what I mean? By the way, try these. He slipped Chumcha a packet of extra-strength peppermints. They'll help your breath. I've bribed one of the guards to bring in a supply. But how do they do it? Chumcha wanted to know. They describe us, the other whispered solemnly. That's all. They have the power of description, and we succumb to the pictures they construct. It's hard to believe, Chumcha argued. I've lived here for many years, and it never happened before. His words dried up because he saw the manticore looking at him through narrow, distrustful eyes. Many years? it asked. How could that be? Maybe you're an informer. Yes, that's it, a spy. Just then, a wail came from a far corner of the ward. Let me go, a woman's voice howled. Oh, Jesus, I want to go. Jesus, Mary, I got to go. Let me go. Oh, God, oh, Jesus, God. A very lecherous-looking wolf put its head through Saladin's screens and spoke urgently to the manticore. The guards will be here soon, it hissed. It's her again, Glass Bertha. A glass, Saladin began. Her skin turned to glass, the manticore explained impatiently, not knowing that he was bringing Chumcha's worst dream to life. And the bastard smashed it up for her. Now she can't even walk to the toilet. A new voice hissed out across the greeny night. For God's sake, woman, go in the fucking bedpan. The wolf was pulling the manticore away. Is he with us or not? It wanted to know. The manticore shrugged. He can't make up his mind, it answered. Can't believe his own eyes, that's his trouble. They fled, hearing the approaching crunch of the guard's heavy boots. The next day there was no sign of a doctor or of Pamela, and Chumcha, in his utter bewilderment, woke and slept as if the two conditions no longer required to be thought of as opposites, but as states that flowed into and out of one another to create a kind of unending delirium of the senses. He found himself dreaming of the queen, of making tender love to the monarch. She was the body of Britain, the avatar of the state, and he had chosen her, joined with her. She was his beloved, the moon of his delight. Hyacinth came at the appointed times to ride and pummel him, and he submitted without any fuss. But when she finished, she whispered into his ear, You in with the rest? And he understood that she was involved in the great conspiracy too. If you are, he heard himself saying, then you can count me in. She nodded, looking pleased. Chumcha felt a warmth filling him up, and he began to wonder about taking hold of one of the physiotherapist's exceedingly dainty, albeit powerful, little fists. But just then, a shout came from the direction of the blind man. My stick! I've lost my stick! Poor old bugger, said Hyacinth, and hopping off Chumcha, she darted across to the sightless fellow, picked up the fallen stick, restored it to its owner, and came back to Saladin. Now, she said, I'll see you this p.m., OK? No problems. He wanted her to stay, but she acted brisk. I'm a busy woman, Mr. Chumcha. Things to do, people to see. When she had gone, he lay back and smiled for the first time in a long while. It did not occur to him that his metamorphosis must be continuing, because he was actually entertaining romantic notions about a black woman. And before he had time to think such complex thoughts, the blind man next door began once again to speak. I have noticed you, Chumcha heard him say. I have noticed you and come to appreciate your kindness and understanding. Saladin realized that he was making a formal speech of thanks to the empty space where he clearly believed the physiotherapist was still standing. I am not a man who forgets a kindness. One day, perhaps, I may be able to repay it, but for the moment, please know that it is remembered, and fondly too. 
Chumcha did not have the courage to call out, She isn't there, old man. She left some time back. He listened unhappily, until at length the blind man asked the thin air a question. I hope perhaps you may also remember me? A little? On occasion? Then came a silence, a dry laugh, the sound of a man sitting down heavily all of a sudden, and finally, after an unbearable pause, bathos. Oh, the soliloquist bellowed, oh, if ever a body suffered. We strive for the heights, but our natures betray us, Chumcha thought, clowns in search of crowns. The bitterness overcame him. Once I was lighter, happier, warm. Now the black water is in my veins. Still no Pamela. What the hell? That night he told the manticore and the wolf that he was with them all the way. The great escape took place some nights later, when Saladin's lungs had been all but emptied of slime by the ministrations of Miss Hyacinth Phillips. It turned out to be a well-organized affair on a pretty large scale, involving not only the inmates of the sanatorium, but also the detenue, as the manticore called them, held behind wire fences in the detention center nearby. Not being one of the grand strategists of the escape, Chumcha simply waited by his bed as instructed until Hyacinth brought him word, and then they ran out of that ward of nightmares into the clarity of a cold, moonlit sky, past several bound, gagged men, their former guards. There were many shadowy figures running through the glowing night, and Chumcha glimpsed beings he could never have imagined, men and women who were also partially plants or giant insects, or even on occasion built partly of brick or stone. There were men with rhinoceros horns instead of noses, and women with necks as long as any giraffe. The monsters ran quickly, silently, to the edge of the detention centre compound, where the manticore and other sharp-toothed mutants were waiting by the large holes they had bitten into the fabric of the containing fence. And then they were out, free, going their separate ways, without hope, but also without shame. Saladin Chumcha and Hyacinth Phillips ran side by side, his goat hooves clip-clopping on the hard pavements. East, she told him, as he heard his own footsteps replace the tinnitus in his ears. East, east, east they ran, taking the low roads to London town. Chapter 4 Jumpy Joshi had become Pamela Chumcha's lover by what she afterwards called sheer chance, on the night she learnt of her husband's death in the Bostan explosion, so that the sound of his old college friend Saladin's voice speaking from beyond the grave in the middle of the night, uttering the five gnomic words, uh, Sorry, excuse please, wrong number. Speaking, moreover, less than two hours after Jumpy and Pamela had made, with the assistance of two bottles of whiskey, the two-backed beast, put him in a tight spot. Who was that? Pamela still mostly asleep with a blackout mask over her eyes, rolled over to inquire. And he decided to reply, Just a breather, don't worry about it. Which was all very well, except then he had to do the worrying all by himself, sitting up in bed, naked, and sucking for comfort as he had all his life the thumb on his right hand. He was a small person with wire coat-hanger shoulders and an enormous capacity for nervous agitation, evidenced by his pale, sunken-eyed face. His thinning hair, still entirely black and curly, which had been ruffled so often by his frenzied hands that it no longer took the slightest notice of brushes or combs, but stuck out every which way, and gave its owner the perpetual air of having just woken up, late, and in a hurry. And his endearingly high, shy, and self-deprecating, but also hiccupy and overexcited giggle all of which had helped turn his name, Jumshid, into this Jumpy that everybody, even first-time acquaintances, now automatically used. Everybody, that is, except Pamela Chumcha. Saladin's wife, he thought, sucking away feverishly. Or widow. Or, God help me, wife after all. 
he found himself resenting Chumcha, a return from a watery grave, so operatic an event in this day and age, seemed almost indecent, an act of bad faith. He had rushed over to Pamela's place the moment he heard the news, and found her dry-eyed and composed. She led him into her clutter-lover's study, on whose walls watercolours of rose gardens hung between clenched-fist posters reading Partido Socialista, photographs of friends and a cluster of African masks, and as he picked his way across the floor between ashtrays and The Voice newspaper and feminist science fiction novels, she said flatly, The surprising thing is that when they told me I thought, well, shrug, his death will actually make a pretty small hole in my life. Jumpy, who was close to tears and bursting with memories, stopped in his tracks and flapped his arms, looking in his great shapeless black coat and with his pallid, terror-stricken face, like a vampire caught in the unexpected and hideous light of day. Then he saw the empty whisky bottles. Pamela had started drinking, she said, some hours back, and since then she had been going at it steadily, rhythmically, with the dedication of a long-distance runner. He sat down beside her on her low, squashy sofa bed and offered to act as a pacemaker. "'Whatever you want,' she said, and passed him the bottle. Now sitting up in bed with a thumb instead of a bottle, his secret and his hangover banging equally painfully inside his head, he had never been a drinking or a secretive man, Jumpy felt tears coming on once again and decided to get up and walk himself around. Where he went was upstairs to what Saladin had insisted on calling his den, a large loft space with skylights and windows looking down on an expanse of communal gardens dotted with comfortable trees, oak, larch, even the last of the elms, a survivor of the plague years. First the elms, now us, Jumpy reflected. Maybe the trees were a warning. He shook himself to banish such small-hour morbidities, and perched on the edge of his friend's mahogany desk. Once, at a college party, he had perched just so, on a table soggy with spilt wine and beer, next to an emaciated girl in black lace minidress, purple feather boa, and eyelids like silver helmets, unable to pluck up the courage to say hello. Finally, he did turn to her and stutter out some banality or other. She gave him a look of absolute contempt and said, without moving her black lacquer lips, Conversation's dead, man. He had been pretty upset, so upset that he blurted out, Tell me, why are all the girls in this town so rude? And she answered, without pausing to think, Because most of the boys are like you. A few moments later, Chumcha came up, reeking of patchouli, wearing a white kurta, everybody's goddamn cartoon of the mysteries of the East, and the girl left with him five minutes later. The bastard, Jumpy Joshi thought, as the old bitterness surged back. He had no shame. He was ready to be anything they wanted to buy. That read-your-palm bedspread jacket, Hare Krishna, Dharma Bum, you wouldn't have caught me dead. That stopped him, that word right there. Dead. Face it, Jamshid, the girls never went for you, that's the truth, and the rest is envy. Well, maybe so, he half conceded, and then again, maybe dead, he added, and then again, maybe not. Jamshid's room struck the sleepless intruder as contrived, and therefore sad, the caricature of an actor's room full of signed photographs of colleagues, handbills, framed programs, production stills, citations, awards, volumes of movie star memoirs, a room bought off the peg by the yard, an imitation of life, a mask's mask, novelty items on every surface, ashtrays in the shape of pianos, china pieros peeping out from behind a shelf of books, and everywhere... On the walls, in the movie posters, in the glow of the lamp borne by bronze Eros, in the mirror shaped like a heart, oozing up through the blood-red carpet, dripping from the ceiling, Saladin's need for love.
In the theatre, everybody gets kissed, and everybody is darling. The actor's life offers, on a daily basis, the simulacrum of love. A mask can be satisfied, or at least consoled, by the echo of what it seeks. The desperation there was in him, Jumpy recognised, he'd do anything, put on any damn fool costume, change into any shape, if it earned him a loving word. Saladin, who wasn't by any means unsuccessful with women, see above. The poor stumble-bum. Even Pamela, with all her beauty and brightness, hadn't been enough. It was clear he'd been getting to be a long way from enough for her. Somewhere around the bottom of the second whiskey bottle, she leant her head on his shoulder and said boozily, You can't imagine the relief of being with someone with whom I don't have to have a fight every time I express an opinion. Someone on the side of the goddamn angels. He waited. After pause, there was more. Him and his royal family, you wouldn't believe. Cricket, the Houses of Parliament, the Queen. The place never stopped being a picture postcard to him. You couldn't get him to look at what was really real. She closed her eyes and allowed her hand by accident to rest on his. He was a real Saladin, Jumpy said. A man with a holy land to conquer, his England, the one he believed in. You were part of it, too. She rolled away from him and stretched out on top of magazines, crumpled balls of waste paper, mess. Part of it? I was bloody Britannia. Warm beer, mince pies, common sense, and me. But I'm really real, too, J.J. I really, really am. She reached over to him, pulled him across to where her mouth was waiting, kissed him with a great, unpamela like slurp. See what I mean? Yes, he saw. You should have heard him on the Falklands War, she said later, disengaging herself and fiddling with her hair. Pamela, suppose you heard a noise downstairs in the middle of the night and went to investigate and found a huge man in the living room with a shotgun, and he said, Go back upstairs. What would you do? I'd go upstairs, I said. Well, it's like that. Intruders in the home. It won't do. Jumpy noticed her fists had clenched and her knuckles were bone white. I said, if you must use these blasted cosy metaphors, then get them right. What it's like is, if two people claim they own a house and one of them is squatting the place and then the other turns up with the shotgun. That's what it's like. And that's what's really real, Jumpy nodded seriously. Right, she slapped his knee. That's really right, Mr. Real Jam. It's really, truly like that. Actually, another drink. She leant over to the tape deck and pushed a button. Jesus, Jumpy thought, Boney M, give me a break. For all her tough, race-professional attitudes, the lady still had a lot to learn about music. Here it came, boom chicka boom Then, without warning, he was crying, provoked into real tears by counterfeit emotion, by a disco-beat imitation of pain. It was the 137th Psalm, Super Flumina, King David calling out across the centuries, How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? I had to learn the Psalms at school, Pamela Chumcha said, sitting on the floor, her head leaning against the sofa bed, her eyes shut tight. By the river of Babylon, where we sat down, oh, oh, we wept. She stopped the tape, leant back again, began to recite. If I forget thee, O oh Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. Yea, if I prefer not Jerusalem in my mirth. Later, asleep in bed, she dreamt of her convent school, of matins and evensong, of the chanting of psalms, when Jumpy rushed in and shook her awake, shouting, It's no good! I've got to tell you! He isn't dead! Saladin! He's bloody well alive! 
She came wide awake at once, plunging her hands into her thick, curly, headed hair, in which the first strands of white were just beginning to be noticeable. She knelt on the bed, naked, with her hands in her hair, unable to move, until Jumpy had finished speaking, and then, without warning, she began to hit out at him, punching him on the chest and arms and shoulders, and even his face, as hard as she could hit. He sat down on the bed beside her, looking ridiculous in her frilly dressing-gown, while she beat him. He allowed his body to go loose, to receive the blows, to submit. When she ran out of punches, her body was covered in perspiration, and he thought she might have broken one of his arms. She sat down beside him, panting, and they were silent. Her dog entered the bedroom, looking worried, and padded over to offer her his paw and to lick at her left leg. Jumpy stirred cautiously. "'I thought he got stolen,' he said eventually. Pamela jerked her head for, "'Yes, but... "'The thieves got in touch. "'I paid the ransom. "'He now answers to the name of Glenn. "'That's okay. "'I could never pronounce Sher Khan properly anyway.' After a while, Jumpy found that he wanted to talk. "'What you did just now?' he began. Oh, God! No, it's like a thing I once did, maybe the most sensible thing I ever did. In the summer of 1967, he had bullied the apolitical twenty-year-old Saladin along on an anti-war demonstration. Once in your life, Mr. Snoot, I'm going to drag you down to my level. Harold Wilson was coming to town, and because of the Labour government's support of U.S. involvement in Vietnam, a mass protest had been planned. Chumcha went along. Out of curiosity, he said. I want to see how allegedly intelligent people turn themselves into a mob. That day it rained an ocean. The demonstrators in Market Square were soaked through. Jumpy and Chumcha, swept along by the crowd, found themselves pushed up against the steps of the town hall. A grandstand view, Chumcha said with heavy irony. Next to them stood two students disguised as Russian assassins in black fedoras, greatcoats and dark glasses, carrying shoeboxes filled with ink-dipped tomatoes and labelled in large block letters, BOMBS. Shortly before the Prime Minister's arrival, one of them tapped a policeman on the shoulder and said, "'Excuse, please. When Mr. Wilson, self-styled Prime Minister, comes in long car, kindly request to wind down window so my friend can throw with him the bombs. The policeman answered, Ho, ho, sir, very good. Now I'll tell you what, you can throw eggs at him, sir, because that's all right with me, and you can throw tomatoes at him, sir, like what you've got there in that box, painted black, labelled bombs, because that's all right with me. You throw anything hard at him, sir, and my mate here'll get you with his gun. Oh, days of innocence when the world was young. When the car arrived, there was a surge in the crowd, and Chumcha and Jumpy were separated. Then Jumpy appeared, climbed onto the bonnet of Harold Wilson's limousine, and began to jump up and down on the bonnet, creating large dents, leaping like a wild man to the rhythm of the crowd's chanting— we shall fight! We shall win! Long live Ho Chi Minh! Saladin started yelling at me to get off, partly because the crowd was full of special branch types converging on the limo, but mainly because he was so damn embarrassed. But he kept leaping, up higher and down harder, drenched to the bone, long hair flying. Jumpy the jumper, leaping into the mythology of those antique years. And Wilson and Marcia cowered in the back seat, Ho, ho, Ho Chi Minh! At the last possible moment, Jumpy took a deep breath and dived headfirst into a sea of wet and friendly faces, and vanished. They never caught him. Fuzz, pigs, filth. Saladin wouldn't speak to me for over a week, Jumpy remembered, and when he did, all he said was, I hope you realize those cops could have shot you to pieces, but they didn't. They were still sitting side by side on the edge of the bed. Jumpy touched Pamela on the forearm. I just mean, I know how it feels. Wham, bam. It felt incredible. It felt necessary. Oh, my God, she said, turning to him. 
Oh, my God, I'm sorry. But yes, it did. In the morning, it took an hour to get through to the airline on account of the volume of calls still being generated by the catastrophe, and then another twenty-five minutes of insistence. But he telephoned. It was his voice. While at the other end of the phone, a woman's voice, professionally trained to deal with human beings in crisis, understood how she felt and sympathised with her in this awful moment and remained very patient, but clearly didn't believe a word she said. I'm sorry, madam. I don't mean to be brutal, but the plane broke up in mid-air at 30,000 feet. By the end of the call, Pamela Chumcha, normally the most controlled of women, who locked herself in a bathroom when she wanted to cry, was shrieking down the line, For God's sake, woman, will you shut up with your little good Samaritan speeches and listen to what I'm saying? Finally, she slammed down the receiver and rounded on Jumpy Joshi, who saw the expression in her eyes and spilt the coffee he had been bringing her because his limbs began to tremble in fright. You fucking creep, she cursed him. Still alive, is he? I suppose he flew down from the sky on fucking wings and headed straight for the nearest phone booth to change out of his fucking Superman costume and ring the little wife. They were in the kitchen, and Jumpy noticed a group of kitchen knives attached to a magnetic strip on the wall next to Pamela's left arm. He opened his mouth to speak, but she wouldn't let him. Get out before I do something, she said. I can't believe I fell for it. You and voices on the phone. I should have fucking known. In the early 1970s, Jumpy had run a travelling disco out of the back of his yellow minivan. He called it Finn's Thumb, in honour of the legendary sleeping giant of Ireland, Finn McCool, another sucker, as Chumcha used to say. One day Saladin had played a practical joke on Jumpy by ringing him up putting on a vaguely Mediterranean accent and requesting the services of the musical thumb on the island of Scorpios on behalf of Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, offering a fee of $10,000 and transportation to Greece in a private aircraft for up to six persons. This was a terrible thing to do to a man as innocent and upright as Jamshed Joshi. I need an hour to think, he had said, and then fallen into an agony of the soul. When Saladin rang back an hour later and heard that Jumpy was turning down Mrs. Anassis's offer for political reasons, he understood that his friend was in trading to be a saint, and it was no good trying to pull his leg. Mrs. Ornassis will be broken in the heart for sure, he had concluded, and Jumpy had worriedly replied, Please tell her it's nothing personal. As a matter of fact, personally, I admire her a great deal. We have all known one another too long, Pamela thought as Jumpy left. We can hurt each other with memories two decades old. On the subject of mistakes with voices, she thought as she drove much too fast down the M4 that afternoon in the old MG hardtop from which she got a degree of pleasure that was, as she had always cheerfully confessed, quite ideologically unsound. On that subject, I really ought to be more charitable. Pamela Chumcha, nay Lovelace, was the possessor of a voice for which, in many ways, the rest of her life had been an effort to compensate. It was a voice composed of tweeds, headscarves, summer pudding, hockey sticks, thatched houses, saddle soap, house parties, nuns, family pews, large dogs, and philistinism and in spite of all her attempts to reduce its volume, it was loud as a dinner-jacketed drunk throwing bread rolls in a club. It had been the tragedy of her younger days that, thanks to this voice, she had been endlessly pursued by the gentlemen farmers and Deb's delights and somethings in the city whom she despised with all her heart, while the greenies and peace marchers and world changers with whom she instinctively felt at home treated her with deep suspicion bordering on resentment. How could one be on the side of the angels when one sounded like a no-goodnik every time one moved one's lips? Accelerating past Reading, Pamela gritted her teeth. One of the reasons she had decided to, admit it, end her marriage before fate did it for her, was that she had woken up one day 
and realized that Chumcha was not in love with her at all, but with that voice, stinking of Yorkshire pudding and hearts of oak, that hearty, rubicund voice of ye olde dream England, which he so desperately wanted to inhabit. It had been a marriage of crossed purposes, each of them rushing towards the very thing from which the other was in flight. No survivors. And in the middle of the night, Jumpy the idiot and his stupid false alarm. She was so shaken up by it that she hadn't even got round to being shaken up by having gone to bed with Jumpy and made love in what, admit it, had been a pretty satisfying fashion. Spare me your nonchalance, she rebuked herself. When did you last have so much fun? She had a lot to deal with, and so here she was, dealing with it by running away as fast as she could go. A few days of pampering oneself in an expensive country hotel, and the world may begin to seem less like a fucking hellhole. Therapy by luxury. Okay, okay, she allowed, I know. I'm reverting to class. Fuck it, watch me go. If you've got any objections, blow them out of your ass. 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 One hundred miles an hour past Swindon, and the weather turned nasty. Sudden dark clouds, lightning, heavy rain. She kept her foot on the accelerator. No survivors. People were always dying on her, leaving her with a mouth full of words and nobody to spit them at. Her father, the classical scholar who could make puns in ancient Greek and from whom she inherited the voice, her legacy and curse, and her mother, who pined for him during the war when he was a pathfinder pilot, obliged to fly home from Germany 111 times in a slow aeroplane through a night which his own flares had just illuminated for the benefit of the bombers, and who vowed, when he returned, with the noise of the akak in his ears, that she would never leave him, and so followed him everywhere into the slow hollow of depression from which he never really emerged, and into debt, because he didn't have the face for poker, and used her money when he ran out of his own, and at last to the top of a tall building where they found their way at last. Pamela never forgave them, especially for making it impossible for her to tell them of her unforgiveness. To get her own back, she set about rejecting everything of them that remained within her. Her brains, for example. She refused to go to college, and because she could not shake off her voice, she made it speak ideas which her conservative suicides of parents would have anathematized. She married an Indian, and because he turned out to be too much like them, would have left him, had decided to leave, when once again she was cheated by a death. She was overtaking a frozen food road train, blinded by the spray kicked up by its wheels, when she hit the expanse of water that had been waiting for her in a slight declivity, and then the MG was aquaplaning at terrifying speed, swerving out of the fast lane and spinning round so that she saw the headlights of the road train staring at her like the eyes of the exterminating angel, Azrael. Curtains, she thought but her car swung and skidded out of the path of the juggernaut, slewing right across all three lanes of the motorway, all of them miraculously empty, and coming to rest with rather less of a thump than one might have expected against the crash barrier at the edge of the hard shoulder, after spinning through a further 180 degrees to face once again into the west, where, with all the corny timing of real life, the sun was breaking up the storm. The fact of being alive compensated for what life did to one. That night, in an oak-panelled dining room decorated with medieval flags, Pamela Chumcha, in her most dazzling gown, ate venison and drank a bottle of Chateau Talbot at a table heavy with silver and crystal, celebrating a new beginning, an escape from the jaws of, a fresh start. To be born again, first you have to... Well, almost anyway... Under the lascivious eyes of Americans and salesmen, she ate and drank alone, retiring early to a princess's bedroom in a stone tower to take a long bath and watch old movies on television. In the aftermath of her brush with death, she felt the past dropping away from her. Her adolescence, for example, in the care of her wicked uncle, Harry Hyam, 
who lived in a 17th century manor house once owned by a distant relative, Matthew Hopkins, the Witchfinder General, who had named it Gremlins, in no doubt a macabre attempt at humour. Remembering Mr. Justice Hyam in order to forget him, she murmured to the absent Jumpy that she too had her Vietnam story. After the first big Grosvenor Square demonstration, at which many people threw marbles under the feet of charging police horses, there occurred the one and only instance in British law in which the marble was deemed to be a lethal weapon, and young persons were jailed, even deported, for possessing the small glass spheres. The presiding judge in the case of the Grosvenor marbles was this same Henry, thereafter known as Hangham Hyam, and to be his niece had been a further burden for a young woman already weighed down by her right-wing voice. Now, warm in bed in her temporary castle, Pamela Chumcher rid herself of this old demon. Goodbye, Hangham, I've no more time for you, and of her parents' ghosts, and prepared to be free of the most recent ghost of all. Sipping cognac, Pamela watched vampires on TV and allowed herself to take pleasure in, well, in herself. Had she not invented herself in her own image? I am that I am, she toasted herself in Napoleon brandy. I work in a community relations council in the borough of Brickhall, London, any one. Deputy community relations officer, and damn good at it, if I say so myself. Cheers. We just elected our first black chair, and all the votes cast against him were white. Down the hatch. Last week, a respected Asian street trader, for whom MPs of all parties had interceded, was deported after 18 years in Britain, because 15 years ago he posted a certain form 48 hours late. Chin chin. Next week, in Brick Hall Magistrates Court, the police will be trying to fit up a 50-year-old Nigerian woman, accusing her of assault, having previously beaten her senseless. Skull. This is my head. See it? What I call my job. Bashing my head against Brick Hall. Saladin was dead, and she was alive. She drank to that. There were things I was waiting to tell you, Saladin. Some big things about the new high-rise office building in Brickhall High Street, across from McDonald's. They built it to be perfectly soundproof, but the workers were so disturbed by the silence that now they play tapes of white noise on the tannoy system. You'd have liked that, eh? And about this Parsi woman I know, Babsy, that's her name. She lived in Germany for a while and fell in love with a Turk. The trouble was, the only language they had in common was German. Now Babsy has forgotten almost all she knew, while his gets better and better. He writes her increasingly poetic letters, and she can hardly reply in nursery rhyme. Love dying because of an inequality of language. What do you think of that? Love dying. There's a subject for us, eh, Saladin? What do you say? And a couple of tiny little things. There's a killer on the loose in my patch, specialises in killing old women, so don't worry, I'm safe, plenty older than me. One more thing. I'm leaving you. It's over. We're through. I could never say anything to you, not really, not the least thing. If I said you were putting on weight, you'd yell for an hour, as if it would change what you saw in the mirror, what the tightness of your own trousers was telling you. You interrupted me in public. People noticed it, what you thought of me. I forgave you, that was my fault. I could see the centre of you, that question so frightful that you had to protect it with all that posturing certainty, that empty space. Goodbye, Saladin. She drained her glass and set it down beside her. The returning rain knocked at her leaded windows. She drew her curtains shut and turned out the light. Lying there, drifting towards sleep, she thought of the last thing she needed to tell her late husband. In bed, the words came, you never seemed interested in me, not in my pleasure, what I needed, not really ever. I came to think you wanted not a lover, a servant. There, now rest in peace. She dreamt of him, his face filling the dream. 
Things are ending, he told her. This civilization, things are closing in on it. It has been quite a culture, brilliant and foul, cannibal and Christian, the glory of the world. We should celebrate it while we can, until night falls. She didn't agree, not even in the dream, but she knew, as she dreamed, that there was no point telling him now. After Pamela Chumcha threw him out, Jumpy Joshi went over to Mr. Sufyan's Shanda Café in Brickhall High Street and sat there trying to decide if he was a fool. It was early in the day, so the place was almost empty, apart from a fat lady buying a box of pista barfi and jalebis, a couple of bachelor garment workers drinking chalu chai, and an elderly Polish woman from the old days, when it was the Jews who ran the sweatshops round here, who sat all day in a corner with two vegetable samosas, one puri, and a glass of milk, announcing to everyone who came in that she was only there because... It was next best to kosher, and today you must do the best you can. Jumpy sat down with his coffee beneath the lurid painting of a bare-breasted mythwoman with several heads and wisps of clouds obscuring her nipples, done life-size in salmon pink, neon green and gold. And because the rush hadn't started yet, Mr. Sufyan noticed he was down in the dumps. Hey, Saint Jumpy, he sang out, why are you bringing your bad weather into my place? This country isn't full enough of clouds. Jumpy blushed as Sufyan bounced over to him, his little white cap of devotion pinned in place as usual. The moustacheless beard hennaed red after its owner's recent pilgrimage to Mecca. Mohammed Sufyan was a burly, thick forearmed fellow with a belly on him, as godly and as unfanatic a believer as you could meet and Joshi thought of him as a sort of elder relative. "'Listen, uncle,' he said, when the café proprietor was standing over him. "'You think I'm a real idiot, or what?' "'You ever make any money?' Sufyan asked. "'Not me, uncle. Ever do any business, import-export, off-license, corner shop?' "'I never understood figures. "'And where your family members are?' "'I've got no family, uncle. There's only me.' Then you must be praying to God continually for guidance in your loneliness? You know me, uncle. I don't pray. No question about it, Sufyan concluded. You're an even bigger fool than you know. Thanks, uncle, Jumpy said, finishing his coffee. You've been a great help. Sufyan, knowing that the affection in his teasing was cheering the other man up in spite of his long face, called across to the light-skinned, blue-eyed Asian man who had just come in wearing a snappy check overcoat with extra-wide lapels. "'You, Hanif Johnson!' he called out. "'Come here and solve a mystery!' Johnson, a smart lawyer and local boy made good, who maintained an office above the Shandar Café, tore himself away from Sufyan's two beautiful daughters and headed over to jump his table. "'You explain this fellow,' Sufyan said. "'Beats me!' "'Doesn't drink? Thinks of money like a disease? "'Owns maybe two shirts and no VCR? Forty years old and isn't married? "'Works for two pice in the sports centre "'teaching martial arts and what all? "'Lives on air? Behaves like a rishi or peer, "'but doesn't have any faith? "'Going nowhere, but looks like he knows some secret? "'All this and a college education. "'You work it out.' "'Hanif Johnson punched Jumpy on the shoulder.' He hears voices, he said. Sufyan threw up his hands in mock amazement. Voices? Oop, Baba! Voices from where? Telephone? Sky? Sony Walkman hidden in his coat? Inner voices, Hanif said solemnly. Upstairs on his desk, there's a piece of paper with some verses written on it. And a title, The River of Blood. Jumpy jumped, knocking over his empty cup. I'll kill you! he shouted at Hanif, who skipped quickly across the room, singing out, We got a poet in our midst, Sufyan Sab. Treat with respect, handle with care. He said a street is a river, and we are the flow. Humanity is a river of blood. That's the poet's point. Also the individual human being. He broke off to run around to the far side of an eight-seater table as Jumpy came after him, blushing furiously, flapping his arms. In our very bodies does the river of blood not flow? Like the Roman, the ferrety Enoch Powell had said, 
I seem to see the river Tiber foaming with much blood. Reclaim the metaphor, Jumpy Joshi had told himself. Turn it. Make it a thing we can use. This is like rape, he pleaded with Hanif. For God's sake, stop. Voices that one hears are outside, but, the cafe proprietor was musing, Joan of Arc, na? Or that what's-his-name with the cat, turn again Whittington. But with such voices one becomes great or rich at least. This one, however, is not great and poor. Enough, Jumpy held both arms above his head, grinning without really wanting to. I surrender. For three days after that, in spite of all the efforts of Mr. Sufyan, Mrs. Sufyan, their daughters Michal and Anahita, and the lawyer Hanif Johnson, Jumpy Joshi was not really himself. More a dumpy than a jumpy, as Sufyan said. He went about his business at the youth clubs, at the offices of the film cooperative to which he belonged, and in the streets, distributing leaflets, selling certain newspapers, hanging out. But his step was heavy as he went his way. Then, on the fourth evening, the telephone rang behind the counter of the Shanda Café. Mr. Jamshed Joshi, Anahita Sufyan carolled, doing her imitation of an upper-class English accent. Will Mr. Joshi please come to the instrument? There is a personal call. Her father took one look at the joy bursting out on Jumpy's face and murmured softly to his wife, Mrs., the voice this boy is wanting to hear is not inner by any manner of means. The impossible thing came between Pamela and Jamshid after they had spent seven days making love to one another with inexhaustible enthusiasm, infinite tenderness, and such freshness of spirit that you'd have thought the procedure had only just been invented. For seven days they remained undressed, with the central heating turned high, and pretended to be tropical lovers in some hot, bright country to the south. Jamshid, who had always been clumsy with women, told Pamela that he had not felt so wonderful since the day in his eighteenth year when he had finally learned how to ride a bicycle. The moment the words were out, he became afraid that he had spoilt everything, that this comparison of the great love of his life to the rickety bike of his student days would be taken for the insult it undeniably was. But he needn't have worried, because Pamela kissed him on the mouth and thanked him for saying the most beautiful thing any man had ever said to any woman. At this point he understood that he could do no wrong, and for the first time in his life he began to feel genuinely safe, safe as houses, safe as a human being who is loved. And so did Pamela Chumcha. On the seventh night they were awakened from dreamless sleep by the unmistakable sound of somebody trying to break into the house. I've got a hockey stick under my bed, Pamela whispered, terrified. Give it to me, Jumpy, who was equally scared, hissed back. I'm coming with you, quaked Pamela, and Jumpy quavered. Oh, no, you don't. In the end, they both crept downstairs, each wearing one of Pamela's frilly dressing gowns, each with a hand on the hockey stick that neither felt brave enough to use. Suppose it's a man with a shotgun, Pamela found herself thinking a man with a shotgun saying, Go back upstairs. They reached the foot of the stairs. Somebody turned on the lights. Pamela and Jumpy screamed in unison, dropped the hockey stick, and ran upstairs as fast as they could go, while down in the front hall, standing brightly illuminated by the front door, with the glass panel it had smashed in order to turn the knob of the tongue-and-groove lock, Pamela, in the throes of her passion, had forgotten to use the security locks, was a figure out of a nightmare or a late-night TV movie, a figure covered in mud and ice and blood, the hairiest creature you ever saw, with the shanks and hooves of a giant goat, a man's torso covered in goat's hair, human arms, and a horned but otherwise human head covered in muck and grime, and the beginnings of a beard. Alone and unobserved, the impossible thing pitched forward onto the floor and lay still. Upstairs at the very top of the house, that is to say in Saladin's den, 
Mrs. Pamela Chumcher was writhing in her lover's arms, crying her heart out, and bawling at the top of her voice, "'It isn't true! My husband exploded! No survivors, do you hear me? I am the widow Chumcher, whose spouse is beastly dead!' Chapter 5 Mr. Jibriel Farishta on the railway train to London was once again seized, as who would not be, by the fear that God had decided to punish him for his loss of faith by driving him insane. He had seated himself by the window in a first-class non-smoking compartment with his back to the engine, because unfortunately another fellow was already in the other place, and jamming his trilby down on his head, he sat with his fists deep in scarlet-lined gabardine and panicked. The terror of losing his mind to a paradox, of being unmade by what he no longer believed existed, of turning in his madness into the avatar of a chimerical archangel, was so big in him that it was impossible to look at it for long. Yet how else was he to account for the miracles, metamorphoses, and apparitions of recent days. It's a straight choice, he trembled silently. It's A, I'm off my head, or B, Baba, somebody went and changed the rules. Now, however, there was the comforting cocoon of this railway compartment in which the miraculous was reassuringly absent. The armrests were frayed, the reading light over his shoulder didn't work, the mirror was missing from its frame, and then there were the regulations— the little circular red and white signs forbidding smoking, the stickers penalising the improper use of the chain, the arrows indicating the points to which, and not beyond, it was permitted to open the little sliding windows. Gibriel paid a visit to the toilet, and here too a small series of prohibitions and instructions gladdened his heart. By the time the conductor arrived with the authority of his crescent-cutting ticket punch, Jibril had been somewhat soothed by these manifestations of law, and began to perk up and invent rationalizations. He had had a lucky escape from death, a subsequent delirium of some sort, and now, restored to himself, could expect the threads of his old life, that is, his old new life, the new life he had planned before the, uh, interruption, to be picked up again. As the train carried him further and further away from the twilight zone of his arrival and subsequent mysterious captivity, bearing him along the happy predictability of parallel metal lines, he felt the pull of the great city beginning to work its magic on him, and his old gift of hope reasserted itself, his talent for embracing renewal, for blinding himself to past hardships so that the future could come into view. He sprang up from his seat and thumped down on the opposite side of the compartment with his face symbolically towards London, even though it meant giving up the window. What did he care for windows? All the London he wanted was right there in his mind's eye. He spoke her name aloud. Alleluia! Alleluia, brother! The compartment's only other occupant affirmed. Hosanna, my good sir, and amen! Although I must add, sir, that my beliefs are strictly non-denominational, the stranger continued, had you said La Ilaha, I would gladly have responded with a full-throated Il Allah. Jibril realized that his move across the compartment and his inadvertent taking of Ali's unusual name had been mistaken by his companion for overtures both social and theological. "'John Maslama!' the fellow cried, snapping a card out of a little crocodile-skin case and pressing it upon Jibril. "'Personally, I follow my own variant of the universal faith invented by the Emperor Akbar. God, I would say, is something akin to the music of the spheres.' It was plain that Mr. Maslama was bursting with words, and that now that he had popped, there was nothing for it but to sit it out— to permit the torrent to run its orotund course. As the fellow had the build of a prize-fighter, it seemed inadvisable to irritate him. In his eyes, Farishta spotted the glint of the true believer, a light which, until recently, he had seen in his own shaving-mirror every day. "'I have done well for myself, sir,' Maslama was boasting in his well-modulated Oxford drawl, 
for a brown man exceptionally well, considering the quiddity of the circumstances in which we live, as I hope you will allow. With a small but eloquent sweep of his thick ham of a hand, he indicated the opulence of his attire, the bespoke tailoring of his three-piece pinstripe, the gold watch with its fob and chain, the Italian shoes, the crested silk tie, the jewelled links at his starched white cuffs. Above this costume of an English milord there stood a head of startling size, covered with thick, slick-down hair and sprouting implausibly luxuriant eyebrows beneath which blazed the ferocious eyes of which Gibril had already taken careful note. "'Pretty fancy,' Gibril now conceded, some response being clearly required. Maslama nodded. "'I have always tended,' he admitted, uh, "'towards uh, the ornate.' He had made what he called his first pile, producing advertising jingles. That old devil music, leading women into lingerie and lip gloss and men into temptation. Now he owned record stores all over town, a successful nightclub called Hot Wax, and a store full of gleaming musical instruments that was his special pride and joy. He was an Indian from Guyana, but there's nothing left in that place, sir. People are leaving it faster than planes can fly. He had made good in quick time. By the grace of God Almighty, I'm a regular Sunday man, sir. I confess to a weakness for the English hymnal, and I sing to raise the roof. The autobiography was concluded with a brief mention of the existence of a wife and some dozen children. Gibriel offered his congratulations and hoped for silence. But now Maslama dropped his bombshell. Uh, you don't need to tell me about yourself, he said jovially. Naturally, I know who you are, even if one does not expect to see such a personage on the Eastbourne Victoria line. He winked leeringly and placed a finger alongside his nose. Mum's the word. I respect a man's privacy. No question about it, no question at all. I? Who am I? Gibriel was startled into absurdity. The other nodded weightily, his eyebrows waving like soft antlers. The prize question, in my opinion. These are problematic times, sir, for a moral man. When a man is unsure of his essence, how may he know if he be good or bad? But you are finding me tedious. I answer my own questions by my faith in it, sir. Here Maslama pointed to the ceiling of the railway compartment. And, of course, you are not in the least confused about your identity, for you are the famous, uh, the, may I say, legendary Mr. Jibril Farishta, a star of screen and increasingly, uh, I'm sorry to add, of pirate video. My twelve children, one wife and I, are all long-standing, unreserved admirers of your divine heroics. He grabbed and pumped Jibril's right hand. Tending as I do uh, towards the pantheistic view, Maslama thundered on, my own sympathy for your work arises out of your willingness to portray deities of every conceivable water. You, sir, are a rainbow coalition of the celestial, a walking united nations of gods. You are, in short, the future. Uh, permit me to salute you. He was beginning to give off the unmistakable odour of the genuine crazy and even though he had not yet said or done anything beyond the merely idiosyncratic, Jibril was getting alarmed and measuring the distance to the door with anxious little glances. "'I incline, sir,' Maslama was saying, uh, "'towards the opinion that whatever name one calls it by is no more than a code, a cipher, Mr. Farishta, behind which the true name lies concealed.' Jibril remained silent, and Maslama, making no attempt to hide his disappointment, was obliged to speak for him. "'What is that true name, I hear you inquire?' he said. And then Jibril knew he was right. The man was a full-fledged lunatic, and his autobiography was very likely as much of a concoction as his faith. Fictions were walking around wherever he went, Jibril reflected, fictions masquerading as real human beings. I have brought him upon me, he accused himself. By fearing for my own sanity, I have brought forth from God knows what dark recess this voluble and maybe dangerous nut. 
Uh, you don't know it, Maslama yelled suddenly, jumping to his feet. Charlatan, a poser, fake, you claim to be the screen immortal, avatar of a hundred and one gods, and you haven't a foggy. How is it possible that I, a poor boy made good from Bartika on the Eskibo, can know such things, while Jibril Farishta does not? A phony, fooey to you. Jibril got to his feet, but the other was filling almost all the available standing room, and he, Jibril, had to lean over awkwardly to one side to escape Maslama's windmilling arms, one of which knocked off his grey trilby. At once Maslama's mouth fell open. He seemed to shrink several inches, and after a few frozen moments he fell to his knees with a thud. "'What's he doing down there?' Jibril wondered. "'Picking up my hat?' but the madman was begging for forgiveness. "'I never doubted you would come,' he was saying. Uh, "'Pardon my clumsy rage.' The train entered a tunnel, and Jibriel saw that they were surrounded by a warm, golden light that was coming from a point just behind his head. In the glass of the sliding door, he saw the reflection of the halo around his hair. Maslama was struggling with his shoelaces. All my life, sir, I knew I had been chosen, he was saying in a voice as humble as it had earlier been menacing. Even as a child in Bartica, I knew. He pulled off his right shoe and began to roll down his sock. I was given, he said, a sign. The sock was removed, revealing what looked to be a perfectly ordinary, if outsize, foot. Then... Jibril counted and counted again, from one to six. "'The same on the other foot,' Maslama said proudly. "'I never doubted the meaning for a minute.' He was the self-appointed helpmate of the Lord, the sixth toe on the foot of the universal thing. "'Something was badly amiss with the spiritual life of the planet,' thought Jibril Farishta. "'Too many demons inside people claiming to believe in God.' The train emerged from the tunnel. Jibril took a decision. Stand, six to John, he intoned in his best Hindi movie manner. Maslama, arise. The other scrambled to his feet and stood pulling at his fingers, his head bowed. What I want to know, sir, he mumbled, is which is it to be, annihilation or salvation? Why have you returned? Jibril thought rapidly. It is for judging, he finally answered. Facts in the case must be sifted. Due weight given pro and contra. Here it is the human race that is the under trial, and it is a defendant with a rotten record, a history sheeter, a bad egg. Careful evaluations must be made. For the present, verdict is reserved, will be promulgated in due course. In the meantime, my presence must remain a secret, for vital security reasons. He put his hat back on his head, feeling pleased with himself. Maslama was nodding furiously. You can depend on me, he promised. I am a man who respects a person's privacy. Mum, for the second time, is the word. Jibril fled the compartment with the lunatic's hymns in hot pursuit. As he rushed to the far end of the train, Maslama's peans remained faintly audible behind him. Alleluia! Alleluia! Apparently his new disciple had launched into selections from Handel's Messiah. However, Jibril wasn't followed, and there was, fortunately, a first-class carriage at the rear of the train, too. This one was of open-plan design, with comfortable orange seats arranged in fours around tables and Jibriel settled down by a window, staring towards London, with his chest thumping and his hat jammed down on his head. He was trying to come to terms with the undeniable fact of the halo, and failing to do so, because what with the derangement of John Maslama behind him and the excitement of Alleluia Cone ahead, it was hard to get his thoughts straight. Then, to his despair, Mrs. Rekha Merchant floated up alongside his window, sitting on her flying Bukhara, evidently impervious to the snowstorm that was building up out there and making England look like a television set after the day's programme's end. She gave him a little wave, 
and he felt hope ebbing from him. Retribution on a levitating rug. He closed his eyes and concentrated on trying not to shake. I know what a ghost is, Ali Cohn said to a classroom of teenage girls whose faces were illuminated by the soft inner light of worship. In the high Himalayas, it is often the case that climbers find themselves being accompanied by the ghosts of those who failed in the attempt, or the sadder but also prouder ghosts of those who succeeded in reaching the summit only to perish on the way down. Outside, in the fields, the snow was settling on the high, bare trees and on the flat expanse of the park. Between the low, dark snow clouds and the white, carpeted city, the light was a dirty yellow colour, a narrow, foggy light that dulled the heart and made it impossible to dream. Up there, Ali remembered, up there, at eight thousand metres, the light was of such clarity that it seemed to resonate, to sing, like music. Here, on the flat earth, the light, too, was flat and earthbound. Here nothing flew, the sedge was withered, and no birds sang. Soon it would be dark. Miss Cone, the girl's hands waving in the air, drew her back into the classroom. Ghosts, miss, straight up. You're pulling our legs, right? Skepticism wrestled with adoration in their faces. She knew the question they really wanted to ask, and probably would not, the question of the miracle of her skin. She had heard them whispering excitedly as she entered the classroom. It's true. Look, how pale. It's incredible. Alleluia Cone, whose iciness could resist the heat of the eight-thousand-metre sun. Ali the Snow Maiden, the Ice Queen. Miss, how come you never get a tan? When she went up Everest with the triumphant Collingwood expedition, the papers called them Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Though she was no Disneyish cutie, her full lips pale rather than rose red, her hair ice blonde instead of black, her eyes not innocently wide but narrowed out of habit against the high snow glare. A memory of Jibril Farishta welled up, catching her unawares. Jibril, at some point during their three and a half days, booming with his usual foot in mouth lack of restraint. Baby, you're no iceberg, whatever they say. You're a passionate lady, Bibi, hot like a kachori. He had pretended to blow on scalded fingertips and shook his hand for emphasis. Oh, too hot! Oh, throw water! Jibril Farishta. She controlled herself. Hi ho, it's off to work. Ghosts, she repeated firmly. On the Everest climb, after I came through the icefall, I saw a man sitting on an outcrop in the lotus position, with his eyes shut and a tartan tam o shanter on his head, chanting the old mantra, Om Mani Padmeham. She had guessed at once from his archaic clothing and surprising behaviour that this was the spectre of Morris Wilson, the yogi who had prepared for a solo ascent of Everest back in 1934 by starving himself for three weeks in order to cement so deep a union between his body and soul that the mountain would be too weak to tear them apart. He had gone up in a light aircraft as high as it would take him, crash-landed deliberately in a snowfield, headed upwards, and never returned. Wilson opened his eyes as Ali approached, and nodded lightly in greeting. He strolled beside her for the rest of that day, or hung in the air while she worked her way up a face. Once he belly-flopped into the snow of a sharp incline, and glided upwards as if he were riding on an invisible anti-gravity toboggan. Ali had found herself behaving quite naturally, as if she'd just bumped into an old acquaintance, for reasons afterwards obscure to her. Wilson chattered on a fair bit. Don't get a lot of company these days, one way or another, and expressed, among other things, his deep irritation at having had his body discovered by the Chinese expedition of 1960. Little yellow buggers actually had the gall, the sheer face, to film my corpse. Hallelujah Cone was struck by the bright yellow and black tartan of his immaculate knickerbockers. All this she told the girls at Brickhall Fields Girls' School, 
who had written so many letters pleading for her to address them that she had not been able to refuse. "'You've got to,' they pleaded in writing. "'You even live here.' From the window of the classroom she could see her flat across the park, just visible through the thickening fall of snow. What she did not tell the class was this. As Morris Wilson's ghost described, in patient detail, his own ascent, and also his posthumous discoveries, for example the slow, circuitous, infinitely delicate, and invariably unproductive mating ritual of the Yeti, which he had witnessed recently on the South Col, so it occurred to her that her vision of the eccentric of 1934, the first human being ever to attempt to scale Everest on his own, a sort of abominable snowman himself, had been no accident but a kind of signpost, a declaration of kinship. A prophecy of the future, perhaps, for it was at that moment that her secret dream was born, the impossible thing, the dream of the unaccompanied climb. It was possible also that Morris Wilson was the angel of her death. I wanted to talk about ghosts, she was saying, because most mountaineers, when they come down from the peaks, grow embarrassed and leave these stories out of their accounts. But they do exist, I have to admit it, even though I'm the type who's always kept her feet on solid ground. That was a laugh. Her feet. Even before the ascent of Everest, she had begun to suffer from shooting pains and was informed by her general practitioner, a no-nonsense Bombay woman called Dr. Mystery, that she was suffering from fallen arches. In common parlance, flat feet. Her arches, always weak, had been further weakened by years of wearing sneakers and other unsuitable shoes. Dr. Mystery couldn't recommend much. Toe-clenching exercises, running upstairs barefoot, sensible footwear. "'You're young enough,' she said. "'If you take care, you'll live. "'If not, you'll be a cripple at forty. When Gibriel, damn it, heard that she had climbed Everest with spears in her feet, he took to calling her his Silky. He had read a bumper book of fairy tales in which he found the story of the sea woman who left the ocean and took on human form for the sake of the man she loved. She had feet instead of fins, but every step she took was an agony, as if she were walking over broken glass. Yet she went on walking, forward, away from the sea, and over land. "'You did it for a bloody mountain,' he said. "'Would you do it for a man?' She had concealed her footache from her fellow mountaineers, because the lure of Everest had been so overwhelming. But these days the pain was still there, and growing, if anything, worse. Chance, a congenital weakness, was proving to be her footbinder. Adventure's end, Ali thought, betrayed by my feet. The image of footbinding stayed with her. Goddamn Chinese, she mused, echoing Wilson's ghost. Life is so easy for some people, she had wept into Gibriel Farishta's arms. Why don't their blasted feet give out? He had kissed her forehead. For you, it may always be a struggle, he said. You want it too damn much. The class was waiting for her, growing impatient with all this talk of phantoms. They wanted the story, her story. They wanted to stand on the mountain top. Do you know how it feels, she wanted to ask them, to have the whole of your life concentrated into one moment, a few hours long? Do you know what it's like when the only direction is down? I was in the second pair with Sherpa Pember, she said. The weather was perfect, perfect. So clear you felt you could look right through the sky into whatever lay beyond. The first pair must have reached the summit by now, I said to Pemba. Conditions are holding and we can go. Pemba grew very serious, quite a change, because he was one of the expedition clowns. He had never been to the summit before either. At that stage I had no plans to go without oxygen. But when I saw that Pemba intended it, I thought, OK, me too. It was a stupid whim, unprofessional really, but I suddenly wanted to be a woman sitting on top of that bastard mountain, a human being, not a breathing machine. Pemba said, Ali Bibi, don't do. But I just started up. In a while we passed the others coming down, and I could see the wonderful thing in their eyes. They were so high, 
possessed of such an exaltation that they didn't even notice I wasn't wearing the oxygen equipment. Be careful, they shouted over to us. Look out for the angels. Pember had fallen into a good breathing pattern, and I fell into step with it, breathing in with his in, out with his out. I could feel something lifting off the top of my head, and I was grinning, just grinning from ear to ear, and when Pember looked my way, I could see he was doing the same. It looked like a grimace, like pain, but it was just foolish joy. She was a woman who had been brought to transcendence, to the miracles of the soul, by the hard physical labour of hauling herself up an ice-bound height of rock. At that moment, she told the girls, who were climbing beside her every step of the way, I believed it all, that the universe has a sound, that you can lift a veil and see the face of God, everything. I saw the Himalayas stretching below me, and that was God's face too. Pember must have seen something in my expression that bothered him, because he called across, Look out, Ali Bibi, the height! I recall sort of floating over the last overhang and up to the top, and then we were there, with the ground falling away on every side. Such light! The universe purified into light. I wanted to tear off my clothes and let it soak into my skin. Not a titter from the class. They were dancing naked with her on the roof of the world. Then the visions began, the rainbows looping and dancing in the sky, the radiance pouring down like a waterfall from the sun. And there were angels, the others hadn't been joking. I saw them, and so did Sherpa Pemba. We were on our knees by then. His pupils looked pure white, and so did mine, I'm sure. We would probably have died there, I'm sure, snow-blind and mountain-foolish. But then I heard a noise, a loud, sharp report, like a gun. That snapped me out of it. I had to yell at Pem until he too shook himself and we started down. The weather was changing rapidly. A blizzard was on the way. The air was heavy now, heaviness instead of that light, that lightness. We just made it to the meeting point, and the four of us piled into the little tent at Camp Six, twenty-seven thousand feet. You don't talk much up there. We all had our Everests to reclimb over and over all night. But at some point I asked, What was that noise? Did anyone fire a gun? They looked at me as if I was touched. Who'd do such a damn fool thing at this altitude, they said. And anyway, Ali, you know damn well there isn't a gun anywhere on the mountain. They were right, of course. But I heard it, I know that much, wham, bam, shot and echo. That's it. She ended abruptly. The end. Story of my life. She picked up a silver-headed cane and prepared to depart. The teacher, Mrs. Berry, came forward to utter the usual platitudes. But the girls were not to be denied. So what was it then, Ali? they insisted. And she, looking suddenly ten years older than her thirty-three, shrugged. Can't say, she told them. Maybe it was Morris Wilson's ghost. She left the classroom, leaning heavily on her stick. The city, proper London ya, no bloody less, was dressed in white like a mourner at a funeral. Whose bloody funeral, mister? Gibriel Farishta asked himself wildly. Not mine, I bloody hope and trust. When the train pulled into Victoria Station, he plunged out without waiting for it to come to a complete halt, turned his ankle, and went sprawling beneath the baggage trolleys and sneers of the waiting Londoners, clinging as he fell onto his increasingly battered hat. Rekha Merchant was nowhere to be seen and seizing the moment, Gibriel ran through the scattering crowd like a man possessed, only to find her by the ticket barrier, floating patiently on her carpet, invisible to all eyes but his own, three feet off the ground. "'What do you want?' he burst out. "'What's your business with me?' "'To watch you fall,' she instantly replied. "'Look around,' she added. "'I've already made you look like a pretty big fool.' People were clearing a space around Gibriel, 
the wild man in an outsize overcoat and trampy hat. That man's talking to himself, a child's voice said. And its mother answered, Shh, dear, it's wicked to mock the afflicted. Welcome to London. Jibriel Farishta rushed towards the stairs, leading down towards the tube. Rekha on her carpet let him go. But when he arrived in a great rush at the northbound platform of the Victoria Line, he saw her again. This time she was a colour photograph in a 48-sheet advertising poster on the wall across the track, advertising the merits of the international direct dialing system. Send your voice on a magic carpet ride to India, she advised. No gins or lamps required. He gave a loud cry, once again causing his fellow travellers to doubt his sanity, and fled over to the southbound platform where a train was just pulling in. He leapt aboard, and there was Wrecker Merchant facing him with her carpet rolled up and lying across her knees. The doors closed behind him with a bang. That day, Jibriel Farishta fled in every direction around the underground of the City of London, and Wrecker Merchant found him wherever he went. She sat beside him on the endless up escalator at Oxford Circus, and in the tightly packed elevators of Tufnell Park she rubbed up against him from behind in a manner that she would have thought quite outrageous during her lifetime. On the outer reaches of the Metropolitan Line she hurled the phantoms of her children from the tops of claw-like trees, and when he came up for air outside the Bank of England she flung herself histrionically from the apex of its neoclassical pediment. And even though he did not have any idea of the true shape of that most protean and chameleon of cities, he grew convinced that it kept changing shape as he ran around beneath it, so that the stations on the underground changed lines and followed one another in apparently random sequence. More than once he emerged, suffocating from that subterranean world in which the laws of space and time had ceased to operate, and tried to hail a taxi. Not one was willing to stop, however, so he was obliged to plunge back into that hellish maze, that labyrinth without a solution, and continue his epic flight. At last, exhausted beyond hope, he surrendered to the fatal logic of his insanity, and got out arbitrarily, at what he conceded must be the last, meaningless station of his prolonged and futile journey in search of the chimera of renewal. He came out into the heartbreaking indifference of a litter-blown street by a lorry-infested roundabout. Darkness had already fallen as he walked unsteadily, using the last reserves of his optimism, into an unknown park made spectral by the ectoplasmic quality of the tungsten lamps. As he sank to his knees in the isolation of the winter night, he saw the figure of a woman moving slowly towards him across the snow-shrouded grass, and surmised that it must be his nemesis, Wrecker Merchant, coming to deliver her death kiss, to drag him down into a deeper underworld than the one in which he had broken his wounded spirit. He no longer cared, and by the time the woman reached him, he had fallen forward onto his forearms, his coat dangling loosely about him and giving him the look of a large, dying beetle who was wearing, for obscure reasons, a dirty, grey, trilby hat. As if from a great distance, he heard a shocked cry escape the woman's lips, a gasp in which disbelief, joy, and a strange resentment were all mixed up, and just before his senses left him, he understood that Rekha had permitted him for the time being to reach the illusion of a safe haven, so that her triumph over him could be the sweeter when it came at the last. "'You're alive!' the woman said, repeating the first word she had ever spoken to his face. "'You got your life back. That's the point.' Smiling, he fell asleep at Ali's flat feet in the falling snow. 4. Aisha Even the serial visions have migrated now. They know the city better than he, and in the aftermath of Rosa and Rekha, the dream worlds of his archangelic other self begin to seem as tangible as the shifting realities he inhabits while he's awake. This, for instance, has started coming. 
a mansion block built in the Dutch style in a part of London which he will subsequently identify as Kensington, to which the dream flies him at high speed past Barker's department store and the small grey house with double bay windows where Thackeray wrote Vanity Fair, and the square with the convent where the little girls in uniform are always going in but never come out, and the house where Tyron lived in his old age, when, after a thousand and one chameleon changes of allegiance and principle, he took on the outward form of the French ambassador to London, and arrives at a seven-storey corner block with green wrought-iron balconies up to the fourth, and now the dream rushes him up the outer wall of the house, and on the fourth floor it pushes aside the heavy curtains at the living-room window, and finally there he sits, unsleeping as usual, eyes wide in the dim yellow light, staring into the future, the bearded and turbaned imam. Who is he? An exile. Which must not be confused with, allowed to run into, all the other words that people throw around, emigre, expatriate, refugee, immigrant, silence, cunning. Exile is a dream of glorious return. Exile is a vision of revolution. Elba, not St. Helena. It is an endless paradox, looking forward by always looking back. The exile is a ball hurled high into the air. He hangs there, frozen in time, translated into a photograph, denied motion, suspended impossibly above his native earth. He awaits the inevitable moment at which the photograph must begin to move and the earth reclaim its own. These are the things the imam thinks. His home is a rented flat. It is a waiting room, a photograph, air. The thick wallpaper, olive stripes on a cream ground, has faded a little, enough to emphasize the brighter rectangles and ovals that indicate where pictures used to hang. The imam is the enemy of images. When he moved in, the pictures slid noiselessly from the walls and slunk from the room, removing themselves from the rage of his unspoken disapproval. Some representations, however, are permitted to remain. On the mantelpiece, he keeps a small group of postcards bearing conventional images of his homeland, which he calls simply Desh, a mountain looming over a city, a picturesque village scene beneath a mighty tree, a mosque. But in his bedroom, on the wall facing the hard cot where he lies, there hangs a more potent icon, the portrait of a woman of exceptional force, famous for her profile of a Grecian statue and the black hair that is as long as she is high. A powerful woman, his enemy, his other, he keeps her close, just as far away in the palaces of her omnipotence she will be clutching his portrait beneath her royal cloak or hiding it in a locket at her throat. She is the Empress, and her name is, what else? Aisha. On this island, the exiled imam, and at home in Desh, she. They plot each other's deaths. The curtains, thick golden velvet, are kept shut all day, because otherwise the evil thing might creep into the apartment, foreignness. Abroad, the alien nation, the harsh fact that he is here and not there upon which all his thoughts are fixed. On those rare occasions when the imam goes out to take the Kensington air, at the centre of a square formed by eight young men in sunglasses and bulging suits, he folds his hands before him and fixes his gaze upon them, so that no element or particle of this hated city, this sink of iniquities which humiliates him by giving him sanctuary, so that he must be beholden to it in spite of the lustfulness, greed, and vanity of its ways, can lodge itself like a dustbeck in his eyes. When he leaves this loathed exile to return in triumph to that other city beneath the postcard mountain, it will be a point of pride to be able to say that he remained in complete ignorance of the Sodom in which he had been obliged to wait, ignorant and therefore unsullied, unaltered, 
pure. And another reason for the drawn curtains is that, of course, there are eyes and ears around him, not all of them friendly. The orange buildings are not neutral. Somewhere across the street there will be zoom lenses, video equipment, jumbo mics, and always the risk of snipers. Above and below and beside the imam are the safe apartments occupied by his guards, who stroll the Kensington streets disguised as women in shrouds and silvery beaks. But it is as well to be too careful. Paranoia for the exile is a prerequisite of survival. A fable which he heard from one of his favourites, the American convert, formerly a successful singer, now known as Bilal X. In a certain nightclub to which the imam is in the habit of sending his lieutenants to listen in to certain other persons belonging to certain opposed factions, Bilal met a young man from Desh, also a singer of sorts, so they fell to talking. It turned out that this Mahmud was a badly scared individual. He had recently shacked up with a Guri, a long red woman with a big figure, and then it turned out that the previous lover of his beloved Renata was the exiled boss of the Savak torture organization of the Shah of Iran, the number one grand panjandrum himself, not some minor sadist with a talent for extracting toenails or setting fire to eyelids, but the great Haramzada in person. The day after Mahmud and Renata moved into their new apartment, a letter arrived from Mahmud. Okay, shit eater, you're fucking my woman. I just wanted to say hello. The next day, a second letter arrived. By the way, prick, I forgot to mention, here is your new telephone number. At that point, Mahmud and Renata had asked for an ex-directory listing, but had not as yet been given their new number by the telephone company. When it came through two days later, and was exactly the same as the one on the letter, Mahmud's hair fell out all at once. Then, seeing it lying on the pillow, he joined his hands together in front of Renata and begged, Baby, I love you, but you're too hot for me. Please go somewhere, far, far. When the imam was told this story, he shook his head and said, That whore, who will touch her now, in spite of her lust-creating body? She put a stain on herself worse than leprosy. Thus do human beings mutilate themselves. But the true moral of the fable was the need for eternal vigilance. London was a city in which the ex-boss of Savak had great connections in the telephone company, and the Shah's ex-chef ran a thriving restaurant in Hounslow. Such a welcoming city, such a refuge, they take all types. Keep the curtains drawn. Floors three to five of this block of mansion flats are, for the moment, all the homeland the imam possesses. Here there are rifles and shortwave radios and rooms in which the sharp young men in suits sit and speak urgently into several telephones. There is no alcohol here, nor are playing cards or dice anywhere in evidence, and the only woman is the one hanging on the old man's bedroom wall. In this surrogate homeland, which the insomniac saint thinks of as his waiting room or transit lounge, the central heating is at full blast night and day, and the windows are tightly shut. The exile cannot forget, and must therefore simulate, the dry heat of Desh, the once and future land where even the moon is hot and dripping like a fresh buttered chapati. Oh, that longed-for part of the world where the sun and moon are male, but their hot sweet light is named with female names. At night the exile parts his curtains, and the alien moonlight sidles into the room, its coldness striking his eyeballs like a nail. He winces, narrows his eyes, loose-robed, frowning, ominous, awake. This is the imam. Exile is a soulless country. In exile the furniture is ugly, expensive, all bought at the same time in the same store, and in too much of a hurry. Shiny silver sofas with fins like old Buicks, De Sotos, Oldsmobiles, glass-fronted bookcases containing not books but clippings files. 
In exile, the shower goes scalding hot whenever anybody turns on a kitchen tap, so that when the imam goes to bathe, his entire retinue must remember not to fill a kettle or rinse a dirty plate. And when the imam goes to the toilet, his disciples leap scalded from the shower. In exile, no food is ever cooked. The dark-spectacled bodyguards go out for takeaway. In exile, all attempts to put down roots look like treason. They are admissions of defeat. The imam is the center of a wheel. Movement radiates from him around the clock. His son Khalid enters his sanctum bearing a glass of water, holding it in his right hand with his left palm under the glass. The imam drinks water constantly, one glass every five minutes, to keep himself clean. The water itself is cleansed of impurities before he sips in an American filtration machine. All the young men surrounding him are well aware of his famous monograph on water, whose purity, the imam believes, communicates itself to the drinker, its thinness and simplicity, the ascetic pleasures of its taste. The empress, he points out, drinks wine. Burgundies, clarets, hocks mingle their intoxicating corruptions within that body, both fair and foul. The sin is enough to condemn her for all time without hope of redemption. The picture on his bedroom wall shows the Empress Aisha holding in both hands a human skull filled with a dark red fluid. The Empress drinks blood, but the Imam is a waterman. Not for nothing do the peoples of our hot lands offer it reverence, the monograph proclaims. Water, preserver of life, no civilized individual can refuse it to another. A grandmother, be her limbs ever so arthritically stiff, will rise at once and go to the tap if a small child should come to her and ask, Pani, nani? Beware all those who blaspheme against it. Who pollutes it dilutes his soul. The imam has often vented his rage upon the memory of the late Aga Khan as a result of being shown the text of an interview in which the head of the Ishmaelis was observed drinking vintage champagne. Oh, sir, this champagne is only for outward show. The instant it touches my lips, it turns to water. Fiend, the imam is wont to thunder. Apostate, blasphemer, fraud. When the future comes, such individuals will be judged, he tells his men. Water will have its day, and blood will flow like wine. Such is the miraculous nature of the future of exiles. What is first uttered in the impotence of an overheated apartment becomes the fate of nations. Who has not dreamed this dream of being a king for a day? But the imam dreams of more than a day, feels, emanating from his fingertips, the erected strings with which he will control the movement of history. No, not history. His is a stranger dream. His son, water-carrying Khalid, bows before his father like a pilgrim at a shrine, informs him that the guard on duty outside the sanctum is Salman Farsi. Bilal is at the radio transmitter, broadcasting the day's message on the agreed frequency to Desh. The imam is a massive stillness, an immobility. He is living stone. His great gnarled hands, granite-gray, rest heavily on the wings of his high-back chair. His head, looking too large for the body beneath, lolls ponderously on the surprisingly scrawny neck that can be glimpsed through the gray-black wisps of beard. The imam's eyes are clouded. His lips do not move. He is pure force, an elemental being. He moves without motion, acts without doing, speaks without uttering a sound. He is the conjurer, and history is his trick. No, not history. Something stranger. The explanation of this conundrum is to be heard at this very moment on certain surreptitious radio waves on which the voice of the American convert Bilal is singing the imam's holy song, Bilal the Muezzin. His voice enters a ham radio in Kensington 
and emerges in dreamed-of desh, transmuted into the thunderous speech of the imam himself, beginning with ritual abuse of the empress, with lists of her crimes, murders, bribes, sexual relations with lizards, and so on, he proceeds eventually to issue in ringing tones the imam's nightly call to his people to rise up against the evil of her state. We will make a revolution, the imam proclaims through him. That is a revolt not only against a tyrant, but against history. For there is an enemy beyond Aisha, and it is history herself. History is the blood wine that must no longer be drunk. History, the intoxicant, the creation and possession of the devil, of the great shaitan, the greatest of the lies, progress, science, rights, against which the imam has set his face. History is a deviation from the path. Knowledge is a delusion, because the sum of knowledge was complete on the day Allah finished his revelation to Mahund. We will unmake the veil of history, Bilal declaims into the listening night, and when it is unravelled, we will see paradise standing there in all its glory and light. The imam chose Bilal for this task on account of the beauty of his voice, which in its previous incarnation succeeded in climbing the Everest of the hit parade, not once but a dozen times, to the very top. The voice is rich and authoritative, a voice in the habit of being listened to, well-nourished, highly trained, the voice of American confidence, a weapon of the West turned against its makers, whose might upholds the Empress and her tyranny. In the early days, Bilal X protested at such a description of his voice. He too belonged to an oppressed people, he insisted, so that it was unjust to equate him with the Yankee imperialists. The imam answered, not without gentleness, Bilal, your suffering is ours as well. But to be raised in the house of power is to learn its ways, to soak them up, through that very skin that is the cause of your oppression. The habit of power, its timbre, its posture, its way of being with others, it is a disease, Bilal, infecting all who come too near it, if the powerful trample over you, you are infected by the soles of their feet. Bilal continues to address the darkness. Death to the tyranny of the Empress Aisha, of calendars, of America, of time. We seek the eternity, the timelessness of God. His still waters, not her flowing wines. Burn the books and trust the book. Shred the papers and hear the word as it was revealed by the angel Jibril to the messenger Mahund, and explicated by your interpreter and imam. Amin, Bilal said, concluding the night's proceedings, while in his sanctum the imam sends a message of his own, and summons, conjures up, the archangel Jibril. He sees himself in the dream. No angel to look at, just a man in his ordinary street clothes, Henry Diamond's posthumous hand-me-downs, gabardine and trilby over outsized trousers held up by braces, a fisherman's woollen pullover, billowy white shirt. This dream Jibril, so like the waking one, stands quaking in the sanctum of the imam, whose eyes are white as clouds. Jibril speaks querulously to hide his fear. Why insist on archangels? Those days you should know are gone. The imam closes his eyes, sighs. The carpet extrudes long, hairy tendrils which wrap themselves around Jibril, holding him fast. You don't need me, Jibril emphasizes. The revelation is complete. Let me go. The other shakes his head and speaks, except that his lips do not move, and it is Bilal's voice that fills Jibril's ears, even though the broadcaster is nowhere to be seen. Tonight's the night, the voice says, and you must fly me to Jerusalem. Then the apartment dissolves, and they are standing on the roof beside the water tank, because the imam, when he wishes to move, can remain still and move the world around him. His beard is blowing in the wind. It is longer now. If it were not for the wind that catches at it, as if it were a flowing chiffon scarf, 
it would touch the ground by his feet. He has red eyes, and his voice hangs around him in the sky. Take me, Jibril argues, seems you can do it easily by yourself. But the imam, in a single movement of astonishing rapidity, slings his beard over his shoulder, hoists up his skirts to reveal two spindly legs with an almost monstrous covering of hair, and leaps high into the night air, twirls himself about, and settles on Jibril's shoulders, clutching onto him with fingernails that have grown into long, curved claws. Jibril feels himself rising into the sky, bearing the old man of the sea, the imam with hair that grows longer by the minute, streaming in every direction, his eyebrows like penance in the wind. Jerusalem, he wonders, which way is that? And then, it's a slippery word, Jerusalem. It can be an idea as well as a place, a goal, an exaltation. Where is the imam's Jerusalem? The fall of the harlot, the disembodied voice resounds in his ears. Her crash, the Babylonian whore. They zoom through the night. The moon is heating up, beginning to bubble like cheese under a grill. He, Jibril, sees pieces of it falling off from time to time, moon drips that hiss and bubble on the sizzling griddle of the sky. Land appears below them. The heat grows intense. It is an immense landscape, reddish with flat-topped trees. They fly over mountains that are also flat-topped. Even the stones here are flattened by the heat. Then they come to a high mountain of almost perfectly conical dimensions, a mountain that also sits postcarded on a mantelpiece far away, and in the shadow of the mountain a city sprawling at its feet like a supplicant, and on the mountain's lower slopes a palace, the palace, her place, the empress whom radio messages have unmade. This is a revolution of radio hams. Jibril, with the imam riding him like a carpet, swoops lower, and in the steaming night it looks as if the streets are alive. They seem to be writhing like snakes. While in front of the palace of the empress's defeat, a new hill seems to be growing. While we watch, Baba, what's going on here? The imam's voice hangs in the sky. Come down, I will show you love. They are at rooftop level when Jibril realizes that the streets are swarming with people, human beings packed so densely into those snaking paths that they have blended into a larger composite entity, relentless serpentine. The people move slowly, at an even pace, down alleys into lanes, down lanes into side streets, down side streets into highways, all of them converging upon the Grand Avenue, twelve lanes wide and lined with giant eucalyptus trees that leads to the palace gates. The avenue is packed with humanity. It is the central organ of the new, many-headed being. Seventy abreast, the people walk gravely towards the Empress's gates, in front of which her household guards are waiting in three ranks, lying, kneeling, and standing, with machine guns at the ready. The people are walking up the slope towards the guns. Seventy at a time they come into range. The guns babble, and they die. And then the next seventy climb over the bodies of the dead. The guns giggle once again, and the hill of the dead grows higher. Those behind it commence in their turn to climb. In the dark doorways of the city there are mothers with covered heads pushing their beloved sons into the parade. Go, be a martyr, do the needful, die. You see how they love me, says the disembodied voice. No tyranny on earth can withstand the power of this slow walking love. This isn't love, Jibril weeping replies. It's hate. She has driven them into your arms. The explanation sounds thin, superficial. They love me, the imam's voice says, because I am water, I am fertility, and she is decay. They love me for my habit of smashing clocks. Human beings who turn away from God lose love and certainty, 
and also the sense of his boundless time that encompasses past, present, and future, the timeless time that has no need to move. We long for the eternal, and I am eternity. She is nothing, a tick or talk. She looks in her mirror every day and is terrorized by the idea of age, of time passing. Thus, she is the prisoner of her own nature. She, too, is in the chains of time. After the revolution, there will be no clocks. We'll smash the lot. The word clock will be expunged from our dictionaries. After the revolution, there will be no birthdays. We shall all be born again, all of us the same unchanging age in the eye of Almighty God. He falls silent now, because below us the great moment has come. The people have reached the guns, which are silenced in their turn as the endless serpent of the people, the gigantic python of the risen masses, embraces the guards, suffocating them, and silences the lethal chuckling of their weapons. The imam sighs heavily. Done! The lights of the palace are extinguished, as the people walk towards it at the same measured pace as before. Then from within the darkened palace there rises a hideous sound, beginning as a high, thin, piercing wail, then deepening into a howl, an ululation loud enough to fill every cranny of the city with its rage. Then the golden dome of the palace bursts open like an egg, and rising from it, glowing with blackness, is a mythological apparition with vast black wings, her hair streaming loose, as long and black as the imam's is long and white. Alat, Jibril understands, bursting out of Aisha's shell. Kill her, the imam commands. Jibril sets him down on the palace's ceremonial balcony, his arms outstretched to encompass the joy of the people a sound that drowns even the howls of the goddess and rises up like a song. And then he is being propelled into the air, having no option. He is a marionette going to war, and she, seeing him coming, turns, crouches in air, and moaning dreadfully, comes at him with all her might. Jibriel understands that the imam, fighting by proxy as usual, will sacrifice him as readily as he did the hill of corpses at the palace gate, that he is a suicide soldier in the service of the cleric's cause. I am weak, he thinks, I am no match for her, but she too has been weakened by her defeat. The imam's strength moves Jibril, places thunderbolts in his hands, and the battle is joined. He hurls lightning spears into her feet, and she plunges comets into his groin. We are killing each other, he thinks. We will die, and there will be two new constellations in space, Alat and Jibril. Like exhausted warriors on a corpse-littered field, they totter and slash. Both are failing fast. She falls. Down she tumbles. Alat, queen of the night, crashes upside down to earth, crushing her head to bits, and lies a headless black angel with her wings ripped off by a little wicket gate in the palace gardens, all in a crumpled heap. And Jibril, looking away from her in horror, sees the imam grown monstrous, lying in the palace forecourt with his mouth yawning open at the gates. As the people march through the gates, he swallows them whole. The body of Alat has shriveled on the grass, leaving behind only a dark stain. And now every clock in the capital city of Desh begins to chime and goes on unceasingly, beyond twelve, beyond twenty-four, beyond one thousand and one, announcing the end of time, the hour that is beyond measuring, the hour of the exile's return, of the victory of water over wine, of the commencement of of the untime of the imam. When the nocturnal story changes, 
when, without warning, the progress of events in Jahiliya and Yathrib gives way to the struggle of Imam and Empress, Jibril briefly hopes that the curse has ended, that his dreams have been restored to the random eccentricity of ordinary life. But then, as the new story too falls into the old pattern, continuing each time he drops off from the precise point at which it was interrupted, and as his own image translated into an avatar of the archangel re-enters the frame, so his hope dies, and he succumbs once more to the inexorable. Things have reached the point at which some of his night sagas seem more bearable than others, and after the apocalypse of the imam, he feels almost pleased when the next narrative begins, extending his internal repertory, because at least it suggests the deity whom he, Jibril, has tried unsuccessfully to kill, can be a god of love, as well as one of vengeance, power, duty, rules, and hate. And it is, too, a nostalgic sort of tale, of a lost homeland. It feels like a return to the past. What story is this, coming right up? To begin at the beginning. On the morning of his fortieth birthday, in a room full of butterflies, Mirza Said Akhtar watched his sleeping wife. On the fateful morning of his fortieth birthday, in a room full of butterflies, the Zamindar Mirza Said Akhtar watched over his sleeping wife and felt his heart fill up to the bursting point with love. He had awoken early for once, rising before dawn with a bad dream souring his mouth, his recurring dream of the end of the world, in which the catastrophe was invariably his fault. He had been reading Nietzsche the night before, the pitiless end of that small, overextended species called man, and had fallen asleep with the book resting face downwards on his chest. Waking to the rustle of butterfly wings in the cool, shadowy bedroom, he was angry with himself for being so foolish in his choice of bedside reading matter. He was, however, wide awake now. Getting up quietly, he slipped his feet into chapels and strolled idly along the verandas of the great mansion, still in darkness on account of their lowered blinds, and the butterflies bobbed like courtiers at his back. In the far distance, someone was playing a flute. Mirza Said drew up the chick blinds and fastened their cords. The gardens were deep in mist, through which the butterfly clouds were swirling, one mist intersecting another. This remote region had always been renowned for its Lepidoptera, for these miraculous squadrons that filled the air by day and night, butterflies with the gift of chameleons, whose wings changed colour as they settled on vermilion flowers, ochre curtains, obsidian goblets or amber fingerings. In the Zamindar's mansion, and also in the nearby village, the miracle of the butterflies had become so familiar as to seem mundane, but in fact they had only returned nineteen years ago, as the servant women would recall. They had been the familiar spirits, or so the legend ran, of a local saint, the holy woman known only as Bibiji, who had lived to the age of two hundred and forty-two, and whose grave, until its location was forgotten, had the property of curing impotence and warts. Since the death of Bibiji one hundred and twenty years ago, the butterflies had vanished into the same realm of the legendary as Bibiji herself, so that when they came back exactly one hundred and one years after their departure, it looked at first like an omen of some imminent wonderful thing. After Bibiji's death, it should quickly be said, the village had continued to prosper, the potato crops remained plentiful, but there had been a gap in many hearts, even though the villagers of the present had no memory of the time of the old saint. So the return of the butterflies lifted many spirits, but when the expected wonders failed to materialize, the locals sank back, little by little, into the insufficiency of the day to day. The name of the Zamindar's mansion, Peristan, may have had its origins in the magical creature's fairy wings, and the village's name, Titlipur, certainly did. But names, once they are in common use, 
quickly become mere sounds, their etymology being buried like so many of the earth's marvels beneath the dust of habit. The human inhabitants of Titlipur and its butterfly hordes moved amongst one another with a kind of mutual disdain. The villagers and the Zamindar's family had long ago abandoned the attempt to exclude the butterflies from their homes, so that now, whenever a trunk was opened, a batch of wings would fly out of it like Pandora's imps, changing colour as they rose. There were butterflies under the closed lids of the thunderboxes in the toilets of Peristan, and inside every wardrobe, and between the pages of books. When you awoke, you found the butterflies sleeping on your cheeks. The commonplace eventually becomes invisible, and Mirza Said had not really noticed the butterflies for a number of years. On the morning of his fortieth birthday, however, as the first light of dawn touched the house, and the butterflies began instantly to glow, the beauty of the moment took his breath away. He ran at once to the bedroom in the Zanana wing in which his wife Michal lay sleeping, veiled in a mosquito net. The magic butterflies were resting on her exposed toes, and a mosquito had evidently found its way inside as well, because there was a line of little bites along the raised edge of her collarbone. He wanted to lift the net, crawl inside, and kiss the bites until they faded away. How inflamed they looked! How, when she awoke, they would itch. But he held himself back, preferring to enjoy the innocence of her sleeping form. She had soft, red-brown hair, white, white skin, and her eyes behind the closed lids were silky grey. Her father was a director of the state bank, so it had been an irresistible match, an arranged marriage which restored the fortunes of the Mirza's ancient, decaying family, and then ripened over time, and in spite of their failure to have children, into a union of real love. Full of emotion, Mirza Said watched Michal sleep, and chased the last shreds of his nightmare from his mind. How can the world be done for, he reasoned contentedly to himself, if it can offer up such instances of perfection as this lovely dawn? Continuing down the line of these happy thoughts, he formulated a silent speech to his resting wife. Michal, I'm forty years old, and as contented as a forty-day babe. I see now that I've been falling deeper and deeper into our love over the years, and now I swim like some fish in that warm sea. How much she gave him, he marvelled, how much he needed her. Their marriage transcended mere sensuality, was so intimate that a separation was unthinkable. Growing old beside you, he told her while she slept, will be, Michal, a privilege. He permitted himself the sentimentality of blowing a kiss in her direction, and then tiptoeing from the room. Out once more on the main veranda of his private quarters on the mansion's upper story, he glanced across to the gardens, which were coming into view as the dawn lifted the mist, and saw the sight that would destroy his peace of mind for ever, smashing it beyond hope of repair at the very instant in which he had become certain of its invulnerability to the ravages of fate. A young woman was squatting on the lawn, holding out her left palm. Butterflies were settling on this surface while, with her right hand, she picked them up and put them in her mouth. Slowly, methodically, she breakfasted on the acquiescent wings. Her lips, cheeks, chin were heavily stained by the many different colours that had rubbed off the dying butterflies. When Mirza Said Akhtar saw the young woman eating her gossamer breakfast on his lawn, he felt a surge of lust so powerful that he instantly felt ashamed. It's impossible, he scolded himself. I am not an animal after all. The young woman wore a saffron yellow sari wrapped around her nakedness, after the fashion of the poor women of that region. And as she stooped over the butterflies, the sari, hanging loosely forwards, bared her small breasts to the gaze of the transfixed zamindar. Mirza Said stretched out his hands to grip the balcony railing, and the slight movement of his white kurta must have caught her eye, because she lifted her head quickly and looked right into his face. 
and did not immediately look down again, nor did she get up and run away, as he had half expected. What she did? Waited for a few seconds, as though to see if he intended to speak. When he did not, she simply resumed her strange meal without taking her eyes from his face. The strangest aspect of it was that the butterflies seemed to be funneling downwards from the brightening air, going willingly towards her outstretched palms and their own deaths. She held them by the wingtips, threw her head back, and flicked them into her mouth with the tip of her narrow tongue. Once she kept her mouth open, the dark lips parted defiantly, and Mirza Said trembled to see the butterfly fluttering within the dark cavern of its death, yet making no attempt to escape. When she was satisfied that he had seen this, she brought her lips together and began to chew. They remained thus, peasant woman below, landowner above, until her eyes unexpectedly rolled upwards in their sockets, and she fell heavily, twitching violently, onto her left side. After a few seconds of transfixed panic, the Mirza shouted, Oh, hey, house! Oh, hey! Wake up! Emergency! At the same time, he ran towards the stately mahogany staircase from England, brought here from some unimaginable Warwickshire, some fantastic location in which, in a damp and lightless priory, King Charles I had ascended these same steps before losing his head in the seventeenth century of another system of time. Down these stairs hurtled Mirza Said Akhtar, last of his line, trampling over the ghostly impressions of beheaded feet as he sped towards the lawn. The girl was having convulsions, crushing butterflies beneath her rolling, kicking body. Mirza Said got to her first, although the servants and Michal, awakened by his cry, were not far behind. He grasped the girl by the jaw and forced it open, inserting a nearby twig, which she at once bit in half. Blood trickled from her cut mouth, and he feared for her tongue, but the sickness left her just then. She became calm and slept. Michal had her carried to her own bedroom, and now Mirza Said was obliged to gaze on a second sleeping beauty in that bed, and was stricken for a second time by what seemed too rich and deep a sensation to be called by the crude name Lust. He found that he was at once sickened by his own impure designs, and also elated by the feelings that were coursing within him, fresh feelings whose newness excited him greatly. Michal came to stand beside her husband. "'Do you know her?' Said asked, and she nodded. "'An orphan girl. She makes small enamel animals and sells them at the trunk road. She has had the falling sickness since she was very little.' Mirza Said was awed, not for the first time, by his wife's gift of involvement with other human beings. He himself could hardly recognize more than a handful of the villagers, but she knew each person's pet names, family histories, and incomes. They even told her their dreams, although few of them dreamt more than once a month, on account of being too poor to afford such luxuries. The overflowing fondness he had felt at dawn returned, and he placed his arm around her shoulders. She leant her head against him and said softly, Happy birthday! He kissed the top of her hair. They stood embracing, watching the sleeping girl. Aisha, his wife told him the name. After the orphan girl Aisha arrived at puberty and became, on account of her distracted beauty, and her air of staring into another world, the object of many young men's desires, it began to be said that she was looking for a lover from heaven, because she thought herself too good for mortal men. Her rejected suitors complained that in practical terms she had no business acting so choosy, in the first place because she was an orphan, and in the second because she was possessed by the demon of epilepsy, who would certainly put off any heavenly spirits who might otherwise have been interested. Some embittered youths went so far as to suggest that as Aisha's defects would prevent her from ever finding a husband, she might as well start taking lovers, so as not to waste that beauty, which ought, in all fairness, to have been given to a less problematic individual. In spite of these attempts by the young men of Titlipu to turn her into their whore, 
Aisha remained chaste, her defense being a look of such fierce concentration on patches of air immediately above people's left shoulders that it was regularly mistaken for contempt. Then people heard about her new habit of swallowing butterflies, and they revised their opinion of her, convinced that she was touched in the head and therefore dangerous to lie with in case the demons crossed over into her lovers. After this, the lustful males of her village left her alone in her hovel, alone with her toy animals and her peculiar, fluttering diet. One young man, however, took to sitting a little distance from her doorway, facing discreetly in the opposite direction, as if he were on guard, even though she no longer had any need of protectors. He was a former untouchable from the neighboring village of Chatnapatna, who had been converted to Islam and taken the name of Osman. Aisha never acknowledged Osman's presence, nor did he ask for such acknowledgement. The leafy branches of the village waved over their heads in the breeze. The village of Titlipur had grown up in the shade of an immense banyan tree, a single monarch that ruled with its multiple roots over an area more than half a mile in diameter. By now, the growth of tree into village and village into tree had become so intricate that it was impossible to differentiate between the two. Certain districts of the tree had become well-known lovers' nooks, others were chicken runs. Some of the poorer labourers had constructed rough-and-ready shelters in the angles of stout branches and actually lived inside the dense foliage. There were branches that were used as pathways across the village, and children's swings made out of the old tree's beards, and in places where the tree stooped low down towards the earth, its leaves formed roofs for many a hutment that seemed to hang from the greenery like the nest of a weaver bird. When the village panchayat assembled, it sat on the mightiest branch of all. The villagers had grown accustomed to referring to the tree by the name of the village, and to the village simply as the tree. The Banyan's non-human inhabitants, honey ants, squirrels, owls, were accorded the respect due to fellow citizens. Only the butterflies were ignored, like hopes long since shown to be false. It was a Muslim village, which was why the convert Osman had come here with his clown's outfit and his boom-boom bullock after he had embraced the faith in an act of desperation, hoping that changing to a Muslim name would do him more good than earlier renamings, for example when untouchables were renamed Children of God. As a child of God in Chatnapatna, he had not been permitted to draw water from the town well, because the touch of an outcast would have polluted the drinking water. Landless, and like Aisha, an orphan, Osman earned his living as a clown. His bullock wore bright red paper cones over its horns, and much tinselly drapery over its nose and back. He went from village to village performing an act, at marriages and other celebrations, in which the bullock was his essential partner and foil, nodding in answer to his questions. One nod for no, twice for yes. Isn't this a nice village we've come to? Osman would ask. Boom! The bullock disagreed. It isn't? Oh, yes, it is. Look, aren't the people good? Boom! What? Then it's a village full of sinners? Boom, boom! Bapure! Then will everybody go to hell? Boom, boom! But, Bejan, is there any hope for them? Boom, boom! The bullock offered salvation. Excitedly, Osman bent down, placing his ear by the bullock's mouth. Tell quickly, what should they do to be saved? At this point, the bullock plucked Osman's cap off his head and carried it around the crowd, asking for money, and Osman would nod happily, boom, boom. Osman the convert and his boom, boom bullock were well liked in Titlipur, but the young man only wanted the approval of one person, and she would not give it. He had admitted to her that his conversion to Islam had been largely tactical. Just so I could get a drink, Bibi, what's a man to do? She had been outraged by his confession, informed him that he was no Muslim at all, his soul was in peril, and he could go back to Chatnapatna and die of thirst for all she cared. Her face coloured as she spoke, with an unaccountably strong disappointment in him, 
and it was the vehemence of this disappointment that gave him the optimism to remain squatting a dozen paces from her home, day after day. But she continued to stalk past him, nose in air, without so much as a good morning or hope you're well. Once a week, the potato carts of Titlipur trundled down the rutted, narrow, four-hour track to Chatnapatna, which stood at the point at which the track met the grand trunk road. In Chatnapatna stood the high, gleaming aluminium silos of the potato wholesalers. But this had nothing to do with Aisha's regular visits to the town. She would hitch a ride on a potato cart, clutching a little sackcloth bundle to take her toys to market. Chatnapatna was known throughout the region for its kiddies' knick-knacks, carved wooden toys and enameled figurines. Osman and his bullock stood at the edge of the banyan tree, watching her bounce about on top of the potato sacks until she had diminished to a dot. In Chatnapatna, she made her way to the premises of Sri Srinivas, owner of the biggest toy factory in town. On its walls were the political graffiti of the day, Vote for Hand, or, more politely, Please to vote for C.P. M. Above these exhortations was the proud announcement, Srinivas Toy Universe, our motto, Sincerity and Creativity. Srinivas was inside, a large jelly of a man, his head a hairless son, a fiftyish fellow whom a lifetime of selling toys had failed to sour. Aisha owed him her livelihood. He had been so taken with the artistry of her whittling that he had agreed to buy as many as she could produce. But in spite of his habitual bonhomie, his expression darkened when Aisha undid her bundle to show him two dozen figures of a young man in a clown hat accompanied by a decorated bullock that could dip its tinseled head. Understanding that Aisha had forgiven Osman his conversion, Sri Srinivas cried, That man is a traitor to his birth, as you well know. What kind of person will change gods as easily as his dhotis? God knows what got into you, daughter, but I don't want these dolls. On the wall behind his desk hung a framed certificate which read, in elaborately curlicued print, This is to certify that Mr. Shrish Srinivas is an expert on the geological history of the planet Earth, having flown through Grand Canyon with scenic airlines. Srinivas closed his eyes and folded his arms, an unlaughing Buddha with the indisputable authority of one who had flown. That boy is a devil, he said with finality, and Aisha folded the dolls into her piece of sackcloth and turned to leave without arguing. Srinivas's eyes flew open. Damn you, he shouted, aren't you going to give me a hard time? You think I don't know you need the money? Why you did such a damn stupid thing? What are you going to do now? Just go and make some FP dolls, double quick, and I will buy at best rate plus, because I am generous to a fault. Mr. Srinivas's personal invention was the family planning doll, a socially responsible variant of the old Russian doll notion. Inside a suited and booted Abba doll was a demure, sorry-clad Amma, and inside her a daughter containing a son. Two children are plenty. That was the message of the dolls. Make quickly, quickly, Srinivas called after the departing Aisha. FP dolls have high turnover. Aisha turned and smiled. Don't worry about me, Srinivasji, she said, and left. Aisha, the orphan, was nineteen years old when she began her walk back to Titlipur along the rutted potato track. But by the time she turned up in her village some forty-eight hours later, she had attained a kind of agelessness, because her hair had turned as white as snow, while her skin had regained the luminous perfection of a newborn child's. And although she was completely naked, the butterflies had settled upon her body in such thick swarms that she seemed to be wearing a dress of the most delicate material in the universe. The clown Osman was practising routines with the boom-boom bullock near the track, because even though he had been worried sick by her extended absence and had spent the whole of the previous night searching for her, it was still necessary to earn a living. When he laid eyes on her, 
That young man, who had never respected God because of having been born untouchable, was filled with holy terror, and did not dare to approach the girl with whom he was so helplessly in love. She went into her hut and slept for a day and a night without waking up. Then she went to see the village headman, Sarpanch Mohammed Din, and informed him matter-of-factly that the archangel Jibril had appeared to her in a vision and had lain down beside her to rest. Greatness has come among us, she informed the alarmed Sarpanch, who had until then been more concerned with potato quotas than transcendence. Everything will be required of us, and everything will be given to us also. In another part of the tree, the Sarpanch's wife, Khadija, was consoling a weeping clown who was finding it hard to accept that he had lost his beloved Aisha to a higher being, for when an archangel lies with a woman, she is lost to men for ever. Khadija was old and forgetful, and frequently clumsy when she tried to be loving, and she gave Osman cold comfort. The sun always sets when there is fear of tigers, she quoted the old saying. Bad news always comes all at once. Soon after the story of the miracle got out, the girl Aisha was summoned to the big house, and in the following days she spent long hours closeted with the zamindar's wife, Begum Mishal Akhtar, whose mother had also arrived on a visit and fallen for the archangel's white-haired wife. The dreamer, dreaming, wants but is unable to protest. I never laid a finger on her. What do you think this is? Some kind of wet dream or what? Damn me if I know from where that girl was getting her information, inspiration. Not from this quarter, that's for sure. This happened. She was walking back to her village, but then she seemed to grow weary all of a sudden, and went off the path to lie in the shade of a tamarind tree and rest. The moment her eyes closed, he was there beside her, dreaming Jibril in coat and hat, sweltering in the heat. She looked at him, but he couldn't say what she saw. Wings, maybe, halos, the works. Then he was lying there, and finding he could not get up. His limbs had become heavier than iron bars. It seemed as if his body might be crushed by its own weight into the earth. When she finished looking at him, she nodded gravely, as if he had spoken, and then she took off her scrap of a sari and stretched out beside him, nude. Then, in the dream, he fell asleep, out cold, as if somebody pulled out the plug, and when dreamed himself awake again, she was standing in front of him with that loose white hair and the butterflies clothing her, transformed. She was still nodding with a rapt expression on her face, receiving a message from somewhere that she called Jibril. Then she left him lying there and returned to the village to make her entrance. So now I have a dream wife, the dreamer becomes conscious enough to think. What the hell to do with her? But it isn't up to him. Aisha and Michal Akhtar are together in the big house. Ever since his birthday, Mirza Said had been full of passionate desires. As if life really does begin at forty, his wife marvelled. Their marriage became so energetic that the servants had to change the bedsheets three times per day. Michal hoped secretly that this heightening of her husband's libido would lead her to conceive, because she was of the firm opinion that enthusiasm mattered, whatever doctors might say to the contrary and that the years of taking her temperature every morning before getting out of bed, and then plotting the results on graph paper in order to establish her pattern of ovulation, had actually dissuaded the babies from being born, partly because it was difficult to be properly ardent when science got into bed along with you, and partly too in her view, because no self-respecting fetus would wish to enter the womb of so mechanically programmed a mother. Michal still prayed for a child, although she no longer mentioned the fact to Saeed, so as to spare him the sense of having failed her in this respect. Eyes shut, feigning sleep, she would call on God for a sign. And when Saeed became so loving, so frequently, she wondered if maybe this might not be it. 
As a result, his strange request that from now on, whenever they came to stay at Peristan, she should adopt the old ways and retreat into Perda, was not treated by her with the contempt it deserved. In the city where they kept a large and hospitable house, the Zamindar and his wife were known as one of the most modern and go-go couples on the scene. They collected contemporary art and threw wild parties and invited friends round for fumbles in the dark on sofas while watching soft porn VCRs. So when Mirza Said said, Would it not be sort of delicious, Mishu, if we tailored our behaviour to fit this old house? She should have laughed in his face. Instead she replied, What you like, Said? Because he gave her to understand that it was a sort of erotic game. He even hinted that his passion for her had become so overwhelming that he might need to express it at any moment, and if she were out in the open at the time, it might embarrass the staff. Certainly her presence would make it impossible for him to concentrate on any of his tasks, and besides, in the city, we will still be completely up to date. From this she understood that the city was full of distractions for the Mirza, so that her chances of conceiving were greatest right here in Titlipur. She resolved to stay put. This was when she invited her mother to come and stay, because if she were to confine herself to the Zanana, she would need company. Mrs. Qureshi arrived wobbling with plump fury, determined to scold her son-in-law until he gave up this purda foolishness. But Michal amazed her mother by begging, Please don't. Mrs. Qureshi, the wife of the state bank director, was quite a sophisticate herself. In fact, all your teenage Mishu, you were the grey goose, and I was the hipster. I thought you dragged yourself out of that ditch, but I see he pushed you back in there again. The financier's wife had always been of the opinion that her son-in-law was a secret cheapskate, an opinion which had survived intact in spite of being starved of any scrap of supporting evidence. Ignoring her daughter's veto, she sought out Mirza Said in the formal garden and launched into him, wobbling, as was her wont, for emphasis. "'What type of life are you living?' she demanded. "'My daughter is not for locking up, but for taking out.' What is all your fortune for, if you keep it also under lock and key? My son, unlock both wallet and wife. Take her away, renew your love on some enjoyable outing. Mirza Said opened his mouth, found no reply, shut it again. Dazzled by her own oratory, which had given rise quite on the spur of the moment to the idea of a holiday, Mrs. Qureshi warmed to her theme. Just get set and go, she urged. Go, man, go. Go away with her, or will you lock her up until she goes away? Here she jabbed an ominous finger at the sky. Forever. Guiltily, Mirza Said promised to consider the idea. What are you waiting for? she cried in triumph. You big softo! You, you, Hamlet! His mother-in-law's attack brought on one of the periodic bouts of self-reproach which had been plaguing Mirza Said ever since he persuaded Michal to take the veil. To console himself, he settled down to read Tagore's story, Gor Beer, in which a zamindar persuades his wife to come out of Perda, whereupon she takes up with a firebrand politico involved in the Swadeshi campaign, and the zamindar winds up dead. The novel cheered him up momentarily, but then his suspicions returned. Had he been sincere in the reasons he gave his wife, or was he simply finding a way of leaving the coast clear for his pursuit of the Madonna of the Butterflies, the epileptic Aisha? Some coast, he thought, remembering Mrs. Qureshi with her eyes of an accusative hawk, some clear. His mother-in-law's presence, he argued to himself, was further proof of his bona fides. Had he not positively encouraged Michel to send for her, even though he knew perfectly well that the old fatty couldn't stand him and would suspect him of every damned slyness under the sun? Would I have been so keen for her to come if I was planning on hanky-panky? he asked himself. But the nagging inner voices continued. All this recent sexology, this renewed interest in your lady-wife, is simple transference. Really, you are longing for your peasant floozy to come and flooze with you. 
Guilt had the effect of making the zamindar feel entirely worthless. His mother-in-law's insults came to seem, in his unhappiness, like the literal truth. Softo, she called him, and sitting in his study, surrounded by bookcases in which worms were munching contentedly upon priceless Sanskrit texts such as were not to be found even in the National Archives, and also, less upliftingly, on the complete works of Percy Westerman, G. A. Henty, and Dornford Yeats, Mirza Said admitted, Yes, spot on, I am soft. The house was seven generations old, and for seven generations the softening had been going on. He walked down the corridor in which his ancestors hung in baleful gilded frames and contemplated the mirror which he kept hanging in the last space as a reminder that one day he too must step up onto this wall. He was a man without sharp corners or rough edges. Even his elbows were covered by little pads of flesh. In the mirror he saw the thin moustache, the weak chin, the lips stained by pan. Cheeks, nose, forehead, all soft, soft, soft. Who would see anything in a type like me, he cried. And when he realized that he had been so agitated that he had spoken aloud, he knew he must be in love, that he was sick as a dog with love, and that the object of his affections was no longer his loving wife. Then what a damn shallow, tricksy, and self-deceiving fellow I am, he sighed to himself, to change so much so fast. I deserve to be finished off without ceremony. But he was not the type to fall on his sword. Instead, he strolled a while around the corridors of Peristan, and pretty soon the house worked its magic and restored him to something like a good mood once again. The house, in spite of its fairy name, it was a solid, rather prosy building, rendered exotic only by being in the wrong country. It had been built seven generations ago by a certain Perone, an English architect much favoured by the colonial authorities, whose only style was that of the neoclassical English country house. In those days, the great zamindars were crazy for European architecture. Said's great-great-great-great-grandfather had hired the fellow five minutes after meeting him at the Viceroy's reception to indicate publicly that not all Indian Muslims had supported the action of the Mirat soldiers or been in sympathy with the subsequent uprising. No, not by any means and then given him carte blanche. So here Peristan now stood, in the middle of near-tropical potato fields, and beside the great bunyan tree, covered in bougainvillea creeper, with snakes in the kitchens and butterfly skeletons in the cupboards. Some said its name owed more to the Englishman's than to anything more fanciful. It was a mere contraction of Peronistan. After seven generations, it was at last beginning to look as if it belonged in this landscape of bullock carts and palm trees, and high, clear, star-heavy skies. Even the stained-glass window looking down on the staircase of King Charles the Headless had been, in an indefinable manner, naturalized. Very few of these old zamindar houses had survived the egalitarian depredations of the present, and accordingly there hung over Peristan something of the musty air of a museum, even though, or perhaps because, Mirza Said took great pride in the old place and had spent lavishly to keep it in trim. He slept under a high canopy of worked and beaten brass in a ship-like bed that had been occupied by three viceroys. In the Grand Salon he liked to sit with Michel and Mrs. Koreshi in the unusual three-way love seat. At one end of this room, a colossal Shiraz carpet stood rolled up on wooden blocks, awaiting the glamorous reception which would meet its unfurling, and which never came. In the dining room, there were stout classical columns with ornate Corinthian tops, and there were peacocks, both real and stone, strolling onto the main steps of the house, and Venetian chandeliers tinkling in the hall. The original punkers were still in full working order all their operating cords travelling by way of pulleys and holes in walls and floors to a little airless boot room where the punkawala sat and tugged the lot together, trapped in the irony of the fetid air of that tiny windowless room 
while he dispatched cool breezes to all other parts of the house. The servants, too, went back seven generations, and had therefore lost the art of complaining. The old ways ruled. Even the Titlipur sweet vendor was required to seek the zamindar's approval before commencing to sell any innovative sweetmeat he might have invented. Life in Peristan was as soft as it was hard under the tree, but even into such cushioned existences heavy blows can fall. The discovery that his wife was spending most of her time closeted with Aisha filled the Mirza with an insupportable irritation, an eczema of the spirit that maddened him because there was no way of scratching it. Michal was hoping that the archangel, Aisha's husband, would grant her a baby, but because she couldn't tell that to her husband, she grew sullen and shrugged petulantly when he asked her why she wasted so much time with the village's craziest girl. Michal's new reticence worsened the itch in Mirza Said's heart, and made him jealous too, although he wasn't sure if he was jealous of Aisha or Michal. He noticed for the first time that the mistress of the butterflies had eyes of the same lustrous grey shade as his wife, and for some reason this made him cross too, as if it proved that the women were ganging up on him, whispering God knew what secrets. Maybe they were chittering and chattering about him. This Zanana business seemed to have backfired. Even that old jelly Mrs. Qureshi had been taken in by Aisha. Quite a threesome, thought Mirza Said. When mumbo-jumbo gets in through your door, good sense leaves by the window. As for Aisha, when she encountered the Mirza on the balcony or in the garden as he wandered reading Urdu love poetry, she was invariably deferential and shy. But her good behaviour coupled with the total absence of any spark of erotic interest, drove Said further and further into the helplessness of his despair. So it was that when one day he spied Aisha entering his wife's quarters and heard a few minutes later his mother-in-law's voice rise in a melodramatic shriek, he was seized by a mood of mulish vengefulness and deliberately waited a full three minutes before going to investigate. He found Mrs. Qureshi tearing her hair and sobbing like a movie queen, while Michal and Aisha sat cross-legged on the bed, facing each other, grey eyes staring into grey, and Michal's face was cradled between Aisha's outstretched palms. It turned out that the archangel had informed Aisha that the zamindar's wife was dying of cancer, that her breasts were full of the malign nodules of death, and that she had no more than a few months to live. The location of the cancer had proved to Michal the cruelty of God, because only a vicious deity would place death in the breast of a woman whose only dream was to suckle new life. When Said entered, Aisha had been whispering urgently to Michal, You mustn't think that way. God will save you. This is a test of faith. Mrs. Qureshi told Mirza Said the bad news with many shrieks and howls, and for the confused Zamindar it was the last straw. He flew into a temper and started yelling loudly and trembling as if he might at any moment start smashing up the furniture in the room and its occupants as well. To hell with your spook cancer, he screamed at Aisha in his exasperation. You have come into my house with your craziness and angels and dripped poison into my family's ears. Get out of here with your visions and your invisible spouse. This is the modern world and it is medical doctors and not ghosts in potato fields who tell us when we are ill. You have created this bloody hullabaloo for nothing. Get out, and never come onto my land again. Aisha heard him out without removing her eyes or hands from Michal. When Said stopped for breath, clenching and unclenching his fists, she said softly to his wife, Everything will be required of us, and everything will be given. When he heard this formula, which people all over the village were beginning to parrot as if they knew what it meant, Mirza Said Akhtar went briefly out of his mind, raised his hand, and knocked Aisha senseless. She fell to the floor, bleeding from the mouth, a tooth loosened by his fist, and as she lay there, Mrs. Qureshi hurled abuse at her son-in-law. "'Oh, God! I have put my daughter in the care of a killer! Oh, God! A woman hit her! Go on, hit me also, get some practice!' Defiler of saints, blasphemer, devil, unclean. 
Saeed left the room without saying a word. The next day, Michel Achter insisted on returning to the city for a complete medical checkup. Said took a stand. If you want to indulge in superstition, go, but don't expect me to come along. It's eight hours' drive each way, so to hell with it. Michal left that afternoon with her mother and the driver, and as a result Mirza Said was not where he should have been, that is, at his wife's side, when the results of the tests were communicated to her. Positive. Inoperable. Too far advanced. The claws of the cancer dug in deeply throughout her chest. A few months, six if she was lucky, and before that, coming soon, the pain. Michal returned to Peristan and went straight to her rooms in the Zanana, where she wrote her husband a formal note on lavender stationery, telling him of the doctor's diagnosis. When he read her death sentence, written in her own hand, he wanted very badly to burst into tears, but his eyes remained obstinately dry. He had had no time for the Supreme Being for many years, but now a couple of Aisha's phrases popped back into his mind. God will save you. Everything will be given. A bitter, superstitious notion occurred to him. It is a curse, he thought. Because I lusted after Aisha, she has murdered my wife. When he went to the Zanana, Michal refused to see him, but her mother, barring the doorway, handed Said a second note on scented blue notepaper. I want to see Aisha, it read. Kindly permit this. Bowing his head, Mirza Said gave his assent and crept away in shame. With Mahund, there is always a struggle. With the Imam, slavery. But with this girl, there is nothing. Jibril is inert, usually asleep in the dream as he is in life. She comes upon him under a tree or in a ditch, hears what he isn't saying, takes what she needs and leaves. What does he know about cancer, for example? Not a solitary thing. All around him he thinks as he half dreams, half wakes, are people hearing voices, being seduced by words. But not his, never his original material. Then whose? Who is whispering in their ears, enabling them to move mountains, halt clocks, diagnose disease? He can't work it out. The day after Michal Achter's return to Titlipur, the girl Aisha, whom people were beginning to call a kahin, a peer, disappeared completely for a week. Her hapless admirer, Osman the Clown, who had been following her at a distance along the dusty potato track to Chetnapatna, told the villagers that a breeze got up and blew dust into his eyes. When he got it out again, she had just gone. Usually, when Osman and his bullock started telling their tall tales about jinnies and magic lamps and open sesames, the villagers looked tolerant and teased him. OK, Osman, save it for those idiots in Chetnapatna. They may fall for that stuff, but here in Titlipur, we know which way is up, and that palaces do not appear unless a thousand and one laborers build them, nor do they disappear unless the same workers knock them down. On this occasion, however, nobody laughed at the clown, because where Aisha was concerned, the villagers were willing to believe anything. They had grown convinced that the snow-haired girl was the true successor to old Bibiji, because had the butterflies not reappeared in the year of her birth, and did they not follow her around like a cloak? Aisha was the vindication of the long-soured hope engendered by the butterfly's return, and the evidence that great things were still possible in this life, even for the weakest and poorest in the land. The angel has taken her away, marveled the Sarpanch's wife, Khadija, and Osman burst into tears. But no, it is a wonderful thing, old Khadija uncomprehendingly explained. The villagers teased the Sarpanch. How you got to be village headman with such a tactless spouse beats us. You chose me, he duly replied. On the seventh day after her disappearance, Aisha was sighted walking towards the village, naked again, and dressed in golden butterflies, her silver hair streaming behind her in the breeze. She went directly to the home of Sarpanch Muhammad Din, and asked that the Titipur Panchayat 
be convened for an immediate emergency meeting. The greatest event in the history of the tree has come upon us, she confided. Mohammed Din, unable to refuse her, fixed the time of the meeting for that evening after dark. That night, the panchayat members took their places on the usual branch of the tree, while Aisha the Kahin stood before them on the ground. I have flown with the angel into the highest heights, she said. Yes, even to the lot tree of the uttermost end. The archangel Jibril, he has brought us a message which is also a command. Everything is required of us, and everything will be given. Nothing in the life of the Sarpanch, Muhammad Din, had prepared him for the choice he was about to face. What does the angel ask, Aisha daughter? he asked, fighting to steady his voice. It is the angel's will that all of us, every man and woman and child in the village, begin at once to prepare for a pilgrimage. We are commanded to walk from this place to Mecca Sharif, to kiss the black stone in the Kaaba at the center of the Haram Sharif, the sacred mosque. There we must surely go. Now the panchayat's quintet began to debate heatedly. There were the crops to consider, and the impossibility of abandoning their homes en masse. It is not to be conceived of, child, the sarpanch told her. It is well known that Allah excuses Hajj and Amra to those who are genuinely unable to go for reasons of poverty or health. But Aisha remained silent, and the elders continued to argue. Then it was as if her silence infected everyone else, and for a long moment in which the question was settled, although by what means nobody ever managed to comprehend, there were no words spoken at all. It was Osman the clown who spoke up at last, Osman the convert, for whom his new faith had been no more than a drink of water. It's almost two hundred miles from here to the sea, he cried. There are old ladies here and babies. However can we go? God will give us the strength, Aisha serenely replied. Hasn't it occurred to you, Osman shouted, refusing to give up, that there's a mighty ocean between us and Mecca Sharif? How will we ever cross? We have no money for the pilgrim boats. Maybe the angel will grow us wings so we can fly? Many villagers rounded angrily upon the blasphemer Osman. Be quiet now, Sarpanch Mohammed Din rebuked him. You haven't been long in our faith or our village. Keep your trap shut and learn our ways. Osman, however, answered cheekily. So this is how you welcome new settlers, not as equals, but as people who must do as they are told. A knot of red-faced men began to tighten around Osman, but before anything else could happen, the Kahin Aisha changed the mood entirely by answering the clown's questions. This too the angel has explained, she said quietly. We will walk two hundred miles, and when we reach the shores of the sea, we will put our feet into the foam, and the waters will open for us. The waves shall be parted, and we shall walk across the ocean floor to Mecca. The next morning, Mirza Said Akhtar awoke in a house that had fallen unusually silent, and when he called for the servants, there was no reply. The stillness had spread into the potato fields, too. But under the broad, spreading roof of the Titlipur tree, all was hustle and bustle. The panchayat had voted unanimously to obey the command of the archangel Jibril, and the villagers had begun to prepare for departure. At first the Sarpanch had wanted the carpenter Isa to construct litters that could be pulled by oxen and on which the old and infirm could ride, but that idea had been knocked on the head by his own wife, who told him, You don't listen, Sarpanch Saibji. Didn't the angel say we must walk? Well then, that is what we must do. Only the youngest of infants were to be excused the foot pilgrimage, and they would be carried, it had been decided, on the backs of all the adults in rotation. The villagers had pooled all their resources, and heaps of potatoes, lentils, rice, bitter gourds, chilies, aubergines, and other vegetables were piling up next to the panchayat bow. The weight of the provisions was to be evenly divided between the walkers. Cooking utensils, too, were being gathered together, and whatever bedding could be found. Beasts of burden were to be taken, and a couple of carts carrying live chickens and such, 
but in general the pilgrims were under the Sarpanch's instructions to keep personal belongings to a minimum. Preparations had been underway since before dawn, so that by the time an incensed Mirza Said strode into the village, things were well advanced. For forty-five minutes the Zamindar slowed things up by making angry speeches and shaking individual villagers by the shoulders, but then, fortunately, he gave up and left, so that the work could be continued at its former rapid pace. As the Mirza departed, he smacked his head repeatedly and called people names such as loonies, simpletons, very bad words, but he had always been a godless man, the weak end of a strong line, and he had to be left to find his own fate. There was no arguing with men like him. By sunset the villagers were ready to depart, and the Sarpanch told everyone to rise for prayers in the small hours so that they could leave immediately afterwards and thus avoid the worst heat of the day. That night, lying down on his mat beside old Khadija, he murmured, At last, I have always wanted to see the Kaaba, to circle it before I die. She reached out from her mat to take his hand. I too have hoped for it against hope she said, we'll walk through the waters together. Mirza Said, driven into an impotent frenzy by the spectacle of the packing village, burst in on his wife without ceremony. You should see what's going on, Mishu, he exclaimed, gesticulating absurdly. The whole of Titlipur has taken leave of its brains and is off to the seaside. What is to happen to their homes, their fields? There is ruination in store. Must be political agitators involved. Someone has been bribing someone. Do you think if I offered cash, they would stay here like sane persons? His voice dried. Aisha was in the room. You bitch, he cursed her. She was sitting cross-legged on the bed, while Michal and her mother squatted on the floor, sorting through their belongings and working out how little they could manage with on the pilgrimage. You're not going, Mirza Said ranted. I forbid it. The devil alone knows what germ this whore has infected the villagers with, but you are my wife, and I refuse to let you embark upon this suicidal venture. Good words, Michel laughed bitterly. Said, good choice of words. You know I can't live, but you talk about suicide. Said, a thing is happening here, and you with your imported European atheism don't know what it is. Or maybe you would if you looked beneath your English suitings and tried to locate your heart. It's incredible, Said cried. Michal, Michu, is this you? All of a sudden you've turned into this God-bothered type from ancient history? Mrs. Qureshi said, Go away, son. No room for unbelievers here. The angel has told Aisha that when Michal completes the pilgrimage to Mecca, her cancer will have disappeared. Everything is required and everything will be given. Mirza Said Akhtar put his palms against a wall of his wife's bedroom and pressed his forehead against the plaster. After a long pause, he said, If it is a question of performing Amra, then for God's sake let's go to town and catch a plane. We can be in Mecca within a couple of days. Michal answered, We are commanded to walk. Said lost control of himself. Michal! Michal! he shrieked. Commanded? Archangels? Mishu? Jibril? God with a long beard and angels with wings? Heaven and hell, Michal? The devil with a pointy tail and cloven hooves? How far are you going with this? Do women have souls? What do you say? Or the other way, do souls have gender? Is God black or white? When the waters of the ocean part, where will the extra water go? Will it stand up sideways like walls? Michal? Answer me. Are there miracles? Do you believe in paradise? Will I be forgiven my sins? He began to cry and fell onto his knees with his forehead still pressed against the wall. His dying wife came up and embraced him from behind. Go with the pilgrimage then, he said dully, but at least take the Mercedes station wagon. It's got air conditioning and you can take the icebox full of cokes. No, she said gently. We'll go like everybody else. We're pilgrims, Said. This isn't a picnic at the beach. I don't know what to do, Mirza Said Akhtar wept. Mishu, I can't handle this by myself. Aisha spoke from the bed. 
Mirza Saab, come with us, she said. Your ideas are finished with. Come and save your soul. Said stood up, red-eyed. A bloody outing you wanted, he said viciously to Mrs. Qureshi. That chicken certainly came home to roost. Your outing will finish off the lot of us. Seven generations, the whole bang shoot. Michal leant her cheek against his back. Come with us, Said. Just come. He turned to face Aisha. There is no God, he said firmly. There is no God but God, and Muhammad is his prophet, she replied. The mystical experience is a subjective, not an objective truth, he went on. The waters will not open. The sea will part at the angel's command, Aisha answered. You are leading these people into certain disaster. I am taking them into the bosom of God. I don't believe in you, Mirza Said insisted, but I am going to come and will try to end this insanity with every step I take. God chooses many means, Aisha rejoiced, many roads by which the doubtful may be brought into his certainty. Go to hell, shouted Mirza Said Akhtar, and ran, scattering butterflies from the room. Who is the madder? Osman the clown whispered into his bullock's ear as he groomed it in its small byre. The madwoman or the fool who loves the madwoman? The bullock didn't reply. Maybe we should have stayed untouchable, Osman continued. A compulsory ocean sounds worse than a forbidden well. And the bullock nodded, twice for yes. Boom, boom. Five. A City Visible But Unseen Chapter 1 Once I'm an owl, what is the spell or antidote for turning me back into myself? Mr. Mohammed Sufyan, proprietor Shanda Cafe, and landlord of the rooming house above, mentor to the variegated, transient, and party-coloured inhabitants of both, seen it all type, least doctrinaire of hajis, and most unashamed of VCR addicts, ex-school teacher, self-taught in classical texts of many cultures, dismissed from post in Dhaka, owing to cultural differences with certain generals in the old days when Bangladesh was merely an east wing, and therefore, in his own words, not so much an imig as an emig runt. This last a good-natured allusion to his lack of inches, for though he was a wide man, thick of arm and waist, he stood no more than sixty-one inches off the ground, blinked in his bedroom doorway, awakened by Jumpy Joshi's urgent midnight knock, polished his half-rimmed spectacles on the edge of Bengali-style kurta, drawstrings tied at the neck in a neat bow, squeezed lids tightly shut, open shut over myopic eyes, replaced glasses, opened eyes, stroked moustacheless hennaed beard, sucked teeth, and responded to the now indisputable horns on the brow of the shivering fellow whom Jumpy, like the cat, appeared to have dragged in, with the above impromptu quip, stolen with commendable mental alacrity for one aroused from his slumbers, from Lucius Apulius of Madaura, Moroccan priest, A.D. 120-180 approx, colonial of an earlier empire, a person who denied the accusation of having bewitched a rich widow, yet confessed, somewhat perversely, that at an early stage in his career he had been transformed by witchcraft into not an owl but an ass. Yes, yes, Sufyan continued, stepping out into the passage and blowing a white mist of winter breath into his cupped hands. Poor misfortunate, but no point wallowing. Constructive attitude must be adopted. I will wake my wife. Chumcha was beard fuzz and grime. He wore a blanket like a toga, below which there protruded the comic deformity of goat's hooves, while above it could be seen the sad comedy of a sheepskin jacket borrowed from Jumpy, its collar turned up, so that sheepish curls nestled only inches from pointy billy-goat horns. He seemed incapable of speech, sluggish of body, dull of eye, even though Jumpy attempted to encourage him. There, you see, we'll have this well sorted in a flash. He, Saladin, remained the most limp and passive of, what, let us say, satyrs. Sufyan, meanwhile, offered further Apulian sympathy. In the case of the ass, reverse metamorphosis required personal intervention of goddess Isis, he beamed. 
but old times are for old fogies. In your instance, young mister, first step would possibly be a bowl of good hot soup. At this point, his kindly tones were quite drowned by the intervention of a second voice, raised high in operatic terror, moments after which his small form was being jostled and shoved by the mountainous, fleshy figure of a woman, who seemed unable to decide whether to push him out of her way or keep him before her as a protective shield. Crouching behind Sufyan, this new being extended a trembling arm at whose end was a quivering, pudgy, scarlet-nailed index finger. "'That over there!' she howled. "'What thing has come upon us?' "'It is a friend of Joshi's,' Sufyan said mildly, and continued, turning to Chumcha. "'Please forgive. The unexpectedness at set, isn't it? Anyhow, may I present my missus, my Begum Sahiba? Hint?' "'What friend? How friend?' the Croucher cried. "'Ya Allah! Eyes aren't next to your nose!' The passageway, bare-board floor, torn floral paper on the walls, was starting to fill up with sleepy residents, prominent among whom were two teenage girls, one spike-haired, the other ponytailed, and both relishing the opportunity to demonstrate their skills, learnt from Jumpy, in the martial arts of karate and Wing Chun. Sufyan's daughters, Michal, seventeen, and fifteen-year-old, Anahita leapt from their bedroom in fighting gear, Bruce Lee pyjamas worn loosely over T-shirts bearing the image of the new Madonna, caught sight of unhappy Saladin, and shook their heads in wide-eyed delight. Radical, said Michelle approvingly, and her sister nodded assent. Crucial, fucking I. Her mother did not, however, reproach her for her language. Hin's mind was elsewhere, and she wailed louder than ever. Look at this husband of mine. What sort of haji is this? Here is Shaitan himself walking in through our door, and I am made to offer him hot chicken yakni, cooked by my own right hand. Useless now for Jumpy Joshi to plead with Hind for tolerance, to attempt explanations and demand solidarity. If he's not the devil on earth, the heaving-chested lady pointed out unanswerably, from where that plague breath comes that he's breathing— from maybe the perfume garden? Uh, not Gulistan, but Bostan, said Chumcha suddenly. AI Flight 420. On hearing his voice, however, Hind squealed frightfully and plunged past him, heading for the kitchen. Mister, Michal said to Saladin as her mother fled downstairs, anyone who scares her that way has got to be seriously bad. Wicked, Anaita agreed. Welcome aboard. This Hind, now so firmly entrenched in exclamatory mode, had once been, strange but true, the most blushing of brides, the soul of gentleness, the very incarnation of tolerant good humour. As the wife of the erudite schoolteacher of Dhaka, she had entered into her duties with a will, the perfect helpmeet, bringing her husband cardamom-scented tea when he stayed up late marking examination papers, ingratiating herself with the school principal at the termly staff family's outing, struggling with the novels of Bibhuti Bhushan Banerjee and the metaphysics of Tagore in an attempt to be more worthy of a spouse who could quote effortlessly from Rig Veda as well as Quran Sharif, from the military accounts of Julius Caesar as well as the revelations of St. John the Divine. In those days she had admired his pluralistic openness of mind, and struggled in her kitchen towards a parallel eclecticism, learning to cook the dosas and utapams of South India as well as the soft meatballs of Kashmir. Gradually, her espousal of the cause of gastronomic pluralism grew into a grand passion, and while secularist Sufyan swallowed the multiple cultures of the subcontinent, and let us not pretend that Western culture is not present, after these centuries how could it not also be part of our heritage? His wife cooked and ate in increasing quantities its food. As she devoured the highly spiced dishes of Hyderabad and the highfalutin yogurt sauces of Lucknow, her body began to alter, because all that food had to find a home somewhere, and she began to resemble the wide, rolling landmass itself, the subcontinent without frontiers, because food passes across any boundary you care to mention. 
Mr. Mohammed Sufyan, however, gained no weight, not a tola, not an ounce. His refusal to fatten was the beginning of the trouble. When she reproached him, You don't like my cooking? For whom I'm doing it all and blowing up like a balloon? He answered mildly, looking up at her, she was the taller of the two, over the top of half-rimmed specks, Restraint is also part of our traditions, Begum. Eating two mouthfuls less than one's hunger, self-denial, the ascetic path. What a man! All the answers, but you couldn't get him to give you a decent fight. Restraint was not for Hind. Maybe if Sufyan had ever complained, if just once he'd said, I thought I was marrying one woman, but these days you're big enough for two. If he'd ever given her the incentive, then maybe she'd have desisted. Why not? Of course she would. So it was his fault for having no aggression. What kind of a male was it who didn't know how to insult his fat lady wife? In truth, it was entirely possible that Hind would have failed to control her eating binges, even if Sufyan had come up with the required imprecations and entreaties. But since he did not, she munched on, content to dump the whole blame for her figure on him. As a matter of fact, once she had started blaming him for things, she found that there were a number of other matters she could hold against him, and found, too, her tongue, so that the schoolteacher's humble apartment resounded regularly to the kinds of tickings off he was too much of a mouse to hand out to his pupils. Above all, he was berated for his excessively high principles, thanks to which, Hint told him, she knew he would never permit her to become a rich man's wife. For what could one say about a man who— Finding that his bank had inadvertently credited his salary to his account twice in the same month, promptly drew the institution's notice to the error and handed back the cash. What hope was there for a teacher who, when approached by the wealthiest of the schoolchildren's parents, flatly refused to contemplate accepting the usual remunerations in return for services rendered when marking the little fellow's examination papers? But all of that I could forgive— she would mutter darkly at him, leaving unspoken the rest of the sentence, which was, if it hadn't been for your two real offences, your sexual and political crimes. Ever since their marriage, the two of them had performed the sexual act infrequently, in total darkness, pin-drop silence, and almost complete immobility. It would not have occurred to Hind to wiggle or wobble, and since Sufyan appeared to get through it all with an absolute minimum of motion, she took it, had always taken it, that the two of them were of the same mind on this matter, viz. that it was a dirty business, not to be discussed before or after, and not to be drawn attention to during either. That the children took their time in coming, she took as God's punishment, for he only knew what misdeeds of her earlier life. That they both turned out to be girls, she refused to blame on Allah, preferring instead to blame the weakling seed implanted in her by her unmanly spouse, an attitude she did not refrain from expressing with great emphasis and to the horror of the midwife at the very moment of little Anahita's birth. "'Another girl?' she gasped in disgust. "'Well, considering who made the baby, I should think myself lucky it's not a cockroach or a mouse.' After this second daughter, she told Sufyan that enough was enough— and ordered him to move his bed into the hall. He accepted without any argument her refusal to have more children. But then she discovered that the lecher thought he could still, from time to time, enter her darkened room and enact that strange rite of silence and near motionlessness to which she had only submitted in the name of reproduction. "'What do you think?' she shouted at him the first time he tried it. "'I do this thing for fun?' Once he had got it through his thick skull that she meant business, no more hanky-panky, no, sir, she was a decent woman, not a lust-crazed libertine, he began to stay out late at night. It was during this period, she had thought mistakenly that he was visiting prostitutes, that he became involved with politics, and not just any old politics either, oh, no. Mr. Brainbox had to go and join the devils themselves, the Communist Party, no less, so much for those principles of his— Demons, that's what they were, worse by far than whores. It was because of this, dabbling in the occult, that she had to pack up her bags at such short notice and leave for England with two small babies in tow. Because of this, ideological witchcraft, that she had had to endure all the privations and humiliations of the process of immigration. 
and on account of this diabolism of his that she was stuck for ever in this England and would never see her village again. England, she once said to him, is your revenge upon me for preventing you from performing your obscene acts upon my body. He had not given an answer, and silence denotes assent. And what was it that made them a living in this vilayet of her exile, this UK of her sex-obsessed husband's vindictiveness? What? His book-learning? His Gitanjali, Eclogues, or that play Othello that he explained was really Atala or Ataula, except the writer couldn't spell? What sort of writer was that, anyway? It was her cooking. Shanda, it was praised. Outstanding, brilliant, delicious. People came from all over London to eat her samosas, her Bombay chat, her gulab jam straight from paradise. What was there for Sufyan to do? Take the money, serve the tea, run from here to there, behave like a servant for all his education. Oh, yes, of course the customers liked his personality. He always had an appealing character. But when you're running an eatery, it isn't the conversation they pay for on the bill. Jalebis, barfi, special of the day. How life had turned out. She was the mistress now. Victory. And yet it was also a fact that she, cook and breadwinner, chiefest architect of the success of the Shandar Café, which had finally enabled them to buy the whole four-story building and start renting out its rooms. She was the one around whom there hung, like bad breath, the miasma of defeat. While Sufyan twinkled on, she looked extinguished, like a light bulb with a broken filament, like a fizzled star, like a flame. Why? Why, when Sufyan, who had been deprived of vocation, pupils, and respect, bounded about like a young lamb, and even began to put on weight, fattening up in proper London as he had never done back home, why, when power had been removed from his hands and delivered into hers, did she act, as her husband put it, the sad sack, the glum chum, and the moochy pooch? Simple, not in spite of, but on account of. Everything she valued had been upset by the change, had, in this process of translation, been lost. Her language, obliged now to emit these alien sounds that made her tongue feel tired, was she not entitled to moan? Her familiar place. What matter that they had lived in Dhaka in a teacher's humble flat, and now, owing to entrepreneurial good sense, savings and skill with spices, occupied this four-story terraced house? Where now was the city she knew? Where the village of her youth and the green waterways of home? The customs around which she had built her life were lost too, or at least were hard to find. Nobody in this vilayet had time for the slow courtesies of life back home, or for the many observances of faith. Furthermore, was she not forced to put up with a husband of no account, whereas before she could bask in his dignified position? Where was the pride in being made to work for her living, for his living, whereas before she could sit at home in much befitting pomp? And she knew, how could she not, the sadness beneath his bonhomie, and that too was a defeat. Never before had she felt so inadequate as a wife, for what kind of a missus is it that cannot cheer up her man, but must observe the counterfeit of happiness, and make do as if it were the genuine McCoy? Plus, also, they had come into a demon city in which anything could happen. Your windows shattered in the middle of the night without any cause. You were knocked over in the street by invisible hands. In the shops you heard such abuse you felt like your ears would drop off, but when you turned in the direction of the words you saw only empty air and smiling faces, and every day you heard about this boy, that girl, beaten up by ghosts. Yes, a land of phantom imps. How to explain? Best thing was to stay at home, not go out for so much as to post a letter, stay in, lock the door, say your prayers, and the goblins would, maybe, stay away. Reasons for defeat? Baba, who could count them? Not only was she a shopkeeper's wife and a kitchen slave, but even her own people could not be relied on. There were men she thought of as respectable types, Sharif, giving telephone divorces to wives back home and running off with some haramzadi female, and girls killed for dowry. Some things could be brought through the foreign customs without duty. 
and worst of all, the poison of this devil island had infected her baby girls, who were growing up refusing to speak their mother tongue. Even though they understood every word, they did it just to hurt. And why else had Michal cut off all her hair and put rainbows into it? And every day it was fight, quarrel, disobey. And worst of all, there was not one new thing about her complaints. This is how it was for women like her. So now she was no longer just one, just herself, just Hind, wife of teacher Sufyan. She had sunk into the anonymity, the characterless plurality of being merely one of the women like her. This was history's lesson. Nothing for women like her to do but suffer, remember, and die. What she did. To deny her husband's weakness, she treated him for the most part like a lord, like a monarch, for in her lost world her glory had lain in his. To deny the ghosts outside the cafe, she stayed indoors, sending others out for kitchen provisions and household necessities, and also for the endless supply of Bengali and Hindi movies on VCR, through which, along with her ever-increasing hoard of Indian movie magazines, she could stay in touch with events in the real world, such as the bizarre disappearance of the incomparable Jibril Farishta and the subsequent tragic announcement of his death in an airline accident. And to give her feelings of defeated, exhausted despair some outlet, she shouted at her daughters, the elder of whom, to get her own back, hacked off her hair and permitted her nipples to poke through shirts worn provocatively tight. The arrival of a fully developed devil, a horned goat man, was, in the light of the foregoing, something very like the last, or at any rate, the penultimate straw. Shanda residents gathered in the night kitchen for an impromptu crisis summit. While Hind hurled imprecations into chicken soup, Sufyan placed Chamcha at a table, drawing up for the poor fellow's use an aluminium chair with blue plastic seat, and initiated the night's proceedings. The theories of Lamarck, I am pleased to report, were quoted by the exiled schoolteacher, who spoke in his best didactic voice. When Jumpy had recounted the unlikely story of Chamcha's fall from the sky, the protagonist himself being too immersed in chicken soup and misery to speak for himself, Sufyan, sucking teeth, made reference to the last edition of The Origin of Species, in which even great Charles accepted the notion of mutation in extremis to ensure survival of species. So what if his followers, always more Darwinian than man himself, repudiated posthumously such Lamarckian heresy, insisting on natural selection and nothing but? However, I am bound to admit such theory is not extended to survival of individual specimen, but only to species as a whole. In addition, regarding nature of mutation, problem is to comprehend actual utility of the change. Dad, Anaita Sufyan, eyes lifting to heaven, cheek lying ho hum against palm, interrupted these cogitations. Give over. Point is, how did he turn into such a, such a, admiringly, freak? Upon which the devil himself, looking up from chicken soup, cried out, oh, No, I'm not. I'm not a freak. Oh, no. Uh, certainly I'm not. His voice, seeming to rise from an unfathomable abyss of grief, touched and alarmed the younger girl, who rushed over to where he sat, and impetuously caressing a shoulder of the unhappy beast, said, in an attempt to make amends, "'Of course you aren't. I'm sorry, of course. I don't think you're a freak. It's just that you look like one.' Saladin Chumcha burst into tears. Mrs. Sufyan, meanwhile, had been horrified by the sight of her younger daughter actually laying hands on the creature, and turning to the gallery of nightgowned residents, she waved a soup ladle at them and pleaded for support. How to tolerate? Honour, safety of young girls cannot be assured. That in my own house such a thing? Michel Sufyan lost patience. Jesus, ma'am. Jesus? Do you think it's temporary? Michelle, turning her back on scandalized Hind, inquired of Sufyan and Jumpy. Some sort of possession thing. Could we maybe get it, you know, exorcised? Omen, shinings, ghoulies, nightmares on Elm Street stood excitedly in her eyes, 
and her father, as much the VCR aficionado as any teenager, appeared to consider the possibility seriously. In Der Steppenwolf, he began, but Jumpy wasn't having any more of that. The central requirement, he announced, is to take an ideological view of the situation. That silenced everyone. Objectively, he said with a small self-deprecating smile, what has happened here? A. Wrongful arrest, intimidation, violence. 2. Illegal detention, unknown medical experimentation in hospital. Murmurs of assent here as memories of intravaginal inspections, depot provera scandals, unauthorized postpartum sterilizations, and further back, the knowledge of third world drug dumping arose in every person present to give substance to the speaker's insinuations. Because what you believe depends on what you've seen, not only what is visible, but what you are prepared to look in the face. And anyhow, something had to explain horns and hooves. In those policed medical wards, anything could happen. And thirdly, Jumpy continued, psychological breakdown, loss of sense of self, inability to cope. We've seen it all before. Nobody argued, not even Hind. There were some truths from which it was impossible to dissent. Ideologically, Jumpy said, I refuse to accept the position of victim. Certainly he has been victimized, but we know that all abuse of power is in part the responsibility of the abused. Our passiveness colludes with, permits such crimes. Whereupon, having scolded the gathering into shamefaced submission, he requested Sufyan to make available the small attic room that was presently unoccupied, and Sufyan, in his turn, was rendered entirely unable, by feelings of solidarity and guilt, to ask for a single P in rent. Hind did, it is true, mumble, Now I know the world is mad when a devil becomes my house-guest. But she did so under her breath, and nobody except her elder daughter Michal heard what she said. Sufyan, taking his cue from his younger daughter, went up to where Chumcha, huddled in his blanket, was drinking enormous quantities of Hin's unrivaled chicken yakni, squatted down, and placed an arm around the still shivering unfortunate. Best place for you is here, he said, speaking as if to a simpleton or small child. Where else would you go to heal your disfigurements and recover your normal health? Where else but here, with us, among your own people, your own kind? Only when Saladin Chamcha was alone in the attic room at the very end of his strength did he answer Sufyan's rhetorical question. I am not your kind, he said distinctly into the night. You're not my people. I've spent half my life trying to get away from you. His heart began to misbehave, to kick and stumble as if it too wanted to metamorphose into some new diabolic form, to substitute the complex unpredictability of tabla improvisations for its old metronomic beat. Lying sleepless in a narrow bed, snagging his horns in bedsheets and pillowcases as he tossed and turned, he suffered the renewal of coronary eccentricity with a kind of fatalistic acceptance. If everything else, then why not this too? Badum boom went the heart, and his torso jerked. Watch it, or I'll really let you have it. Dum boom badum. Yes, this was hell, all right. The city of London transformed into Jahannam, Gehenna, Muspelheim. Do devils suffer in hell? Aren't they the ones with the pitchforks? Water began to drip steadily through the dormer window. Outside, in the treacherous city, a thaw had come, giving the streets the unreliable consistency of wet cardboard. Slow masses of whiteness slid from sloping grey slate roofs. The footprints of delivery vans corrugated the slush. First light, and the dawn chorus began, chattering of road drills, chirrup of burglar alarms, trumpeting of wheeled creatures clashing at corners the deep whir of a large olive-green garbage-eater, screaming radio voices from a wooden painter's cradle clinging to the upper story of a freehouse, roar of the great wakening juggernauts rushing awesomely down this long but narrow pathway. From beneath the earth came tremors denoting the passage of huge subterranean worms that devoured and regurgitated